And thank you all so very much. We appreciate you being a part of Subsume Summit 2023. So welcome, everybody, and good morning. Thank you all. This is Dejan Sneed, founder and CEO of Subsume Media here in fantastic Atlanta, Georgia, here at the Russell Innovator Center for Entrepreneurs, where myself, team, friends, and community members are hosting a new live component of Subsume Summit, which is our Black Book Fair. So to it, I really want to make sure that I get a moment to thank everyone for a day two as we celebrate year four of Subsume Summit. And so who am I and why am I here? So we'll, we'll kind of get right on to it. So again, my name is Dejan Sneed here with Subsume and Subsume is the intersection of creativity, technology and community, where we look to create a platform and a service that allows us to see the black fantastic in our shared future of tomorrow. And so we work in the spaces of comics, games and animation, but we also work in web three and technology and social entrepreneurship to make sure that everyone's stories stay included in the places they want to be. And so this is again, our year two of, excuse me, year four of Subsume Summit Black Futures. And so we kicked off last night with a couple of amazing panels, have a fantastic show, not only in person here at the Russell Center, but also live for our live stream here today. So for Twitch and YouTube, that'll be a majority of our, of our online services for today. And then later this evening, we have a fantastic new reveal of our new metaverse space with our partnership with Spatial.io. So I am excited. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we've got a few things coming up. But first, I just want to take a, a moment to reflect and see what it took to get here uh, for us in this morning. So we really have been working diligently, uh, subsumed to really craft not only a narrative, but really a space where we can invite fellow creators and services to be a part of what we're trying to do here. And so what are we trying to do? Uh, we understand that through all fronts that the stories that we're trying to share, particularly as we look at historically for black stories, it's always been a space of marginalization, conflict, and in some time unhidden truths that we've had to overcome. And when overcome we have. So the idea of looking at Black History Month and why it's taken for our living and our ancestors to make a fantastic space for not only civil rights, but for human rights and throughout the world, see it to be a temple and a template for the best that humanity has to offer. And so we want to see ourselves take that template and continue to project and futurize the way that we as black people in our diaspora of talent are not only appreciated, but have an agency in the space for us to narrate our own stories and our shared futures. And so with that, we created Black History. We didn't create Black History, we created Black Futures, which we want to celebrate people who are making Black History right now. So we want to celebrate a space of Black History in the making. And so for myself, uh, fellow people that are working in comics, games, and animation, in Web3, in social entrepreneurship, traditional entrepreneurship, we've created this space that we want to make sure that people are invited, are educated, and mainly included in the ways that they want to be. And so we're going to start off here shortly with a program here at the top of the program, which is Octavia's Bookshelf that's out in California. And I thought it'd be pretty apropos for us to look at how can we as Subsume help other creators that are trying to make their spaces. And for this, we actually have a physical space, a brand new Black Speculative Fictions library and open space and bookstore that is going to be opening in California. And so together here at the top of the hour, you and I as a valued guest will get a firsthand look right before the opening of Octavia's bookshelf. And so we'll get a chance to speak with Miss Nikki High, who is the owner of the store, get a sneak look and understand you know, what made her follow her passion, follow her calling and open this space. And of course, we'll be talking about some future collaborations there. After that, We'll be speaking with Nikitish Gaskins, who is an amazing artist, but also researcher and advocate in the space of art and AI. Her imprint, Art and Algorithms, has for the past decade or so been a thought leader and actionable space, seeing the intersection of technology and talent, and especially for spaces of Afrofuturism. So I think it's absolutely critical that we understand and appreciate, as we did last night, and definitely will from one of the world's leading experts, talk about art and AI. From there, uh, here at High Noon, I'll be joined by Sheree Renee Thomas and Milton Davis, two of the prominent names in Afrofuturism and speculative fiction today. And so we'll talk about the state of Afrofuturism. You know, we're in a space where we've had enjoyed the woman king, Wakanda forever, 
and so many other spaces and places that we see Afrofuturism and the idea of African and speculative stories being now at the forefront of mainstream media. But where did that come from and where is it now and where is it going? I think we're going to have a amazing panel that we want you to come in and interact with. Again, some of our best in the business that will talk about the state of, of Afrofuturism. Then we'll follow that up with the state of independent black comics. Again, the independent black comics space and circuit has most of the more of the most amazing stories, talents and opportunities that really any place in the world could look at as far as unique and individualized story, underrepresented but unprecedented amount of talent and a space of agency where there is a space of thriving uh, on an independent comic circuit. And so from there, we want to look at bringing some leadership in on that space to kind of talk about the state of indie comics. And then from there, we'll look at here in Atlanta, where we'll have Web3 forever. And the idea of the rise of Web3 has seen a prominent space here in the past couple of years. So what does that mean for creativity, Black agency, and Black support? And so we'll look to talk with some industry leaders in that space. And that is just up until three o'clock, which will really get a chance to kick off a, an amazing run with some of the most prominent folks, honestly, you know, in their respective spaces. So for three o'clock, we'll be speaking with Rodney Barnes, an amazing and prolific writer whose uh, who's works all over the place and talk about the idea of black horror and also his foray and expertise in graphic novels and how his stories are influencing and impacting our, our uh, media world. Then from there, we'll talk with Carl Jones, who's known as not only the producer of, of the Boondocks cartoon, but also himself an imprint and showrunner ex uh, extraordinaire that major brands from all over the world call upon to build their stories in the spaces of animation and beyond. And so we'll get a chance to talk with uh, his company, Martian Blueberry. After that, Jamie Broadnax, who founded, is a founder and CEO of Black Girl Nerds. She'll come on and she'll talk about finding your audience and reaching your audience. Uh, her imprint is, is known throughout the world, her expertise as a film and media critic, but also in building these types of spaces of inclusion is, is one that we want to bring to you as a space to understand how you as a creative and how we as a shared community can keep those lines of communication open. And then we'll start getting into the conclusions of our show, which Jet and the idea of Jet Magazine is synonymous with black culture. The idea of this media space and its uh, parent company, Ebony, are archives of, of black brilliance, if, if ever there was one. And so we'll get a chance to speak with Dalen Golf, who is the president of Jet, and looking at how that media has moved into the digital space and how Jet's new renewal and program of Jet Fuel is empowering a new generation of creators. And then lastly, but definitely not least, we'll get a chance to speak with Tanya DePass, who herself is an amazing gameplay designer, developer, and tabletop. Also, her expertise in building inclusive stories and communities around the premise of gameplay is called upon worldwide. So we'll get a chance to conclude this stream, first stream portion uh, with Tanya here at six o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And then from there again, we'll invite you with a special partnership with the Harlem Film House, as well as Spatial.io, where we'll be taking our, our branded version of Wakanda and our Wakanda XR experience, where you right from your computer can join in with hundreds of other folks to come in and vibe with us and some of the metaverse Web3 space leaders. And we'll look at some movies, enjoy some art, and get you understanding and appreciative of how we as subsume are transitioning our physical spaces and complementing them with the, the virtual and metaverse spaces as well. And so I want to make sure that you're able to not only interact with us here today, but then tomorrow we'll be concluding a, a three day run with subsume black futures with office hours from prominent services that will let you as a creator come in and ask those questions from industry experts, whether that's in intellectual property and in starting your own podcast or in how media and development works today. So we've gotten a lot of feedback and questions for ourselves and our consultancy, and we wanna open up some of the experts that we lend on for our, for our advancement to make sure we all advance. And then from there, we also have an amazing set of group, amazing set of speakers such as President Walsh, who is the president of Bennett College and our uh, prestigious HBCU 
in North Carolina. Also, we'll get a chance to speak with um, Fire Magazine and other spaces that, again, we've had a chance to collaborate and connect with and want to make sure that we make a shared story and spaces for our future. So with that, I just want to thank everybody for, again, being a part and being the best part of what we have here with Subsume, which is including you in our shared spaces of tomorrow. So with that, we're going to take a brief break as we go ahead and reset and level set everything up. And again, right before the top of the hour, we'll come back in, reintroduce ourselves and look to level set as we talk to Nikki High, who will give us a firsthand look at her new space in California, Octavia's Bookshelf. So with that, we want you all to stay tuned, stay included, and we'll be right back for more. Thank you all so much.
Thank you so very much, and welcome Absolutely. to Black Futures 2023. And this is Dejan Sneed here in Atlanta, Georgia, and we get the privilege of being a, getting a first look uh, with Octavia Bookshelf in Pasadena, California, and joined here by the owner of, of said space, uh, Miss Nikki High. So, Nikki, a pleasure to uh, more formally meet you now in this space. And we've been chatting a little bit, and I'm you know, just, just excited for you here and, and the things to come. So, please. I uh, want to give the stage right off to you and get a chance to learn more about you and your endeavors. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Nikki High, and I am the owner of Octavius Bookshelf, which is Pasadena, California's first black woman owned um, bookstore. So it's um, super exciting to have pulled this off. Um, I am very much inspired by Octavia Butler. Um, my introduction into the sci-fi space was through her writings. And, um, you know, just the thought that when I was a little girl, she was living in Pasadena in the same neighborhood as me. We were riding the same uh, city buses and going to the same grocery stores. And, you know, I like to think that we've uh, been in the same room. It's 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 entirely impossible for us not to have been in the same space at some point, mm. just because I lived so close to her. Um, and so when I decided to open this bookstore, I wanted to honor our hometown legend, Octavia Butler. And so here I am, it's opening day. Um, we open in about two hours mm. and I just can't believe it's here. That, that is such an amazing story. And just one, um, and I'm here hitting buttons, my apologies. Uh, it's one that it just immediately struck a, a positive chord with me. Uh, likewise, and, and like most of us, I think in the speculative fiction space that we get a chance to be a, you know, a fan of Octavia Butler's and, and what her legacy in, in building black futures and, and black speculative fiction is. But uh, to your point, to be able to, to really say that you literally, you know, been in, in her space and in, in those spaces, I know it has to be in a, an amazing connectivity there in Pasadena. And then, and then hearing your story, I'm surprised that this didn't already exist. I would think that this was would be something that, you know, a long time ago would have been there. But I think, you know, that's, again, what was so interesting in your story, that the fact that there was not until you came along. Yeah, yeah. To ha to 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 desire a space and not have it here, um, let me know that it was the right time to you know take the leap and do this. Um, and it's especially interesting just about Octavia Butler, the fact that you know this is a, a bookstore named in her honor. Um, but just last year, uh, the middle school in Pasadena that she attended, they officially changed their name to the Octavia E. Butler Magnet Middle School. Um, and, you know, that just happened this school year. This bookstore is happening this school year. So I feel like, you know, uh, her legacy is really being honored now in a way that it had not been in the past. Mm. You yeah, know, and I think that's something that we hear so very much, even with someone as prominent and as prolific as as Miss Butler, the idea that it's still not widely known, still not widespread, particularly when we're in a, a zeitgeist or space where science fiction and fantasy is is really at the forefront. You know, I yeah. think before we it, it was hard to find, but now it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It is. And here in this bookstore, I'm so excited to be able to share that with my customers and everybody else who comes to visit. Thank you. So what was the tipping point? When did you say I'm actually going to, to go through with this? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think most book lovers go into bookstores and think, you know, oh, this would be so cool to do one day. So yeah, I've had that thought for maybe more than a decade, but uh at the start of the pandemic when, you know, we were all hunkering down at home and really just rethinking what life should or could be like. I mean, I've always been a really happy person, but I felt like I could probably be happier. Um, and I immediately sort of went to some of my old journals and saw that I had written like, you know, I'd love to have a, a bookstore. And so that's when I started to, you know, we had so much extra time at that point. I started building out financial models and, 
you know, um, calling up bookstores, just talking to the booksellers and managers. Um, I started reading books specifically about opening your own bookstore. And, um, you know, talking to my family and my husband about all of my dreams and everyone was super supportive. Um, but in May of 2022, my best friend, who was also my grandmother, mm-hmm. passed away unexpectedly. Mm-hmm. And um, after that, I was like, this is it. Like, it, it, it's time to go um, and make this a reality. So um, I just started really thinking about it much more and looking for spaces. Um, and then at some point, I think in August of last year, I spent uh, some time in South Africa and Swaziland. And I was fortunate enough to stay with a collective of women who just like they worked together. They were uh, batik printers and weavers and um, they took care of each other's kids. They, you know, had their coffee and tea together and they were just really supporting themselves and the community. And after that trip, I came home a week later, I gave notice and the rest is history. (laughs) So they say. Awesome. Awesome. Now where in, where specifically in Pasadena is your store located? Mm -hmm. It's at 1361 North Hill Avenue. Um, So it's a pretty central location. Um, And it's uh, just a block north of Washington um, Avenue, which is a really popular sort of main street here in Pasadena. Perfect. Now, for the local writers, I know also that this is more than just a bookstore, you know, in your space. So what are some of the other plans and endeavors that you plan to Mm -hmm. utilize your your, uh, Octavia's bookshelf as a, a resource for the community? Yeah, I mean, I am already... Um, I'm already connected with the Octavia E. Butler Magnet School. They're having a sci-fi festival coming up and um, I'm going to be a part of that. Um, And also I've uh, had some interest from local authors to do poetry readings here. Um, Really a space where community can come to connect and, um, you know, figure out what needs to be done in the community to help uh, promote literacy, to help promote, um, you know, the the love of books early on. Um, I'm doing some outdoor, like, pop-up events. Um, this space will also be used to um, do uh, book signings and meet the author events. And, you know, we're already closing down for a couple of private events. There's a couple of churches. Um, who want to come and support. Uh, There's a birthday party, you know, so this is going to be the place where you think like, hey, you know, something wild just happened in this world and we need a place to come and connect together. That's going to be this store, Um, along with other really fun events and obviously the day-to-day connecting of uh, curious-minded people and readers of all ages, you know, could come and and find new books. Now, that's such a a restorative space that you, I can already, I can imagining as you were saying this, I was buying a plane ticket to come and I'll be there soon enough. Right. But the yeah. idea is, no, that's why our communities need is, is something that renews not only the, the academic and educational postponement, but I think that space of wonder and, and that space of futurism, that there's something for, for your tomorrow that yes. you know, we as subsume always think about, but again, was a complete attraction uh, to you in your space. Now, I want to be respectful of our time, but I would love to ask, is there a way that we could take a look, you know, kind of get a walkthrough in uh, in your space? And then we'd love to. Thank you. Okay. So let's see here. We have a collection of uh, saint candles and book candles and uh, lots of just fun, nerdy book lover stuff, but um, you go on to our books and we have just rows and rows and rows and rows of books. Um, and some other book related items <clears throat> as well as greeting cards. And then we have more rows and rows, <laughs> and rows of 
of books. <laughs> um, we have a table here in the middle um, with more books. And something I'm really super proud of is this poem by Lucille Clifton. Um, I had installed, it's my favorite poem by her. Um, it's called Why Some People Be Mad at Me Sometimes. Uh, and then of course we have our categories. That's fantastic. Yeah. So that's it. That's our store. Oh, that that is just a wonder to, to see this, you know. And and again, I know that you're just a little bit ahead of your your first day and first grand opening. And again, just knowing that this will be such a resource for the community, not only there in Pasadena, but I think for our, our shared uh, our shared community in the space of speculative fiction and Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. And just in black business in general, like we like yeah. to see those doors swing open and, and commerce and, and community appreciation be in place. So that this is it's fantastic. Now, with that, really want to ask, uh, you know, yourself, do you have a book in mind that you might be putting on a shelf now that you have a bookstore? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually sort of what I talked about, um, you know, speculating that perhaps Miss Butler and I have crossed paths in some way and maybe those paths led me to where I am today. So I'm thinking of a speculative fiction children's book um, that just sort of follows me and her around the 80s, um, possibly walking me walking in a store as she's walking out or you know, blessing some space that she was in uh, uh, right before me and then uh, concluding with the opening of this bookstore and you know, possibly her giving her nod of approval on it. So um, I'm going to be working on that this year. Oh, I, I, I can pretty much assure, you know, ancestrally, the, the nods are, are the approval is already there. And mm -hmm. and and to that, just so, so motivated to, to see this. And I felt like being able to share this with our audience and, and our shared spaces, it just it just is a great hallmark to what we talk about. Like we need that representation. Mm -hmm. We need not Octavia Butler to sponsor a generation and generations of Absolutely. readers and people. You know, that's how we get black bookstores. That's how we get podcasts and we get books on the shelves. Mm -hmm. and, and then really in a space that we can all see ourselves be be really represented. Yes. And so, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not missing any comments here from our, our guests. You know, I am just. Again, I think when I saw your first part. Uh, of just even the concept of this, it just immediately resonated. And so uh, I'll kind of close to say that, you know, we want to figure out more of a, a long-term space to, of course, keep you sustained and, and uplifted in, in your journey. So I know our first component will be that for Subsume and, and our sponsor for this particular section, which is the, the Guild of Future Architects, as well as If Africa, that will be uh, sending an honorarium to you here shortly know to help you in whatever component makes the the journey go forward you know i know we also as subsume as our as our writing collection you know, we'll be sending a a a i was gonna say a gift basket but i think a care package was the word i was looking for where we love to see how we can again support you not only on the shelf but as yourself as well so um okay. with that we just are we wanted to just kick off black futures because you're, you're building the black future as we see it. And so it's just like our moniker behind us, like the future is here. Yeah. And, but I think it's there, obviously, you know, with Octavia's bookshelf. So thank you so very much. I won't hold you much more, but we just want to make sure, of course, that we'll be dropping your information of how people can continue to support. Um, if the GoFundMe is still accessible and available, we'll share that. It is. And yes, yeah, just, just want to give you back your time and just say, have a, a, a prosperous open and continued success and we'll definitely be talking soon thank you so much i am deeply grateful for this opportunity and i really appreciate all your support oh thank you so very much oh, this is the beginning of more, more much more to come so <laughs> thank you again Ms. Nikki. we'll talk to you soon and uh, please okay. enjoy and a happy opening
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, y'all. I appreciate it. And so that was Miss Nikki High, who is opening her brand new black owned bookstore in Pasadena, California, called Octavia's Bookshelf. And so we here at Subsoon, as well as the Guild of Future Architects, which is a collection of some of the world's most brilliant and brightest innovators, futurists, social entrepreneurs, and just great community folks that are looking at building the intersection of the architects of creativity, also in so many other points of humanity, looking that there is a regenerative and restorative tomorrow. Very much like Subsoon, that we're looking at the space of futurism as an opportunity for everyone, as well as the If Africa initiative and foundation who are looking to bring the diaspora of talent on the continent of Africa and have its conversations from political, educational, and, and restorative spaces be a part of everyday influence and action. And so in some with Subsume, we look to sponsor the Octavia Bookshelf's opening and look to also sponsor more content and other creators across this diaspora talent. And so we are, are just so thankful that we can see things like this as a, as a rebirth and a renewal and that know that the future is fantastic and that we are as the black creative and black community, black culture, are included in that future as we see ourselves and see to be fit. So thank you all so very much. What we'll do is just kind of take a quick synopsis, look to break here as we look to continue with our conversations. So please stay tuned and stay included with us for more during the Black Futures 2023. Thank you all so much.
Thank you so very much, and welcome back to Black Futures 2023. So this is Dejan Sneed here with Zoom, and we get a chance to talk art and algorithms uh, with Natrice Gaskins. Natrice, how are you doing? Hello. Good day, good day. You know, and it's funny, I get a chance to really follow up with you, and you know, we got, we had it, well, you know, but the guests, guests to know, you know, when I had an opportunity to come up to, to visit at MIT and, and work with, mm -hmm. with Math Talk, I've been yeah. trying to, you know, we've, we've been in correspondence before and I've known of you for years and for years. And it would be funny, like a, a house party at MIT, you know, we get a chance to come together in, in the human forms. Yeah. And, uh, and just a pleasure to uh, get a chance to share some time with you. So mm -hmm. uh, me, this is me being a fanboy first. So thank you for this. But now sure. I get a chance to... Uh, allow you to introduce yourself and us to kind of speak to what is, you are, who you are, and uh, art and algorithms. So very excited. Hi, I don't, you know, uh, never know what to say. There's so many different things I'm, you know, involved in. So, you know, pretty easy to find online. Um, according to ChatGPT, I'm in, um, let's see, let me, I'll read, actually read the ChatGPT's um description of of me it's probably still open uh, i did this yesterday just to mm. see what it would say nice. uh, it says i'm an artist educator and scholar known for my work at the intersection of art science and technology um, i have a phd in digital media from georgia institute of technology and worked as a, a professor and this is where <laughs> it's not fully correct mm. i was i did work uh, as a professor and staff at massachusetts college of art and design but it also says the new school is Parsons School of Design. So I lectured there, but I never taught there. Um, also the author of several books and articles, including Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation, Culturally Relevant Making Inside and Outside of the Classroom. It also says I'm an author of Black Futurism, The Creative Destruction and Reconstruction of Race and Science Fiction. That might actually be an article, so it may actually be true. <laughs> um, so that's what ChatGPT says. Right. And and I think that's just a perfect intersection and, and introduction to the idea of, of of how AI or artificial intelligence looks and, and points a lens towards us as humans, but particularly for the, the black, the intersection of blackness. And so obviously that's something that you've been a, a researcher in your space of expertise for some time. Uh, likewise, for my, my day work and things with subsume, the intersection of equity and technology of how does tech see us and particularly how does tech see black people and understand our culture, our humanity and, and our and our futures. And so to that, um, what is art and algorithm? So we uh, will talk to your work and I'm sure we'll be able to showcase that here shortly. But what is that? What has really how did you start this and how did you start on this journey? Um, well, the journey started in high school where I, I uh, started doing computer graphics in the late 80s and then um, majored in computer graphics at Pratt in Brooklyn and um, moved into art and tech, which is basically the same field at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and then 16 years later, Georgia Tech, where the first two was studio fine arts degrees and then the last was the research-based um, Georgia Tech's an R1 um, institution and um so not a studio fine arts degree but i did include um art through steam and so um so i'm an artist with some artists some um serious arts training but i'm also um a technologist because um the arts training was in a major that included computation um so the algorithms part um comes from my research which looks at um Black cultural and creative production and um, technology, and specifically um, how certain things that we we know and we're familiar with, and like hip hop and jazz and funk music and things like that, how um, they come from the same rich tradition through the Middle Passage to the United States, and and you know a lot of that stuff is computational. So um, that's where the algorithms part comes from. Absolutely. Thank you. So in the intersection of art and data is where we see a lot of the conversations around AI and, and AI driven art and digital media. So we, that was a conversation that we've had, particularly in our, our black art space for some time now, at least for the 
terms of the, the contemporary um, access of more public points of that. Yep. What is your formal take on on us utilizing AI, I guess, as fellow creatives? Do you see it more as a tool? Do you see it more as a, a complement or as a contrast? Or what would you define um, the utilization of AI in, in your expert space? Well, artificial intelligence is driven by algorithms. And so algorithms can be non-computational as well as computational, just calculations and instructions, basically. Um, there's a scholar that was at Yale, passed away a long time ago, James Sneed, who wrote about repetition in Black cultural production. And in there, he talked about improvisation and rep rep repetition specifically as it related to literature. Um, so he included Toni Morrison's jazz, I think, and uh, jazz, John Coltrane. And he talked about uh, James Brown, specifically looking at um, uh, improvisation and repetition and, and all those examples. And then he kind of wrote out and the notation for the uh, musical sequence of Cold Sweat, which is technically the first funk song ever. And um, looking at it, I realized it was um, computational meaning it had to do with computer science. Now, he's not a computer scientist. He probably wasn't thinking about computer science, but the way he wrote out the structure, um, I could see the computation in it. Um, so in many ways, uh, what he was identifying is can be found not only in music, it can be found in uh, G's Bing Quilts from Alabama. It can be found in some uh, dance performances. Um, some groups focus on those aspects of um, a funk of the the polyrhythms and things and dance. Mm -hmm. So you know, if that's the case, then there's a computational um, found uh, framework underneath all that stuff. And so um, I did do some some creative explorations to see how that would look like. Like I took Cold Sweat and put it through a music visualizer to see what kind of patterns it would produce. It produced the kind of patterns you would see in the G's Bing quilts um, and some African textiles. So it kind of backed up with some of the research was claiming in terms of the the algorithmic nature of the the, the polyrhythms and the patterns. Um, so uh, we've already been doing that stuff, and so um, now we're talking about a different algorithm. So it's just another uh, you know algorithm that in this case drives AI. Um, and the question is, if you want to be a consumer or if you want to be a producer of um, uh, involving that this particular algorithm and, and, and doing it in a way that is more relevant and responsive to culture. And I think that's a, a poignant response and, and to the idea of it being more of a inherent space where, you know, algorithmic, al algorithmic computations are based on data sets. And really the sense of the current space is that the data sets are a lot more robust than they've been in, in places before. Yeah. And in that, we get that artists feel that their works may have been a part of that data set without mm -hmm. their permission, without their space. You know, we look at the same improvisation of jazz, right? The idea of riffing off of one musician mm -hmm. to create. You mute it. I think you hit the button. Yeah, hit it. Hit that button right on the Ooh. knuckle and right, right for the button. Yeah. Uh, but with that, the idea of improvisation, right? Again, the space of like jazz, where we mm -hmm. have musicians that you know, riff off of one of each other to make the most brilliant audible, but also scientific and mathematical compositions that we as humans have probably ever seen. Mm -hmm. What's your space there of the utilization of the data sets where maybe our spaces or our music is being used or utilized? Is it too big of a computational space that we should say that we can or cannot delineate if we're using, you know, say these 10 musicians or these 10 artists are part of that data set and they're really are what's driving the most inherent part of the algorithm or are we not that nuanced just yet in things that we're using in these spaces? Well, I'm kind of surprised because I just watched a day like so a mini documentary by Mass Appeal and it was reminded of how they got sued by the turtles or the, mm. the legal representation because one of the songs from the first album clearly samples from the turtles it's a reinterpolation of it but they felt like it wasn't changed enough and right. so um you know they got 
in trouble for that. And it actually got them in trouble long-term in terms of getting their work into streaming services. Um, and as a result, you know, I think March 3rd is the first time uh, De La Soul's music will be on streaming services. And, um, you know, unfortunately, Dave will not be able to celebrate that because he passed away this week. Um, you know, so it took that long for them to even be able to financially benefit from their creative and innovative work in hip hop because of its legal battles, among other things, and greed and, and other things. Um, but I think because of the nature of hip hop culture, I'm quite surprised at some's response because the beginnings, of particularly the golden age of hip hop, was all about taking it and sampling music and sampling whether segments of it or an entire sequence of it over and over again looped um, where you can identify the police or you can I can easily identify certain songs by listening to the music. So I'm quite surprised that people don't see the correlations with what's happening with AI. Um, so, you know, in this case, it's not sound, though you can do um, artificial intelligence and music now, and it's just not popular, but it's images. And so, um, if you're intentionally trying to copy somebody's work, you can just enter their name and the AI will look for it because that's what the algorithm is doing. Um, or if the particular artist has a style that they've um, invented, you can you know type that invention in and it will try to recreate that. That's being intentional versus someone who's being very generic and maybe trying to create their own aesthetic using the technology. And it's sampling instead of from two or three songs or 10 songs from millions of, of of information, thousands and thousands of, of information in one image. So are we talking about people who are intentionally stealing work? They've been around forever. Um, or are we talking about the type of technology that samples from huge data sets to create a unique piece? And I think there's two types. There's two approaches. People who aren't artists or people who don't um, want to uh, media gratification and, and want to create a Picasso by stealing from the style versus people want to create their own aesthetic and their own style, but use the technology. Hmm. Spot on. And to that, likewise, I think I've, I've written a space in regards to, of course, it's been the 50th anniversary of hip hop, mm -hmm. the idea of Grandmaster Flash taking, you know, a crayon, right? And yeah. I think marking a space in an already existing record, you know, and juggling the beats to continue the the party going forward, right? And then, yeah. I mean, you're, you're in a very similar spaces that there was an existing space, but out of it, a whole genre of works and music and, and legacy has been built. I mean, I've always been in the space that you know, it was a very similar correlation. The idea of, you know, the AI can basically have a, a crate stack of a hundred million records yeah. at the same time. Right. And that doesn't mean that it can outsample, you know, a grandmaster flash with just two, turntables right mm -hmm. the idea is that i think that we still need to appreciate more of the human element that is a complement or really the guiding force of a massive li library and database of services right and so that's where i really appreciated your interpretation in your works as art uh, of art and algorithms because of course you're a traditional artist that you're already narrating and composing and bringing in more of a compliment and don't let me undervalue or undersell obviously the brilliance of doing this but i would like for you to kind of talk more to your process of how you're able to utilize ai in your with your classically trained art and development and then look to create these stunning arts that we get a chance to see um so i know that when i, I was in africa last week um, johannesburg and i challenged myself to create a portrait a day um, using um, AI and the internet was great. Um, the electricity is a little different uh, issue, but um, when it wasn't, we didn't have load shedding blackouts. Uh, I was able to use the internet fine. Um, so every time we went to a site, I would think about what I saw and then we'll come back um, to the hotel and produce an image every day, at least one. So when we went to Constitutional Hill, which is a, uh, that has a women's jail, which had Winnie uh, Mandela, um, Albertina Sisulu, and some other people that are pretty well known. Um, Nelson Mandela was also held at that at that site for a while before Robbins Island. Um, and mainly they were held there because um, 
they refuse to carry the pass uh, cards or pass, which is uh, the pass laws, meaning you had to have identification on you just to go from your house to the grocery store or your house to somebody else's house, or you couldn't just travel freely. And so they refused to, to carry those pass books. And so they were locked up um, and imprisoned. And, and here I am sitting on the site um, where these people were. And so then I would go back to the hotel and then I would use Mid Journey, um, which runs on the Discord server. And I would first do a series of text prompts based on what I saw, based on what I imagined I wanted the portrait to be. And then in many cases, if the um, image didn't look like the person enough, I would bring it into Photoshop and then just mold it into, um, to make it look more closely like the people that I'm trying to create portraits of. So, um, and then other cases I've moved from Mid Journey to Deep Dream Generator, which is where I started to uh, really create a consistent look. Um, if, I'm, if I'm collaging things into images, I want it to look like it was all one, done at once. I'll bring it into Deep Dream Generator and it'll just kind of make it very consistent as if it was only done one time, not many mm -hmm. different tools. So it just depends on the image. And so all of the six or seven images I produced in South Africa, Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, Winnie Mandela, Ebertina Sisulu and others um, came from that process. And then I was, could do it so that I could do it daily. I do um, images daily anyway, but I was just focusing on what I was experiencing in, uh, in Johannesburg and Soweto. Fantastic. So to your point of, of being able to empower you to be able to set a goal of doing an image a day, right? But at the same time, being able to capture your human perception of a space and then being able to really coordinate and curate it from there. It's allowing you to create your own human output at a larger, more extension, exponential space. Would that sound fair? I think so. And I think people oftentimes think it, like, again, when I say it doesn't look enough, sometimes it just approximates the way a person's supposed to look. It's better. When it's imaginary, it's different. But when I'm trying to make it look like Nelson Mandela and it doesn't, I have to do something to, you know, many different parts of the face, the hairline doesn't really... Um, could be anything. And then I have to be able to, I have the, the ability and the tool to be able to do that outside um, of the uh, AI tool using Photoshop. Mm. So um, some people who aren't artists who don't know how to use Photoshop, you know, they see the mangled hands and feet and things like that because they can't fix it. So, um, but I can. So, um, you know, if you see it, you often see that the hands have been tampered with a little bit. So they look like they have five fingers and not 12. Um, but that's, you know, uh, after like post, post AI or beyond, mm -hmm. beyond that. And it does take some, some ability to use another tool in this case, Photoshop to be able to do that. So, um, so toolbox for me is the same. It's just, I always had, I've been using Photoshop since it came out, um, in the nineties. So, um, like the very first edition of Photoshop, I was a student and I was just using it and it's very, you know, little window and mm -hmm. the images are small and low res um, if you try to, so very different experience back then versus today where you can be flowing through a tool a box, a, a several suites and tools at once to do one image. Now, if we look at towards the future of, of AI and, and creative output, right? So of course, the majority of people have the perception or the interpretation that this is going to cost jobs. This is going to cost some, it's going to be some type of, of sunk cost of being able to mass adopt this type of program. Of course, we've seen it through every other industry. Yeah. Tech, and then there's a technology advancement that pushes the contemporary, I guess the normal space of education or normal space of travel or what have you. And now we as humans have to pivot. You know, what is, you, is your outlook for the future of AI and human creativity? Do you have a, a synopsis or, a, or a hypothesis more of where you see us navigating a, uh, our creative features in this sense? I don't want to color the, the response, but I'll kind of leave it there. Um, I think people should be paying attention to um, in the AI space who's getting the attention. That is Nigerians, for example, and Kenyans. They are all in. And they're taking and they're uh, mitigating uh, and encountering Western aesthetics with 
uh, your books, edX, and the same tools and the same spaces, and they're getting a lot of attention. I think um, some we both follow each other on Instagram. Masiko, I think it's A S I K O, was featured in the Guardian, and he just got a huge exhibition with the Gagosian, which is a you know traditional um, venue for artists. Uh, meaning in terms of like a, I wouldn't say agent, but you know, big gallery. Um, so they are just in it and they're not at question it. They are creating their own aesthetics. They're moving forward and they're getting a lot of attention. Um, so I think we should take note that beyond the United States, um, countries like Nigeria, country artists are, are digital and they're they're just, they're, they're going with it. They're going for it. And the images are amazing. And the images are very specific for their culture. Like they are bringing in um, Yoruba aesthetics into the AI space. So um, in the future, we're looking at a global situation where artists from all over the world are going to be, um, and particularly on the, on the uh, African continent, are embracing them, whether it's NFTs or in this case, AI art, they're all in and they're not sitting back and waiting for this technology to take over. And, you know, I'm, I'm noticing and I'm also noticing that they follow me. I follow them. And, you know, there's some, you know, you know, uh, you know, I find that someone's try, you know, gone behind the scenes and grabbed my text prompts and try to generate images. I don't count. I'm, I'm not paying the extra thirty dollars to, to make a private channel. So I, I'm OK with that happening because. If I produce a portrait, you see it online, you can't really recreate that portrait. You can create, use the same prompts, but you can't create that specific image. Mm -hmm. um, so you can take on certain aspects and it may look like, um, you can also just take the work. If I don't put a watermark on it, you can take it and just say, look, I made this. Um, so, you know, I think right now people are just trying to figure out, um, artists are trying to figure out what this means for them, especially if they're not used to there are artists who don't really care about digital at all and just prefer to work in and traditional art tools. And those people have every right to do that. But if a company like a publisher says, we have two weeks to produce this cover and we don't have a month or we don't have two months and this person's only working in oils and oils takes time, um, we're going to go with someone who can produce an image for us in two weeks. If the person who produces in oils and has that preference has learned how to develop the AI tool to create that style that they have, then they'll be able to get that commission no, that... and still not take away from what they do as an oil painter or things like that. Right. And, and that's my point. And I think my thought and my great takeaway from this is that all of this is a tool. It's an opportunity more than anything else that just like everything is that this should be empowering us to do something else with ourselves, whether that's in a creative output, a time output or something other in our humanity that we're able to grow and develop ourselves. But I've always seen it, at least in the short conversations around AI and kind of the past five to 10 years where it's a lot more accessible. Uh, it's more of a curriculum. It's a more of a space that now, again, has become more of the mass adoption that more time has been on if we should versus yeah. what we can do if we let what's already happened happen. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always optimistic that we'll outpace our humanity will outpace technology. Right. And it it's already has, but not, you know, you know, I think in terms of laws to protect artists, it's going to take years. Hmm. The AI will continue to be developed. The models will be continue to be trained on more and more data, um, internationally artists from South, from Central America and South America and, and the African continent are gonna just go forward um, with this technology they have access to. Um, I think you, you'll find just like with any other medium, um, there are certain images that look exactly like the other images, like they don't do anything else to it. So it looks very similar to the next person's. Mm -hmm. Then you'll see something that looks very different and then realize that's probably an artist behind that. Yeah. So um, that's the that's and then those will be the ones that do get the commissions and those will be the ones that and, and people get used to being able to say, OK, this person, I've seen work like this before. They're probably just generating versus this one looks very creative and there's probably an artist doing this work. And I think people are starting to understand that and meaning people who would give artists commissions. So it's not about taking jobs, it's about being creative with the tools and being able to use the tools when needed. And, and be able to master them. 
so that you're ready for whatever comes. And that's the part that I think a lot of people miss is that it's already out the box. It's already out the bag. It's already out. It's not going back in the bag. Um, it's coming at us from chat GPT to the Bing situation with Microsoft to um, on the humanity side to the um, stuff like mid journey and Dolly two and, and so on deep dream generator that's happening. And so I think rather than thinking about how it's going to take jobs, it may create jobs. And I think that's the part it's driven by humans in terms of making a decision that this is something that's going to be around and, and we need to master it. Well, thank you. And we appreciate your mastery with through art and algorithms of showing that there's an, an inclusive space and, and frankly, black leadership. That's a component of this. So I'm very appreciative to see you as a, a true example of where we need to be going and, and the expertise we need to build and develop so we can be in that space. So you know, I sincerely thank you for that. You know, I think there's going to be a uh, maybe an abacus built between us, you know, here in uh, Cambridge soon enough. Right. But uh I think the idea of seeing your work and in, in, in these spaces is absolutely imperative and appreciate it. So before we go, where can we follow and support you and your endeavors? Um, Instagram, Nettie Beatrice. Um, it's probably the, the, the huge, biggest following is there. And then my um, NatriceGaskins.com is my website. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say and, and shout out. Uh, Lisa Yazik from uh, over at Georgia State, excuse me, Georgia Tech's LMC told me to tell you hi when I saw you. Yeah, right? yeah. It, the idea is that, again, it's uh, it's great to following and continue to, to see the success in this space. And mm -hmm. I'm just uh, completely optimistic that, you know, we'll have so many more stories, particularly black stories that will be able to be shared and appreciated because of this platform and this experience. So. Thank you for giving us an early synopsis and of your expertise. We have much more to come. So, Natrice, yeah. thank you so very much for being a part of Black Futures 2023. Sure. All right. Thank you now. Talk soon. Right. Thank you. And that was Natrice Gaskins, educator, researcher, traditional artist, and futurist from Art and Algorithms, talking about the space that artificial intelligence, Black stories, and visual excellence come together. So we're going to take a quick break as far as us coming up on the high noon hour where we'll talk with Sheree Renee Thomas and Milton Davis and myself in regards to the future of Afrofuturism. So with that, we appreciate you being a part of Black Futures 2023. This is Dejan Snee with Subsume. So stay tuned and stay included for more.
And welcome to Black Future 2023. This is Dejan Sneed, and I am joined by an amazing panelist and new panelist. Right? Have a seat, right? <laughs> so right on time, you can come a little closer in, and we want to speak about the state of Afrofuturism. And what I wanted to do is bring in two of the most prominent names in the space of speculative fiction and Afrofuturism today. Uh, we're joined by editor, writer, poet, and creative extraordinaire, uh, Madam Cherie Renee Thomas, as well as uh, Milton J. Davis of MV Media. And so the idea is for us to speak about the state of Afrofuturism, how we see speculative fiction's past, its current presence, and where do we look to a future of black technology, uh, black stories and innovation in our, in our shared space. So first of all, Cherie, welcome. Thank you so very much. I know you're making some special time for us today. As always, we're exalted and appreciated of your presence here at Subsume. Hope you're doing well today. I am, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. No, pleasure as always. And then if we get a chance to, to sit with the mogul himself, uh, Milton. So thank you so very much uh, here on site here at us, Subsume Studios in Atlanta, Georgia, where we're having our, our second Black Speculative Book Fair. And so Milton, how's, how are you doing? Doing good, man. Thanks for having me. I always enjoy hanging oh. out with Subsume and, and my lady Sherry here. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, so with that, you know, we have so many spaces right now that use that moniker of Afrofuturism. But when we think of, you know, seminal work of, of Ms. Thomas's uh, Dark Matter and looking at a real space and space, space and name and narrative to to bring all these things together. It looks like we've come a long way, but the idea of this panel is to see really how far have we come as artists and creators in the space of Afrofuturism. And now that that name is being in more and more spaces, does that mean the, the work is done or is there much more work to come? So the idea kind of to start off with is we'd love to first get a little bit more of a introduction of who you all are, kind of the works that you have, and then we'll get right into it. As we, I'm very excited for this panel. So Sharif, you'll start us off We'd love to best regale the, the, our audience here with Subsume of who you are, the many spaces that you touch in our in our shared space, and yes, all that's going on with you right now. Okay, hi, um, my name is Cherie Renee Thomas, and greeting you from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, my hometown. I am a writer and an editor. I edit the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Uh, we turned seventy-four uh, years old this fall. Um, and it's the magazine that you can subscribe to. So keep print alive. Um, I love publishing um, original 
short stories from new writers, but also some of our, you know, legendary authors as well. I just came back from Paris for delivering a talk on Afrofuturism, and I got a chance to meet one of our longtime FNSF authors and uh, a pillar in the science fiction and fantasy genre, Norman Spinrad. So that was a, a lot of fun. And I got to see some um, former, a former student of mine who is doing wonderful work in a new collection called Infinite Constellations that I hope you all will check out. And just being a part of the, the writing world has been really great. Um, I taught a workshop in Mexico before that called Under the Volcano, um, a speculative fiction workshop, which was their 20th anniversary of having it in Tepatzlan, uh, Mexico, about an hour and a half two hours outside of Mexico City. And that was pretty amazing. So I'm very excited about the new work that comes out of that. Um, what I have been doing in the past two years, which has been very interesting, is collaborative work, which is a different kind of collaboration from editing, right? Mm -hmm. Editing, um, you're putting other stories up front. Uh, we're really excited that Africa Risen is a NAACP Image Award nominee this year with some wonderful fine company, uh, wonderful writers that I have loved and admired for a long time. So that's really exciting for my co-editors, uh, Ogeni Chowe, Donald Ekpeke, and Zelda Knight and I. Um, but when you are a writer who is used to telling specific kinds of stories, right, in the Afrofuturism genre. It's a very interesting new um, challenge to collaborate with a, another point, you know, another writer, um, artist in a different kind of way. And so I got a chance to do that on the uh, memory library and the other dirty, uh, other stories from Dirty Computer that was Janelle Monet's debut fiction collection. So that was pretty ex exciting. I don't know if I have it, have it somewhere around here. I do. I do. <laughs> I'm a visual learner, so I'm like, you gotta remember that you might not remember the titles, but you may remember the cover. Oh. There's a wonderful Janelle Monet on the cover who's mm -hmm. just dropped a new song, Float, that we got to hear early last year. Yeah, so so um so it's been just a whirlwind. I wrote being a writer is about milestones, right? So I worked wrote the first novel that I'm, I'm happy with <laughs> from beginning to end, which is the Black Panther, Panther's Rage um, novel adaptation of the original comics um, that Don McGregor, Rich Buckler, and of course the Billy Graham created. So that was a lot of fun and um, very interesting. So it's just been amazing time in terms of writing, editing, of course, edit Obsidian, uh, which is an African diasporic um, publishing platform. And this year, we just won $90,000 in grants uh, from NEA and the Poetry Foundation and others. We'll be able to pay our contributors um, going forward, or, um, or at least that the, the grants that we have now will help us um, begin doing that, which is the first time in the history of the journal, which was a labor of love, um, started doing the Black Arts Movement in 1975. So, I'm in um, the Afrofuturism realm and um, in multiple forms and I just keep doing the work that I love. And it's very exciting to see the work that you all are doing, Subsoon and MV Media and all of the um, amazing authors that you are bringing into the world. And it's just like, for me, I just feel like we are definitely um, making a lot of great progress and because we're still not free as a people, we are always continue to have work to do to build the Afro future. But the fact that the rest of the world is becoming more excited about this body of work um, is very, very uh, encouraging and exciting. Yes, no, perfect. And, and Milton, please, let's, let us uh, hear about yourself as Milton J. Davis, and we'll get the, the name played for you the next go around. <laughs> so please, by all means, uh, you know, love, love to hear more about yourself and, and your amazing impact in our space. Yeah, I, I came into the industry as, a, in, as an indie writer, um, mainly because of the fact that I had certain stories I wanted to tell. I wanted to tell them in a certain way. Um, I felt like at the time, uh, the mainstream publishing industry wasn't um, really open to that. 
And so I said, this is the way I want to tell the stories. Plus, I had a background of being an entrepreneur, so I wasn't afraid of that aspect of doing the work. Um, I have to give props to Cherie because, you know, one, her being her being one of my inspirations because of the Dark Matter uh, anthology. It was the first time I ever read a collection of stories by black authors that were like science fiction and fantasy. And some of the authors that I um, follow and respect today, you know, Charles Saunders, Linda Addison, Nisi Shaw. The first time I read those people, these authors were in Dark Matter. So that was part of, you know, my background of doing what I was doing. Um, as I started to write stories and publish stories, and talk to different authors, I felt like there needed a, be, to be a, a similar vehicle for expression for Black authors, you know, to give them the opportunity to write in genres that they had never written in before. And that's why we came up with the funk anthologies and all the other anthologies that we do were basically to give authors that opportunity. And during that time, we've actually been able to publish authors that have gone on to do well in the mainstream as well. You know, people like Fenders and Clark and other authors that, that came through um, what we were doing. and. For a while, I think it's been more touch and go, but um, the publisher and starting to connect and network with more people. Um, just and and the I think the the popularity of Afrofuturism, Afrofuturism has had a lot to do with that. Um, over the past week, I've done two different talks at actual corporations that had these seminars on Afrofuturism because their employees want to know more about it. And that was kind of a unique experience because you're, it's that, you know, years ago, sometimes we were still trying to define what Afrofuturism was from a literary standpoint. I remember doing the Black Kirby um, event at Auburn Avenue Research Library where John Jennings and Stacey Robinson was there. And they were talking about their work and their interpretations of um, some of, uh, I forgot the name of the author, um, the artist, um, well, Jack Kirby, okay. you know, some of his authors. Some of the, and, and I posed a question about, Afrofuturism from a literary standpoint. And at the time, you know, we were trying to kind of figure out, well, who would we consider to be in that? But now, as we, the definition has become more clear, we have authors that are actually writing as Afrofuturism authors, like uh, Yatasi Womack and different people like that. So just seeing um, how the definition has expanded and how it's encompassing different forms of uh, science fiction, speculative fiction, creativity has been interesting. and being able to be involved in it, not only as an author, but as a publisher has been very interesting as well. And starting to see this merger between um, indie creativity and traditional publishing, um, like myself, you know, I've been published in, I have a story in Black Panther Tales of Wakanda. Um, I have a story um, that was published in, in Obsidian that was uh, nominated for a push card, you know. So, you know, um, seeing that um, crossover, I guess you can call it, and that amalgamation of uh, this black creativity in all the spaces now, I think it's kind of taken everything up to another level. In addition to the fact that general audiences are now more aware of what we're doing. You know, we used to be very niche, but since Black Panther movie came, since the Black Panther movie came out and kind of um, opened up that conversation to the general audiences, we're seeing more people interested. And I think it's really a good time to be doing what we're doing. So my question is, uh, and a fantastic work. So then my follow up question is, why why aren't we rich? Like all this, all this talent. Listen to what Sharija just said. She, all the things this young lady does, all these things that you do. And we have all of the spaces that Apple Futurism is impacting and, and building a component of. Why do we not see or do we see the recompense of agency and authority where now that we're able to take our stories and our narratives and really build infrastructure like that we see studios or we see our own studios prosper and develop in the space of Afrofuturism or do we see traditional media want to seek out these artists, these creators, these narrators of culture and say we're willing to invest millions in making these stories. So we you know we've talked to Black Panther a couple of times and obviously you both have written in that world and the spaces that we see as traditional um, Hollywood spaces always need stories that have a following. And I think we've already acknowledged here that now we're seeing a global following for Afrofuturism. Does that translate into sustainable spaces for Black storytellers? Well, <laughs> I'm going to start waving the indie banner when it comes to that. I mm -hmm. feel like one of the reasons that it's that way is because right now we're in this space and we're not in this space as owners. Mm -hmm. We're in this space that where we're providing um, content um, through different levels to other people who are owners. And the closer you get to 
being an owner, the closer you, the, the more profit that you gain. And, you know, as an author, for instance, and a traditional author, and, and Sharika can correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, you're getting an advance and then you're getting a small percentage of the sales after that. A lot of times authors don't earn out their advances. Um, on the other hand, as an indie author, um, as, because I own the book, you know, I'm making more money from it. But then my problem is that marketing is getting the, you know, getting the word out to a large enough group of people to make it a significant, you know, a significant thing. And that's one of the things that I work on right now. Um, but I think as we as we claim more ownership, as we see more black people owning studios, owning publishing companies and um, and taking advantage of that, I think that's where we'll start seeing the money. But also there's also the challenge of being able to market to these audiences. And I think that's another challenge that we have to work on, that we have to deal with. Um, it's, it's a dollars and cents thing to me. Um, we know what we're creating is good. We know people want it. Um, now it's a matter of owning it and developing those channels and those networks to the readers and to the watchers and everything else to in order for us to see that type of money. From an, from an investor standpoint, it's still a matter of, of, of building confidence in what we do. There's still people that know we're doing things, but they are not confident enough to where they want to actually sign that check and say, you know, here, Milton, here's a million dollars, <laughs> you know, go, <laughs> go build this business and stuff. And that's just something that comes from a, over a period of time. That's and, a, and from a, a number of successes. You know, as you have more success, people build that confidence and then that will come. So um, I guess I'm not is a lot of different things I think that fa that factor into that. Um, and I think we're just really starting to build and accomplish some of those things from that standpoint. Understood. Now, Sheree, as far as yourself, again, you having a, a great global pur global purview of how Afrofuturism is impacted and being accepted in these spaces. Do you feel that there that the the marketplace is ready for full engagement with Afrofuturism or speculative fiction in this sense? I think it is, but I wanted to go back to the question you asked, why aren't we rich? Most of us didn't go into the field to become rich. Fair I enough. know very many writers who say, <laughs> I'm going to be rich right. as a writer, at least right. not writers of books, perhaps maybe writers of movies, right. <laughs> which is some of the highest paid writers outside of technical writers in our industry, right? Um, maybe writers for television, perhaps, but not necessarily for books. And I think Milton is right on points um, discussing um, shifting your role from being a content provider um, to a person who owns the space that's being created, but also has access to the distribution. You know what I mean? Of being course. able to get it to the audiences. Um, when you're doing with IP, working with IP, that's a very interesting dynamic. It is already not set up for you to be necessarily rich unless you have been in the game for a while and have managed to carve out that space for you but when you're working with other people's intellectual intellectual properties they own that property right so you write for disney you don't own the property that you're writing disney owns disney shareholders owns that property right um you could become a shareholder holder right but it's very different from the creator standpoint i think um, part of the what I'm seeing people that I love and admire who are just now getting to a position of actual stability in their careers. And it's not necessarily from academia, but it's from being in the writers rooms. It's from being, um, a, you know, being at another level in terms of creating work that gets to these large, you know, you know, blockbuster audiences just now doing it after 30, 40 years. OK, some of them longer. So. I don't think it's a overnight um, journey, especially when things that are so centered in black culture are cyclical and are kind of like a trend from time to time. Um, Afrofuturism has shown staying power, as far as I can tell. Um, there were people who are, who are on the like lecture circuit now who were proclaiming its demise not too long ago. And yet, whenever there's a check out, <laughs> there they are. <laughs> there they are, you know. Um, so I feel like it is very much something that the mainstream has gotten a hold of. And they're trying to figure out how do they monetize this shiny, you know, new marketable thing, you know, 
from my back, background in publishing, all of this is real estate for the most part. And it's real estate that we use to demarcate things that we've already been doing, right? Things we're already been talking about, work that we're already excited about. So seeing things that are coming from the underground, slowly getting more mainstream just means that we also have other work that we need to do in terms of making sure that we, as the creators of that work, have a say in how it gets, you know, portrayed out there and also being compensated fairly. Um, I used to be part of the National Writers Union and other actual activist groups, not just kind of like, oh, I'm in this guild, but we're actually about that life and trying to make lives better for, for writers on in a concrete material way. Writing is a thing that everybody and mom thinks they can do. They think they can do it. Um, and when they start doing the blog temp, you know, templates and things like that, there it was. Everybody already thought, you know, they can write. And that's actually just not the case. I'm sorry. I mean, write well. Let's put the let's put in the qualities, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. So when you have a, a a a skill that people think that they already can do on their own that is disposable, right? It you're already fighting the uphill battle to get you know fairly compensated for the work that you're doing, right? So we we just have a lot of different um things that we're 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 going against when you talk about well how do we get rich well how do you get into to these spaces where you're a part of that that um creation right um at a level where the compensation is the highest right not where someone's just coming along reading your stuff and then trying to figure out how they can imitate it right and put in people um that they feel like should be doing it i've seen some projects i just want to say i've seen some projects that i really really cared about get canceled out the door. And honestly, they didn't have the right people working on it in the first place. <laughs> That's, I mean, let's just be really, really real. Um, there are people who've been in this field for a long time, and I'm not just speaking to myself. We've talked about some of, uh, mentioned some of those wonderful people, and they haven't been tapped to do this kind of writing, the writing that they naturally do. You know, so I just feel like there are more of us out here who are available, more in, our, in your audience today, who could do a wonderful job with it. And it's just a matter of either, as Milton said, create those spaces yourselves independently um, or um, finding a way to get people who are the ones who write those, those contracts, who write those checks to actually check in and have faith in the people who got them you know, interested in the work in the first place. Right. Like, yeah. You know, give them a shot at it because they, they can do it and they've been doing it. They've been doing it outside of the white gaze, outside of the industry, outside of the drive-by articles that you know they get some random you know journalist to come and who knows nothing about the field to, to write this this article, you know, and they go and find whatever Google footprint they can find and whatever other articles and pick the you know those two three people, find the people who are actually creating the work, new work, you know, every day, and I think it'll be a whole nother level of that kind of work and it may last longer because they actually know what they're doing and why they're doing it. So, yeah. Absolutely. And and I think to that point of and you de and you deconstructed that well. I think the idea when we think that things are popular, that the people who've been doing it all of a sudden, you know, are called upon or thrust upon this level of greatness, whether no matter the industry. But I think the idea, as you say, is the lasting power of sustainability of what Afrofuturism has been and where it can go in that sense. So, you know, I appreciate you all playing along with the the sense of, well, you know, Black Panther's out. So we know you all, you know, are, are doing, you know, some level of, of what perception of success should be. But I think to the, the brass tacks of where Afrofuturism and its understanding was, was academic, right? At least from my interpretation of where a lot of the narrative and the coining of the phrase and again a lot of the composition and compilation of, of historic and contemporary works seems to still live a lot of spaces in that academic sense have we seen a shift of the more popularization of, of some of these properties or ips that we talk about have we moved from the core of afrofuturism still being an academic practice into the space of it being widely accepted and engaging 
or in what if and if not what is that bridge or is that a bridge we still need to be building mm. when i first encountered the terms um the Af the term afrofuturism um I was part of Alondra Nelson's um, Afrofuturism.net. And there were other people, of course, who helped create it and make that space special. But it was very much an academic um, exercise in terms of discussing the body of work in multiple mediums, not just books and stories, but also in film and art, visual arts, which is very exciting, and music, which was probably the most obvious thing that people um, outside of the community, you know, became aware of, right? Because it had been happening a long time. Um, there was, of course, the discussion of the digital divide and bridging that then. And it was a very kind of classist discussion as well. And mm -hmm. we saw that it's still very much an issue during the pandemic, in the early days of the quarantine, right? right? When suddenly it became very clear that there, you know, there's organizations or whatever that were supposed to have certain funding to have, you know, you know, you know, the internet available to, you know, low income communities across the country, but they never had been held accountable to do that. And then the schools weren't really set up, they, you know, to receive it, you know, or what have you. So there was a lot of, um, it was a steep learning curve in terms of that. Um, so the, that was still an issue, right? People think if they see people with flat screens and things like that, that that somehow means that the technology has, you know, spread out across the masses and that everyone has access. But when you see people who were teachers, professors, you know, on the elementary school, high school, secondary level, you know what I mean? And they had to be at home with multiple kids in different ages trying to do online, supervise online schooling for those kids. It became very clear that guess what? Even with in our some, you know, our lower middle classes, that 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 technology isn't quite as widespread and accessible as you would think. Um, all that's to say, you know, it was also very centered, you know, despite, um, you know, Alondra Nelson's wonderful contributions, um, most of the people writing about Afrofuturism were not in the, in the Black community um, in the world period. Like they were, you know, from, you know, outside of the community or mainstream. So you're always getting things filtered through the lens of the white gaze, right? Wherever, whether that's European, whether it's here in the states or it's canadian or whatever it is it's from someone from the outside you know trying to make sense of of of, of what was happening in the art that has definitely changed um and i have a couple of you know moments milestone moments that i think of that created that change but it's absolutely more global it's less american centric um even though of course the, the, the largest publishing apparatus is here in the united states right yeah. um and and of course through through English. So there is that. So it's still always going to be, not always, but it's still very much a North American kind of thing. But the focus is including other communities from around the diaspora, right? And there's a grassroots element to it that I didn't see necessarily before. And that's just me. Other people may have other opinions. But I saw that with the Black Speculative Arts Movement happening, where it wasn't just you know, scholars in a room giving papers, but it was also activists in the community who are on the ground talking about real life experiences that kind of informed some of the art that was being created, right, in whatever form it was. And you also had an intergenerational approach to it that I think was very exciting. And you had independent, you know, creators as well as those who were part of the, the larger, more traditional, you know, formats, all interacting together. So what has made it very different now, I think, is that um, one, Paris, to have a conversation about Afrofuturism, um, thanks to the jazz innovator, um, Nicole Mitchell, who had an artist in residence at the University of Paris and Saint-Denis, that's extraordinary. <laughs> um, and for it to be mostly Black-centered was also extraordinary. Um, because usually it's other people, you know, pontificating about our work using, you know, European philosophers as the reference. But you don't have to use European philosophers to talk about our art or Afrofuturism. We have um, centuries of um, of our own cultural context in which to use, whether you're talking about in North America or Africa, the continent itself, or in her diaspora, you know, elsewhere. Um, there's such a large body of work now that it's absolutely unnecessary to 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 reach outside it 
to have a conversation. Right. If you choose, you can use um, African work to do that. And if we're going to talk about the Afro future, obviously black people, black thoughts should be centered in that. So that is very, 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 very different than what um, the scholarship and research I've been seeing um, over these past uh, three decades. Uh, very different. And it's very exciting because you're having different kinds of conversations and different connections are being made with the work. Um, I will also say something else. It may be a little controversial, but for me, when I'm constantly watching Black Death on TV and the news, I'm watching Black farmers being, um, you know, their land being stolen, just using the same tactics from the KKK, you know, right after, you know, the reconstruction was um, sabotage. When you think about the living history of the 21st century, that we are still dealing with the issues that were in the proto science fiction from the 1890s, the 1850s. We're still facing it in the year 2023 of our Lord, right? <laughs> um, I have very little patience for just abstract conversations about Afrofuturism. I do, me personally. I find it very disconcerting for people to be so invested in this abstract future or futures, but have no interest in what's happening in the Afro present today, what's happening to black children, black families, you know, the black economy. Um, we are under siege in almost every realm. So yes, you can create, create wonderful work that helps you escape that. You can create wonderful work that helps you you know, see it through a different lens. And that's very exciting and it's powerful. And we need it. But you also, the one of the big traditions of Afrofuturism is speculative fiction, speculating on giving, making you look at the world that we live in today through the lens of the future, whether that's the next five minutes or whether it's 5,000 years in the future, or whether it's here on earth or in a whole nother alternate place, right? But you're still make, giving, making a commentary about the world we live today. I find it fascinating that people are not prepared often to engage with what the ramifications are for how we're being treated in our different societies around the world as black people mm -hmm. in the present right um but they want to skip that part and just talk about oh this future um how do we get to that future what has changed in the present that will make that future possible, the positive futures I'm thinking of, right? You know, and where would we be if we if we continue down the, the path that we're on right now, which is continued struggle, right? In terms of just getting basic um, human rights and dignity, you know. So that's that's what I'm on. I don't know about the rest of these people, but that's what I'm on. And that's not always going to be something that is easily marketable. Because the, why I wanted to talk about that is because if your goal in studying Afrofuturism is just to, you know, to write some, some new lines about Octavia Butler and Samuel R. Delaney, our, our, our pioneers, right? right, And that's your goal, well, th that's fine. That's great. We need that, right? But if your goal is to talk about the type of Afrofuturistic works or African futurism or African jujuism or African, I forget the other term um, that Cora Ford came up with, um, you know, because, you know, Pamela came up with Afro African futurism and then Nady did her blogs about, you know, the technology and the, the magic elements of her own work, re-examining her work and through that, through that lens. What, what, you know, what, it, if your project, if your project isn't black thriving and striving and, and beyond survival in the future, right? It's a your project is to imagine, you know, healthy, you know, societies, right? Positive, equitable worlds, right? Justice, a lived thing in the world and not a legend, right? <laughs> um, then that's then you're not really going to be centered that much in Afrofuturist thought today, right? Because we have discussed W.E. Du Bois's double consciousness. That's not new or novel. We, there are a lot of other things that we've already, you know, written into the ground. What is happening today? What are you talking about today? That's about that life. That's about putting forth positive black futures in the world. And if that's not your project as a personal individual, you're not going to be too keen on capturing 
some of the developments that are happening in our writing, in our paintings, in our music and song and dance and play. And, and that's and that's and that's a struggle because keep in mind it's always been our lives has always been looked through an anthropological lens. Mm. You know, you know, I'm on the outside watching these, you know, these interesting characters do their culture, <laughs> you know. And that's a very colonialist dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it has it's it has some it has some problems, it's problematic, right? So there is a lot that's happening in uh, the field that's not always captured in these little drive-by articles that come out and these little listicles, right? And that's the part in which I'm living in. And that's the part in which I'm listening and observing and creating work in. Because for me, it's not a, just about writing, making a comic book and having another character. For me, it's about creating stories that, that have kind of a Sankofa approach to life right that's looking to the future but also being very conscious of the past and the present the present that affects us we're creating this work in a time when they want to erase the past 70 years of progress they want to erase the little black history that was even in the curriculum right and what exactly is the is the pushback from it what are we doing about it right what are we doing about it um so to me, I think about it, the scholarship of the work, the discussion of the work is like people being alive during the Harlem Renaissance and or the Renaissance that was happening across the wherever black people live. So it wasn't just in Harlem, but it was in Virginia. It was in Atlanta. It was in New Orleans. It was in Memphis. It was wherever black people live. It was in Chicago. Right. You can go and find artists that were doing creative salons and things at that time. Um, but if we if you were alive during the Harlem Renaissance and you are a scholar and you're trying to, you know, write about these black artists, but you by writing about Phyllis Wheatley, Whitley, Wheatley, right? You're writing about Phyllis Wheatley when Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, County Cullen, you know, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, all of these amazing people are getting given they given their lives to the art in real time. Then you've really met you've really missed an opportunity to do something novel and original with your observations, your cultural observations. So we're in a, we're in a, a renaissance right now, right? Um, or re-emergence, right? Um, but some of us never stop working. Um, so just creating those spaces where black culture and perspectives are centered in the world in that work, it's just an, a revolutionary thing. It's a revolutionary thing. There's a lot of excellent points. I want to give Milton a, a chance to, to kind of correlate in, in, that, in that same space as far as you know, from academia to our, our current space of creativity within Afrofuturism. Where's the, where's your perspectives of, of where we've come or where are we right now in, in this dynamic? I have absolutely nothing to add to what Sheree just I said. Know. There's <laughs> she, nothing to add. She, she, I just want to leave, she, give you the compliment. She covered every point. Uh, no. Excellent. I'm sorry. It's on top of my dome. I literally <laughs> no, had no, 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 no. You're like, cultures, multiple languages, you know, trying to navigate <laughs> to, to see this phenomenon that's happening. And I'm just like, I'm at a space where I'm like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you can't just get over talking about Butler and Delaney. Only you have to open up the the the, the doors, right? Exactly. Um, I mean, we were. Um, I think a perfect example of it, and and I haven't talked about this because there are some people who um, I know who might you know they were involved in this. I recently did a panel um, at a particular convention here in Atlanta, and it was a panel about Octavia Butler, and they asked me to be on the panel, and I was like, well, you know, I'm not really sure if I to be the person on this panel. Um, because I know some people who are much more eloquent about her and her work than I am. I said, they said, well, we want you to be on this. So I'm on this panel. And I was the only black person on the panel. There were no black women on the panel. Um, and the other people who were on the panel had just recently read Octavia Butler's work. And so they were um, interpreted, interpreting it from a modern perspective of, of some of her work looking as being prophecy, you know. Um, but there was a there was a sister in the audience who was a Octavia Butler scholar, basically. She'd met Octavia Butler. She'd read all of Octavia Butler's books. And I was saying, well, you know, 
um, I probably should get out of my seat and let her come up here <laughs> and talk about this. And after the after the meeting was over with, after the, the panel was over with, I had black people come to me saying, how did you feel about sitting on this panel? <laughs> and you were the only black person on this panel. And they were talking about Octavia Butler. And I was like, yeah, I didn't feel comfortable. You know, and it kind of goes to some of the things like Sheree is talking about. You had people talking about um, her from the outside looking in, and they weren't talking about it from the from a, having a personal experience and connection to it. And I and I say that because um, as we talked about Afrofuturism, it's the same thing. I understand what Sheree is talking about, and when we create these future worlds, and when these future worlds we have stories about Black people living better and doing better, um, we have to think about how did they get there. You know, what was the path that they got there? And we need to talk about that in the context of what we're doing, like she said, in the context of what we're dealing with now. And that's something that, that I think about all the time when I'm doing my work. And it's something that I think about when I read the work by other people. You know, I do write, I do write escapist work. I write some work that's just like, oh, I'm just pie in the sky type thing. But at the same time, I'm, I'm looking at work and I'm developing work where I'm looking at the same thing. Well, you know, if we, as black people, how do we get to this point? And I think that's not only a part of Afrofuturism, but it's a part of science fiction also. I mean, a perfect example would be just from a technical standpoint, you know, we watch Star Trek and we saw the communicator, then somebody says, how do we get to the communicator? And that's where we get the development of cell phones and stuff like that. But when we look at it from a social and cultural standpoint as black people, when we look at this future where everything's gonna be, you know, great for us, and which is, the, you know, how most of us were raised, you know, I was raised Old, old school that you do this now so it can be better for the generation following you you know and at my age right now i'm seeing myself dealing with stuff that i thought we had dealt with and that we were moving from and it's right back here right in our face again and you know and stuff that i was dealing with when i was you know integrating schools at 12 years old and dealing with race riots and stuff like that you know and, and i'm seeing this you know whole scenario almost like it's resurfacing again and I know why it's resurfacing, and I understand why. But um, using fiction as a way to um, sometimes people can deal with things in fiction that they can't deal with in real life. They can see it on the news and look away from it, but then you can write a fictional story about it and it puts it in their face and they have to deal with it because they're connected with these characters and stuff like that. And I think that is a part of um, that is a part of what we develop when we talk about Afrofuturism. Um, we go from, a, a, to me, from an academic standpoint, where it was a term that was specific. When I first started thinking about Afrofuturism, it was a, a specific term to me that covered a specific thing. I didn't think it covered a lot of things that I wrote. You know, I didn't think it covered, you know, Sword and Soul. I didn't think it covered, you know, Steve Funk. Um, but I think the, from a marketing standpoint, I think as it started to grow, and this is just my personal opinion, I feel like, um, the powers that be said, okay, we got this thing that's growing. We got to give it a label. We got to give it a name, you know. So we're going to use Afrofuturism to be the label, and we're going to and we're going to take everything that's black speculative fiction and put it under that banner, you know. And I think that's the way they look at it from a marketing standpoint. But from as creators and being black people, um, we're looking at, and that's what I'm seeing in a lot of these meetings that I'm in. That we're looking at how do we apply the concepts of Afrofuturism to real life. I was in a discussion the other day where people were talking about, you know, how do we apply um, Afrofuturism to climate change? How do we apply it to, you know, social issues that we're dealing with? How do we take those concepts and use that concept to answer these questions that need to be answered? And I'll be honest, I was, you know, it was a it was an eye opening conversation for me because I was not aware of how deeply people were going into using these concepts to, to solve problems. And there's even a, well, there's a, it's kind of like off center, but there's a, even a brother that created a uh, restaurant in Baltimore, which is um, based on a Afrofuturist idea that he had, you know, and the, and the um, meals and, and the development of the restaurant reflects, you know, his concept from an Afrofuturistic standpoint. So it's really fascinating and exciting to see people applying these concepts to answer these questions. And it's also exciting to see that the fact that they're being led by black people, that we're the ones that, that are doing this, which is always essential. It even goes back to when we talk about I mean, being rich, being becoming rich writers and stuff. Again, it's a matter of us taking control of that and owning that and using that to solve these problems, these questions and stuff. So it might sound, I mean, it might be sound like I'm rambling a little bit, but uh, like I said, uh, uh, Cherie answered everything so well. And I think, and I agree with everything that she says, that we have to start taking these uh, concepts and, and using them to, uh, 
to provide some kind of solutions. Um, science fiction and fantasy, science fiction has always been like that. There's always been people, so all science fiction was ever political. Science fiction has always been a situation or, or, or a genre where people have taken a look at current situations and tried to provide some kind of explanation or, or, or answer to things. So, and I think we need to continue that as black people. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you both. Again, I'm, it's not going to leave me much to say, but, you know, I'm, I'm here learning and taking notes again. Y'all are my idols and I really appreciate you both being here now. Um, just my reflection off of this and, and just kind of to, to curtail a bit of what you said there, Milton, and to uh, you as well, Sheree, the idea of us as black writers, as black creators, is that our existence in, in a lot of these spaces has been a space of resistance, right? That, that we're we're addressing a lot of times a larger narrative, a larger audience, a larger other that's a majority that does not see us in the spaces of equality. And again, to the same point as Sheree was saying, like we have a lot of the same issues and concerns from 100, 200 years ago. Um, you know, the idea of what we thought would be completely gone by now in the space of, you know, from segregation to integration to the idea of our contemporary selves that we're seeing a, a reverberance of trying to take things back to a, a space of a separation. I say that to say that Afrofuturism seemed to come be born out of that space of necessity of ownership and agency of ourselves. Now to that, and I know we only have a couple of minutes left, does that mean that Afrofuturism stays independent, stays in a, a is a natural space of, of resistance or in a space of uniqueness um, in the space of speculative fiction works, or is there a is there a amalgam of, of our works that then becomes the majority or becomes that normal? And again, that's the idea of just projecting of, as we always do in the future, what's the future hold for Afrofuturism? And I'll leave that as kind of an open, oh, closing uh, question for both of you. Wow, I guess the only thing that I'm thinking of is the fact that what happens to anything that we create? Um, a part of it gets mainstream and commercialized to the point where people forget we created it. <laughs> They'll say it's American. <laughs> um, <laughs> we created gospel, rock, jazz, rock and roll, soul, hip hop, all the things, right? And then it gets mainstream and it's like, mm, you get divorced from the creation. So that will happen probably, right, at some point. But then we're also always going to keep innovating and creating in it, right? And the parts that are so blackity, 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 black, that nobody but people who love blackity, blackity, black, black, black folks are going to be bothered with it will continue, right? <laughs> mm. So um, so there is that. So, I mean, I just think about breakdancing. It's going to be in the Olympics. Mm. And it'll probably be mostly Koreans. Or who, like, who is it going to be competing? I don't know. Um, just a very interesting dynamic with our, with the things that we create in the world. And when I say we, in this sense, I'm talking about specifically African Americans or Black Americans in particular, because um, that's who I, I'm speaking for I, as a Black American. I, I can't speak for the rest of the diaspora or or, or the continent um, and all the nations and and and, and, and <laughs> cons, you know principalities and such. But um, they can speak for themselves. But I'm just thinking about the things that we create in, in our country that when we're often told that we don't have a culture, um, but the whole world is com constantly cosplaying or, or copying or, you know, innovating and adding to remixing and reimagining that culture that we created in this particular place. So I just feel like um, we'll keep, you know, people who create will still create. We may have some similarities. They may say a hundred years from now, my goodness, we're still fighting the same. I hope they don't. <laughs> they may say a hundred years we're still fighting the same that they were talking about in the 21st century, you know, or 20, you know, or what have you, right? Um, but we'll always still have some some advances as well, right? And mm -hmm. the fact that we're having this conversation on this platform in this forum in Black History Month, in Black Futures Month, right? is um is a win it's a pro is progress is growth and, and it's a hopeful thing and so i'm going to try to maintain that hope you know by being but being very very real about the world that we are in right now and the things that we're facing because we can ill afford to slip into a kind of 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 a stasis and inertia you know 
we cannot that's not what afrofuturism about is about it's about working despite the challenges despite the horrors um in the face of maybe sometimes not seeing recognizable progress right but having that faith to keep creating and and and, and imagining better future for us for ourselves and for the world so well i'll just say briefly i think that the way that we keep afrofuturism as it is is ownership um i'll use i'll use the example of uh, music um there are people today that don't even know rock and roll was created by black people that's because even though we had the artists there we had no ownership in that industry of developing it so we were basically kind of written out there's nothing we can do about it and i compare that to hip-hop we have ownership in hip-hop you know hip-hop has evolved it's been it's universal people use it everywhere but everybody always knows and remembers that hip-hop is black because we have ownership in that because the people who came into hip-hop were a lot savvier than uh, uh, the artists that came into rock and roll. And I think it's just, I think that's something that's really important that we need to develop in um, the realm of Afrofuturism. We need to have ownership. We need to have uh, publishers. We need to have people who have ownership in it. And that way, they're always there. They're always present. And they're always there to remind people that this is where it came from. This is where it's being controlled. And this is how it's evolving. And stuff. So that's basically what I'm saying. That's it. Oh, I'm, I'm appreciative of that space there's nothing more for me to add to any of that component uh, outside of the fact that it is such a robust and, and amazing space right now and i think as again to as Sheree, um alluded and, and said specifically like we're in a renaissance i mean even through the renaissance there was a lot of innovation but it was also a lot of social turmoil at the same time and through that transformation of culture of society we get the next iteration of things of our futures to be. Obviously, we want those futures to be together and positive in that space. And I'm one that wants to double down and thinking that Apple Futurism specifically will be a solution space for our the opportunities of tomorrow. So I think it's so imperative that us as as creators in this space that we understand that we're the vanguard of something very intentional, a solution set and a tool that again understands the past embraces the the present and is hopeful and optimistic that there's a future that we all get a chance to exist as we want to be and so i'm just appreciative of of stewards like yourself people that do the work that are are the are the the leading forces in our space so um i just want to thank you both for being a part of black future 2023 being our black history in the making and, and both of you folks. So let me make sure we give you all flowers right now. Um, and then just last, we want to close. How can we follow and support both of you um, in your endeavors ahead? Hmm. You can um, read a book. <laughs> so um, I have lots of books that I've, I've published or I've contributed to. So that would be great. And, and um, share it with someone you think that might enjoy it. Um, I can be found on social media under Black Pot Mojo on Twitter and Sheree Renee Thomas on IG, Sheree Renee dot Thomas on um, F, uh, Facebook. And you can subscribe to publications that keeps us alive. So subscribe to Obsidian, which is an amazing, wonderful um, publication that publishes Black creatives, all genres around the world. Um, really proud to be um, uh, associate editor of that and subscribe to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. We're doing some exciting things there. And so that would be great. And just a quick shout out and appreciation uh, of being the, the editor of our, our sorghum and spear anthology oh, no. <laughs> came out and, and, and is on the other side of this wall. So and, and, and be in your mailbox soon enough. So thank you yeah. so very much. Thank um, you. Uh, no, well, bless you. Thank you. And, uh, well, for me, um, I would say check out my own website, um, www.mvmediaatl.com. That's uh, my publishing company. Uh, that's where I spend most of my time at. You know, um, I've got social media stuff like that, but I would say the most important thing would be to support what we're creating. You know, because we're we're developing this this uh, hopefully what we will evolve into is a multimedia company where we not only will we be dealing with publishing books, we'll be dealing with you know comic books, we'll be dealing with animation, we'll be dealing with all aspects of creativity and um, and that's that's what it's all about <laughs> i remember i got a a, a, a a royalty check i wasn't anticipating and i spent almost every dime on it with mv media 
I don't um, know if I just bought all of them. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I was that's like, it. wow. That's awesome. It's awesome. Wonderful, wonderful books. Books I would have loved for my children when they were smaller, you know, to you know, to see themselves in other ways. You know, so he, he has MV Media has work for all ages. I also urge you to please support Mocha uh, Memoirs, um, mm -hmm. which is Nicole uh, um, uh, Gibbons Kurtz publication. And also please support Zelda Knight's um, publishing. Um, there's just there's so many independent people doing amazing work. So absolutely go and support your small publishers. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you both so very much. There'll be a space and a place for us all here in the shared future of Afrofuturism and the space of Subsume, which we want to make sure that everyone stays tuned and stays included with us as we continue on for more. Shuri and Milton, thank you both so very much. And we'll stay tuned for more. We'll be right back.
Thank you all so very much. This is Dejan Sneed here with Black Futures 2023. And we are into the space of creativity, technology, community, and the intersection of the Black Futures of tomorrow being with the actionable and intentional creativity of our stories and narratives today. So I am surrounded by talent, as you see, as we look to talk about the state of Black indie comics. and. You know, with that, just thankful for everyone's time and opportunity to join us here during Black Futures 2023. Uh, with that, we have, uh, we're just going to get and just get right into it. So we've got a fantastic panel of talent here that love to uh, start with uh, Deirdre Holloman from Black Commons Creative. We have Professor John Jennings uh, with Megascope. Jason Rees returns to us again from 133 Art. And then we have the fantastic writer and creative Chuck Brown. Is it Ogun Inc? Is that right? Am I remembering that correct, Chuck? Thank you. So with that, uh, Madam Deirdre, if you'll kick us off, we'd love to just get an introduction of who you are and your space in Black Indie Comics and love to talk again as a, a sum in the narrative of where Black futures of Black comics are today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Deirdre, and congratulations for another year of black futures um and to all the success that subsum is is bringing and in, in terms of convening community and and keeping our narratives moving forward um i'm deirdre holman and i'm really proud to be here amongst all of you i am the founder of the black comics collective which grew out of my work um, in education um, using graphic narratives to teach young people about ourselves and our history and the futures that we imagine for our communities. Um, as one of the four co-founders of the Black Comic Book Festival at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem, New York, <laughs> um, I've been immersed over the past 11 years in this incredible a uh, community of Black creatives, uh, most of whom are independent comic creators. And the Black Comics Collective came out of wanting to kind of hold that community together, together to stitch together not only the creative folks, but the community at large who are looking for this content and these ideas and these conversations. Um, and so we are a live events producer as well as um, a convener of conversations. And recently I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what are, what's the next step for us um, and how do we continue to bridge the work that we're doing in black comics into the sphere of education, because that's, that's my, that's my raison d'etre <laughs> is to make sure that young, um, young minds are not only seeing themselves and what they read, but they're being encouraged to be those dreamers and those creators themselves. And so I have um, some future projects, some things in the hopper, in the development stages, um, wanting to see a lot more publishing and distribution, outreach, getting connecting the readers to the works. Because over the past 11 years, um, following the careers of folks like the folks on, on this call and throughout your, your whole summit, um, there's an incredible proliferation of material and, and watching folks go from, here's my first indie comic to now, you know, a film is being made about my, uh, one of my stories, or I have, you know, several trades for my series now and all of the, just like the organic growth um, of black comics in general. I just wanna make sure that that growth is being spread and is penetrating into our communities. And so that's the, I guess a short intro into <laughs> why I stay inspired in this community and I'll pass it off to the next panelist. Thank you, Professor Jennings. We we love to, to call your call you to the stage here on that. Thank you, <laughs> pleasure. Hey, <clears throat> thank you for having me, and thank you for yeah, it's so good to see everybody. I just started grinning when I saw Deirdre. I was like, you need to. I need to. You know, hopefully we'll get a chance. I'm going to New York soon, so hopefully I'll see you at the, the talk we're doing. Um, man, okay. So I feel like I feel like really blessed because I 
you know, I'm in the, I'm, I'm, I taught like design for like 20 years, you know, as a graphic design professor and as a, you know, um, design methodology teacher, design history teacher. And I really fell into looking at the power of representation when I was teaching image making at University of Illinois. And I was just seeing like the dearth of representation in black comics. And then, you know, me and my friend Damien started going to the East Coast Black Age of Comics convention and realizing like, wow, you know, there's a massive undercurrent of extremely talented uh, artists and creators who just happen to be black, right? And, you know, it's it's a it's a network of very talented people. And, I was, and so that's what actually um, prompted us to create the first black comics uh, collection that we did through uh, Mark Batty Publisher back in the day, just to kind of highlight the the network, you know, the, the, the camaraderie, the rivalries, the craziness of, of, of uh, you know, a really, really um, beautifully subversive, creative, powerful network of black artists, you know? Um, it's, it was just incredible. And I think from there, you know, like Deirdre was saying, like, you know, we, first you have to create like this, this, you have to say like, okay, this thing exists and this is what's happening, right? And then the next step was like, okay, well, how do we actually uplift, you know, this community? So we started doing, I started doing a lot of curatorial work and, trying to figure out ways to create community, as Deirdre uh, uh, said too. And I think that's what actually led me to collaborate with her and uh, Jerry Craft and Dr. Jonathan Gales with the Schomburg to, to found uh, the, you know, the Black Comic Book Festival at the Schomburg Center. And that, you know, it, it was it was on a lark in a certain way, but we knew it had to exist, you know, and we were like, you know, no one knew it would become what it is now, which is like this massive, massively successful uh, convention. And then, you know, but we were inspired by other conventions, like, you know, the conventions that Tertel on Lee had put on, uh, the work with, uh, you know, uh, Motor, you know, Motor City Black Age Comics too, and also East Coast Black Age Comics, the people that were, and also the work of, um, the work that was being done with the Black Comic Book, uh, excuse me, with the, with the Museum of Black Comic, excuse me, the, the Museum of Black Spiros, you know. Which was a huge uh, hub at, at a particular time when, um, you know, we needed uh, a community, a, a place where we could actually critique each other's work and actually. Sorry, that's my child. <laughs> a shout out to Young Jackson. It's okay. Yeah, Jackson's up. Jackson's in the building. Um, anyway, so um, so yeah, so that that was some of the things I kind of started in the next phase. As Deirdre stated, it was like, all right, how do we leverage the fact that this is happening? Along with the, with, you know, with the with the bustling uh, black speculative art movement that was happening too, and actually kind of joining the zeitgeist, so to speak, that was happening with you know Afrofuturism and black horror and you know uh, magical realism through you know that's, that's happening in, in in different spaces and actually kind of become part of that movement, you know, and then of course uh, that's how I was able to actually found Megascope with Abrams Comic Arts. That's the success of the the, the uh, Octavia Butler book that me and Damien did, we decided like, okay, I need to find a space or try to try to create a space where cr creators of color, not just black creators, but, you know, BIPOC creators can come and, you know, get a chance to actually put their work out on a, on a global stage. And so that's, that's where I'm right now. And the other thing is, and the last part, I'm gonna stop talking, is that when I started teaching media studies, um, I wanted to create a space where we could actually uh, explicate and, and expand upon what's happening with the with the narratives, right? So I just created classes around comics and around Afrofuturism. I teach a course on you know just on Afrofuturism and Black superheroes and politics. That's that's the that's the, so I'm talking you know so that's that's a dream that's a dream, right? And so it's just like unpacking you know the prison industrial complex and how it relates to Luke Cage, that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, it's 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 a fantastic thing. And so we start to see the um the inherent like value of what we're doing and together i feel like we created like an an insanely wonderful uh community i mean we were just at like black comic book day in um in san diego the one that keith and jones puts on it's the fifth annual right we just did the black and brown comics festival in in san francisco and then we just you know they just co-founded another one called camcon that's at the california african american M museum uh jason was there <laughs> so it's pretty wild. And so we're doing another one in October. So, you know, there's a there's a community here and there's a there's a need for what we're doing. And I'm just really proud to be working with you all actually to kind of build this together. So thank you. 
Uh, thank you, John. I appreciate it. And, and to that, I'll jump to my convention convention con mate and uh, and sometimes roommate Chuck Brown. I uh, want to give you a <laughs> moment for you to uh, jump in and introduce yourself and, and definitely let us know your, your purview in the comment space. Um, yeah, I am Chuck Brown, veteran. Thank you so much for um, always inviting me, including me in these spaces. I really appreciate it. And it really is an honor to be on the panel with all of you. Um, I am a writer. I've written um, from many series on the stump and um, the quiet kind. And also I'm the co-creator of Bitter Root. And uh, I think I got into comics to uh, somewhat combat inferiority, you know, or the negative, uh, sidekicks or the guy that dies uh, awful powerful light and that's kind of what um in Sanford Green and um again I'm just honored to be here and I'm looking forward to honestly learning from all of you. Thank you so much Chuck and and definitely not least and, and returning again for yet another appearance here at Black Futures uh, 2023, uh, Jason Reeves of 133 Art. Jason, good day to you. Hey, <laughs> um, I'm Jason Reeves. Uh, my imprint is 133 Art Publishing, and you know we do comics. I've loved comics since I was a little little boy, and I always wanted to uh, kind of meld my love of drawing and creating images um, with my final career or whatever. So, you know, I wanted to get into comics. I started out as a freelance illustrator um, and just kind of toiling in the various um, disciplines of that concept design, um, toy design, a little bit of uh, graphic design, you know, album covers, book covers, whatever, whatever I could find. And my philosophy always was, it's all comics. Like, it's all comics to me. Every piece of storytelling relates back to the thing that I fell in love with first. Um, so, yeah, I the reason that I had to create my own company and sort of, you know, push my own foot into the door uh, into comics is because, uh, like John said, there, there's a dearth. Um there, or there was of us, you know, back in the day, back in the time, way back in 2005, I, five, <laughs> um, when I, when I did my first San Diego Comic Con and I, you know, and I started doing conventions and walking around and trying to talk to editors and stuff and comics was just this hard nut to crack. Um, it was easier, uh, weirdly enough to crack say working for wizards of the coast or even get a job at hasbro like i was a freelancer at hasbro for a tick and that was way easier than breaking in the comics which is i don't know it seems like working backwards but maybe i'm tripping um so i've always been i've always followed like deidre and and john um and and just kind of keeping note of their their scholarly work and, and the way they talk about this entire industry and this sort of black comics, black speculative fiction, um, Afrofuturist type movement. Um, I'm from New Orleans. I'm from hustler culture. And the way I kind of view the idea of us being in comics, of black people being in comics is there's no money. I think a lot of the issues for us stem from we have we don't have that foundation and then we don't have any capital to raise that foundation up. So 133 Yard is part it, it, it's also about the storytelling, it's also about the imagery, it's also about putting black people forward, but also I I needed to create something that could feed us as a community. And uh I felt like there was a boom in the 90s. But then it boomed, and then it kind of, the bubble burst for whatever reason. And I was like, I need to create something, and I want to help other people create some things that build this foundation up. 
And again, I'm I'm hustler culture. I'm wearing the shirt. Like, only hustler survive, right? Like, so I want us to be building capital as we're inspiring our community. Um, you know, Kickstarter, uh, definitely going to shows and meeting our public and, and having them know that, you know, it's safe to buy from us. We have good product. We have comparable and sometimes even better product. Buy from us. Come home, you know? Um, and that's a big part of, I feel like, why I'm here, to, like, say that part of it. Because a lot of times we don't. A lot of times business is about the moving and the transferring about of money, a big part of it anyway. And um, we need to eat. Artists, creators, um, black artists, creators need to eat to move this thing forward as well. So that's kind of what I'm about. No, thank you. No, I think we are. I think we're all about the idea of, to your point, being able to not just survive, but to thrive based off of the, the comics, the creativity and the culture that on a constant and consistent basis we see feeds into larger spaces, you know, that other people get to imbibe and appreciate. But a lot of times those opportunities don't have the same recompense, right? That we create culture, we create things, you know, we can look throughout the history of not only just entertainment, but just our existence here in the Americas of the things that we build, the infrastructure, the spaces and places, but that don't equally appreciate, invite or respect us um, in, in some. So the idea of independent black comics as, you know, not necessarily a subset, but I think the idea of its own medium in and of itself, the you know, kind of speaking to what you said, Jason, the hustle culture of us building and developing, I feel like directly correlates with the value add that black indie comics provides, not only to the readers, but to the community as the creators and some. So I'd like to maybe see, can we identify what is an independent black comic, right? Is it, is it the person that's making it? Is is it the visualization on the screen or excuse me on the page? Or what is what is in that gumbo that for us, you know, has that taste, right? Because we all know the ingredients that go into making a comic, right? We know what in the traditional sense that makes, but what makes a comic a black indie comic? And I'm open to open to the open the floor with that. That is a good question. <laughs> No, 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 no worries. Just and just to say, right, we we see a lot of we've seen cultural appropriation. We've seen cultural appreciation. Right. So the idea is I know we can kind of delineate. It doesn't mean because a black person made it that it's a black indie comic. Uh, but also right. at the same point, that doesn't mean because the, the character is black, that it's a black indie comic. Right. So I think we have a floor and we maybe have a, a wall. So now the idea of building the house of which black independent comics can exist in. Again, I think we just try, we got some architects here. So I think the idea is what are some of the rules for the road of us trying mm. to figure out how best to define those spaces. I think context and, and intent are very important in everything we do. Um, that said, I think the, the lowest requisite is that a black person is behind the scenes. Right. Like um, either writer or illustrator, creator, um, somebody black should probably be on it. Um, right. If that's not the case, um, then intent is probably more important at that point. Um, I think black ownership probably should be uh, I don't know if a I don't know if I would say that would be a requisite, but it would be way nicer if that was in, in the mix, in that bag, in that gumbo. Um, in my opinion, and this is just one humble man's opinion, I think those things need to make up what a black comic is. Um, black creation, black people in production, black characters, right? Um, I think that should be the basic basis of what a black indie comic should be. 
Um, and I think it's cool to make a distinction that way. Um, there are a ton of, you know, there are a ton of comics that don't belong to us that weren't necessarily created by us that, that have us in there. And if we're included in the mix, that's dope. Right. So when, when Sean Hill is on X-Men, I don't know if it necessarily becomes a black comic, but right. it definitely becomes one of ours. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I take ownership of seeing Sean Hill wreck, wreck it on X-Men. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I I do like that, but I, I still I what you and Milton were talking about right before this show was saying about ownership in terms of black speculative fiction, and I think that's very important here in terms of hip hop and black spe- speculative fiction. And Milton said, I think it was Milton who said the the progenitors of hip hop were more savvy than the progenitors of like rock and roll or blues. Because the world knows that hip hop comes from black culture. And I think the world needs to know that black indie comics, especially, come from black culture. And we need to maintain ownership of that. Um, you know, whenever I'm doing my, my, my talking points at a convention or even on panel or whatever, I say, look, black gods, black protagonists, black villains. I want us to own those things so that uh, I think Cherie was saying when once we get big or once we make a certain amount of X amount of dollars or X amount of saturation, that now we're a part of the American, you know, pop culture conscious. Now we belong to America. And I that's not good. That hasn't worked out historically for us. No. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we I definitely know. need to maintain uh, that ownership. And I think right. um, companies like, you know, imprints like Megascope, companies like uh, a 133 Yard, you know, Kid Comics, whoever, yep. Yep. Black yep. Comics Day, MechaCon, we need to continue. It's a, it's, a, it's a slog sometimes and it's a struggle, but we need to maintain that control. Because um, when the money does, you know, when the interest in the money does kind of, trickle down, I guess, for lack of a, oh, that's such a bad phrase, but for lack of a better phrase, um, we need to be the ones because we know what the community needs. We know how to disperse it properly. We know, um, we know where to put that, those resources. Um, we were talking yesterday about AI versus art. And I was saying we need to be in the room. If black women specifically had been in the room where the, the AI developers were and they were pulling all this art in, black women would have said, yo, we need to, we need people need royalties. We need to there needs to be restitution here. And I feel like there that that vibe needs to stay in us. We we're gonna take care of us, mm-hmm. you know. I know that Deidre is going to take care of us when whatever show, whatever entity she's partnering with, she going to make sure we we're getting what we need. And when John is doing something, I know that John is going to take care of me. So we need to maintain that. I'll, I'll stop talking. So <laughs> no, I, I, I think you're absolutely right, man. And I, I'm going to talk. I mean, I'm, I'm processing a lot of stuff. You just said very wise. Um, I'm doing a talk on Afrofuturism tomorrow at the you know Pan African Film Festival, right? And one of the things I'm thinking about a lot of is first of all, like how important comics, black comics, have been have, have traditionally been to Afrofuturism and black speculative culture in general, right? So if you look at like the first article by Mark Derry on on Afrofuturism, he uses comics as an you know particularly was like milestone at the time, and he didn't really mention a lot of the, the early '90s comics like Brother Man and you know, Malcolm 10 and things of that nature, but those were those were in the mix. So we've been actually a part of this conversation since the early nineties, as far as like when black speckled culture really like hits, you know, and also part of the conversations around like just uh, black filmmaking, you know, in general too, right? As far, as far as like the uh, hot spot, like you said, like it was, it was a big time in the nineties, right? So the other thing I was thinking about what you said about community, right? Is uh, I feel like, black speculative narratives in general tend to speak more have a, have a community center to them 
you know, like our comics tend to think about like uplift and about like uh, shared uh, destiny, that kind of thing, right? I think it's because of the amount of disruption that's happened to our people in this in this country or in the West, right? Just throughout the diaspora, that it's very difficult for us to not think of each other, you know. And you know, I think what happens is like you see like these other comics that are coming out from the from the big two or from other spaces where it's very centered on like one protagonist and like this is Superman and he's going to save the day for everybody, right? And no, and so we're thinking like, no, it's a family of <laughs> it's a family of characters who are saving everybody. You know, you know, it's a more of a network, you know. And I think right. that is, uh, I mean, honestly, you know, it's it's not how I feel about Kwanzaa, but it's straight up like you know, Kutichagalia, right? Co cooperative economics, right? That's part of how we think, you know. So, I right, well, right. we need to take we need to create a space where that empowers us spiritually and financially, and in some ways, you know, I'm thinking that 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 economical part because we're because we happen to be in a in a corporate system a capitalist system maybe maybe that idea of controlling that that future financially should be a part that should be actually pushed further into what an afro futurist uh space should be you know what i'm saying it's a it's a very that's a very real thing because we also are trading in intellectual property it's not just like you know money is a transient thing you know but but this idea of like ip and owning you know, owning uh, rights to things. I mean, that's <laughs> having control. That's an extremely, uh, that's a big part of it. And I think I totally agree with you, Jason, that like we've seen like really good like comics done by people who are not black, right? You know, I mean, like for instance, I mean, I, I love me some Cold Dead Hands by Tony Isabella, that Black Lightning, that was, that was as the young people say, it's it slapped, right? <laughs> it was good, you know, because it was inspired by, you know, police brutality and stuff like It was a good book. We didn't make it is from a DC Comics piece, but you know it it was beautifully done. It represented like black culture, and it had a very very strong like you know uh, social message behind it, right? right? Oh, you see something like uh, like Abbott, you know Saladin Ahmed, that Saladin Ahmed wrote, you know that 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 was great, <laughs> you know <laughs> it's really good. So you know, but we don't control that, or we don't have you know that's not our project. But it also represented, as you stated. Um, Black people very well, you know. But then, of course, you know it, there, there are these different uh, designations. I think that a black independent comic should be black on all the different what you know ownership, as many of the creative team as you can get. You know, um, for instance, right now, and I'm gonna stop after this. I'm, you know, I managed to I'm writing a comic for Marvel right now, right? And so it's like you know, I'm, I'm a black man writing a book about resurrecting a black man from the dead <laughs> who saved the world, <laughs> right? And then the cover artist is black and also the, the, the lead artist is black, you know? And, uh, you know, that's been really, so that's a, it's a very black book, <laughs> you know? So even though it's a Marvel book, but it's like, the when you read it, the ethics of it and everything is about like uplifting black community. So I agree with you. I think that that should be the center of it, right? Where we're not just being objectified and killed in our own stories, but, right. you know, I'm gonna spoil it for you. Black people win in all my stories. That's how yes. it is. Yeah, black people like, win. <laughs> you know, so, right. I think about like back in the day, um, I was watching uh, Chadwick do uh, James Brown, and mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite movies because of the part where he talks about how they instead of doing it the way the industry had normally doing it and, and getting control of the gate and getting their own DJs to promote, but he could only do that because he was the product. He could only do that because he, you know, he owned himself, who was the product, who made all the money. So whatever James said, that's kind of what goes. And it doesn't matter how powerful, you know, the studio or whoever was, James was the product and they needed him. So he told them how it went, and he ended up making more money for them too, as mm -hmm. well as himself. And I think having the ownership part, we we we're a lot of us are artists or creators, and we're not we're not necessarily business minded. We learn that stuff on the run. I'm I'm a victim of it too, um, but I think the more savvy we get, the more we need to not push to the side the, the that aspect of it, that ownership, because we want them, anybody, them studios, them corporations, them Disney, whoever, we want them to go through us for the idea 
of what this thing, what this cultural thing is. And we want to be able to say, oh, no, that's not where we talk about it. We talk about it in the barbershop or that's not how a black character would act or my character, whatever, would mm-hmm. act, you know, and full stop. That's how we're going to do it. And we need to we need to keep building that up, I think. Um, we we need to be the stewards of this thing. Right. I want to just pull up. Um, I agree with all that's been said about the foundations of what a black indie comic is, you know, the platform, the publishing, the ownership, the creative. Um, but I, I also think once you have all that foundation, you know, what are the stories that are being told and told? Um, and what is that that voice, that perspective? How is the culture, and that's plural, the culture, you know, has many under it. How is the culture being amplified through some of, you know, through the characters' uh, voice? Like, what? how do they speak? What are they speaking about? Like, who's in their, in their world? Who, like, their family, how does the family show up? How do social issues show up? How, how does, you know, a Black perspective on the world or on the universe and on history, um, how does that, pull into the story that's being told. So I think that's another layer because you can have, just like Jason was pointing out, you can have a lot of the other things, but sometimes it just doesn't hit because you're like, wow, this 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 is kind of still racist. And <laughs> this is right. not like pushing, this is not pushing some boundaries that should have been pushed here. And and so I think for me, some of the the what makes it independent and really sing for me is that sense of freedom and authenticity and like just vibrant black consciousness that comes through. And Chuck is brilliant at that. <laughs> uh, uh, what a what a what a perfect tea up! I was just in the chat saying, right? I don't I don't think there could be a more or seminal work that we could point to than than the uh, the the brainchild of uh, Chuck Brown here, which is is Bitterroot, which. You know, deservedly so, first and foremost, I think would really be the penultimate example of what we would say as a black independent comic, uh, you know, from, you know, and I've been privileged to, to hear that just as a as a pitch and an idea, um, you know, as any creator myself to see, obviously, the awards, the the long and in, in prints and reprinted runs. But to that, Chuck, uh, you know, I, I think we would then lend to you as an architect of really like the, the work of our time in this space. Where do you see the interpretation of Black Indie Comics as far as your work with Bitterroot, for example, plus all the other works that you now have your imprint and an and influence over? I think there could be a, a lot of different conversations around it. Um, everyone has very good points. And, and the word you use, architect, is a really good point. Um, as long as there's someone like behind the scenes and that ownership, but all... Um, white guys but it was still you know very you know it could be avenues of what you know is considered you know for social is the fact that it is from you know three different brothers great this very you know special book you know um when you know, when it was just me, it was more, you know, it was more about you know Dr. Sylvester, um, you know, wreaking havoc because you know he's just sick of being oppressed and sick of being downtrodden, and then you know Sanford came on board and he was like you know he's more about family and David came on board with this, you know, wealth of historical knowledge and you know we just came up with this collaboration, you know, and and the fact what you've done with Subsoon is. Doing things, coming together, sharing different ideas. You know, if it wasn't for you, that's not important for me to be in these spaces, people to see my face, to know what I'm doing, to know what we're putting out, to know my journey, to know my struggle. So, um, all that has to go into the fact of these of these spaces and the Afro Afrofuturism and in our comics and architects. You know, the creators and the content. You know, breaking the spaces and also keep it with ourselves. You know, um, 
you know, maybe got a little bag, but I think the fact that three of us own it, it what made that book prosper and what made it what it is today, you know, with the film options. And even we can be blessed with the film options. In fact, we got Ryan Coogler and Regina King who are in these spaces and they care about this book and they were reading the book before, you know, it got picked up. So that's what's really important. We got really lucky in that sense, you know. So I don't, if, if Steven Spielberg would have came to me, I don't know, you know. He, Regina King on it, that they are in these spaces and they are a part of us and it's, on a broader sense, so um, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm just blessed to be here, and I just hope people just keep hustling and um, you know stay true to their art, and you know there's a lot of different interpretations of what can be considered as you know a black comic for us and by us. Thank you. Dip. The only correction I'm a, I'm going to make on that, which again, all, all fair, absolutely fair points, Chuck. There, there was there was no luck in in Bitterroot, not not a single drop. I mean that. <laughs> You know that that's you know I don't know what to say. That's one of those ancestral books. Like the the ancestors was just like saying like this is going to be a thing, right? right? And again, I mean it's a space of inspiration. I say that sincerely. That's why I feel like you know because of a bitter root that opens up these spaces and places. Not only that we can see each other be seen, but also that we're building a space for future generations to say, okay, you know if we we've got a one three three art, we've got a Black Commons Collective, you know. We've got a space that we can aspire to in Megascope, right? And you know, all because my son, my daughter, read Bitterroot when they were in middle school, right? That's that's the synergy that we, you know, we want to highlight and we want to understand that. As saying, right, in, in a good point here in our internal chat about stewardship, right? We only get this for a limited amount of time. That's no matter mm -hmm. where we're looking at it in, in the space of comics, particularly. And I think there was something as Cherie Renee Thomas on our earlier chat was saying talking about traditional print, traditional media, and we can kind of turn it into that space. Right. You know, the, the idea of knowing that this has such a value and valuation, you know, from a sense. And again, us as black culture, we've done this. We're the imprint. We do this all the time on a constant and consistent basis. But then it seems to stop somewhere up, you know, somewhere upstream. It seems that there's a disconnect. Now, and I know that we have spaces like Megascope and like the Black Commons Collective that are actively working on our on our behalf. But then I say for indie comics, where does that where does that gray area or that part seem to stop? And what can we continue to do to either insulate ourselves so that we just really keep what we have to ourselves and build there? I think there's a value in that. Or are we in that stewardship? a space to try to include as many people as we can. And so that's, again, open-ended for the floor. Well, I'm an architect and has a lot of um, ideas about um, just fighting each other, a lot of action and powerful stuff. But the artist is, you know, an Italian, you know, a, a white dude, you know, and for a while, I was, you know, really hesitant to bring him on. But then again, I couldn't deny his talent and his drive and his passion and how he um, I, I think as far as, um, even though I did hire an Italian artist, I do think it's important for us to try to keep, try to hire us as, as much as we possibly Um, you know, when Jason Jason stuff, I started seeing Jason stuff, you know, online here and there. I just saw, and I was just very very impressed by that. And that's what I just love to see: high quality, positive life, and educates people. I'll be trying. <laughs> <laughs> um no i i agree and and that's high praise chuck thank you um i i i think yeah i agree i think we we should hire us and um foster young talent and i think i think the fostering of young talent was one of the things that when that 
like our that '90s thing we were talking about earlier that that big surge of interest and surge of like um, content um, yeah. is cyclical. It it happens, you know. Every what every generation or every other generation, you know, we go from seventies, then eighties, we got Reagan, then nineties, we back, you know, then early two thousands, we got you know, Insync and Britney Spears, and then late two thousands, we back, that kind of thing. So it, it's very cyclical, and I think during the cycles, though, we need to prepare for winter because winter is always coming, right? So oh. we, we need to, I think, we need to foster. Foster young talent and 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 prepare them. Um, I'm not. I wouldn't consider myself a teacher, like a good teacher. I get real apprehensive about doing that sort of thing. People keep asking me, and I'm like, no. But anyway, <laughs> but like, I do believe that it is kind of our charge to like bring our young black people up, our young black creators up. Um, and I love, I do love talking to like a, a lot of young creators come up to me at like cons and stuff. And I enjoy talking to them and just smiling at them and saying, look, I'm, I'm not the dude to tell you necessarily. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to discourage you from this. Please do this. But, you know, and, and yeah, take a look at your anatomy, blah, blah, blah. But I only critique people if there's a gun to my head, literally, right. because I know how it feels to go up to my favorite dude and, and they're like, oh, yeah, you, you're not there yet. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that dude. But at the same time, I definitely think I definitely would love to hire young artists and say, look, this is kind of how I've done it and, you know, run it your way, but use this as a as a framework, maybe or like you know, take the positive you need from this and go forth into the world. And I think that is what we haven't done. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, through all the milestones, through, um, you know, I, and, and I know, I know, like, especially I know Mike, Mike has had like programs where he's brought up, like, you know, I mean, Stephen is one of the guys, um, and Stephen Harris, shout out, um, that, that came up under Mike. So mm-hmm. I know that, that, but we need to do more of that. We need more of that outreach, more of that pull up everybody because we talk community and that's what it's about. We have to foster young, young people have new ideas. They have new energy and we need that to continue mm-hmm. for this machine to can keep going, you know? Um, so that's one of the things I'm, I'm st- especially in my old age starting to get passionate about because I remember being 19 and being like, yo, where do I go to get a job? <laughs> you know, like I remember being at Comic Con in those lines talking to editors that don't know me, that don't get it. You know, and I'm not saying that I was so good that it was undeniable because I was, I was, I'm still learning today, but. At the same time, white artists are allowed to grow within the mainstream industry. They're allowed to suck. All of our, uh, most of our favorite artists right now at Marvel and DC wasn't that good back in them days, mm-hmm. but they were allowed to grow. And I think we need to pull up these young cats and allow them to grow with us as well. And somebody. Matter of fact, more nine times out of ten, I'm gonna say, because I, I always bet on black. Nine times out of ten, those cats are gonna be geniuses in the industry within what we do. And 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 by not pulling them up, we're doing ourselves a disservice because those are gonna be the smarter minds. Young energy, young energy is what creates cures for cancer. Young energy is what creates electric cars. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and we need to yeah. we need to do more of that kind of outreach, I think. Mm-hmm. I think that's mm-hmm. what's going to get us past the bubble. When mainstream has decided, okay, we're moving on. You know, let's let's get another, you know, boy band going. <laughs> you know? It's, it's um, my <laughs> <laughs> so once they do that, 
then I think we'll keep going because we'll have our own cultural young energy, black culture, young energy. We need right. it. It's dope. Right. No, no, I, I totally, I'm with you. I love the fact that you said it was cyclical because I actually see like direct connections between like, you know, what was happening during the Harlem Renaissance, black power movement, you know, these different spaces, very creative using speculative fiction actually too, to talk about our, you know, about our ideas around what it means to be black in America. And um, your comments about the youth is I think right, it's dead on. I mean, right now me and my friend David Bram and uh, Michael Norton Dando, you know, brother from another mother, we have started a, a literacy project, you know, kind of based off of Lion Man. So we actually been working with the United Way to nice. make comics for kids. Jason actually, pub he actually printed uh, Lion Man for us. Uh, for kids, you know, and so, and then that's going to get picked up by another great publisher, Bill Bill Campbell, you know, with Rosarium, starting to expect it fan too. Um, you're talking about someone who's like diehard, like <laughs> one man, you know, he's, that's another, Rosarium puts out great books, you know, both comics and prose, right? And um, it's part of that fight to make sure that we have a space, like you said, for the future, right? And so, I've been, I mentor very hard. I mentor a lot of peers and also a lot of newcomers, you know. Uh, I, I really do believe in that part too. I mentor really hard and probably too much actually. <laughs> um, you know, much to my wife's chagrin, but I really do think that you're absolutely right. Like once I had, once we had Jackson, you know, my perspective shifted to like, I, the Afro future ain't nothing without the future, without these, you know, these, without our youngsters, right? So you have to make work for them and actually make space for them um definitely and so a lot of these that's what i'm trying to do with megascope and other things is to create a uh um a space like that that is um that we can tell our own stories in on our own terms you know now i will say this uh you know i have seen that milestone has created the milestone initiative which is really awesome and actually fostering you know new people coming in um Mar uh, Marvel has Marvel's Voices, which they've low key been using to recruit BIPOC creators. A lot of people don't realize this, but their 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 new lead uh, talent director is a black man, you know, John Michael Ennis, and he's been very uh, forthright about his interests and in, like making sure that there are spaces. If you want to work for for Marvel, that he's going to try to figure that out because some of those people like Sean Hill and. Paraseline and uh, folk like that will have come in through like Marvel's Voices, right? You know, just to kind of trace it, just become like a tryout space actually for, for people of color and for people from various backgrounds, you know, so that is happening. Um, but we are uh, speedboats and those, those the big two are like, you know, they're, they're steamships, <laughs> right? So moving, even Megascope moves a lot, a lot slower than I would want it to, but it's just because there's so many hands on there's so much money and there's only so much space, right? But we're pushing, you know, we're pushing. And so, you know, I love the fact that, you know, I'm able to give someone like their first shot at doing a really major book, like Brian Christopher Moss on a on a, on a book with Stephen Barnes and Charles Johnson. It's crazy, I got to do it. Also, you know, I'm publishing Reginald Hudlin and Dennis Cowan too on a book. So, you know. Um, DC has uh, Marquise Draper. Um, right. He's an editor over there and he does a lot of the, the the pushing of black creators as well as I That's understand good. it, I think he's like a scat of them. Yeah, yeah, and also yeah. there's a you know one of their PR directors is a is a is a brother as well. You know, I think it's Michael Schilling, I believe. So you know, there are some people we're trying to shift things. You know, uh, as much as we can, we have to work together. Though we're not in competition, which is you know, as you said, Jason, you know the the, the pickings are slim. It's like, bro, if you're going to be in comics, you know. Prepare to eat some ramen noodles and and and, <laughs> and pull and pull your pull your acorns together for a rainy day because it's gonna get rainy, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so you know it's, it's a side hustle for me. If I was just doing yeah. megascope, I, we'd be homeless right now. <laughs> so it's just you know what I'm saying. It's, it's about it's about the future. But one last thing I want to say too is about Chuck's project, uh, Bit of Root. Um, so one of my one of the biggest honors that I've had is working with y'all on that book. You know, it's. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, because as uh, as Dedrin was saying, like when David told me what the what the premise was, <laughs> I was like, "Yo, I'm very busy. Like I'm very busy. Like if you look up the word busy, I ain't even in the picture because I'm too busy to take the picture to be in the definition." So, but 
when I heard what Bitter Root was about, I was like, bro, you have to let me curate those essays. Like, let me make a space. Make a space because what we actually ended up doing, along with the brilliance of the three AR work on this book by Hooker by Crook, was pulling together some of the smartest black folk, folk from various backgrounds, talking about this in context, man. And uh, it's been a great honor working on that with y'all. So thank you for letting me for giving me that space, man. So. I want to just take one second, if I may, and I'm oh, sorry, Chuck, you were saying? No, I'm just saying that when I saw his name come across, I was just alone, man, because my respect for you is just, um, it's, there's, there's no words for it, man. I was like, thank you. With you, man, and you want to be a part of it. It's all And I'm grateful for the space. Thank you. I wanted to get one quick um, point out uh, or a question to uh, Deidre intentionally with the Black Commons Collective, right? So I think we talked and we're all in agreement that we have this talent, we have all these spaces, we have this sense from your, your unique purview with the Black Commons Collective where you've intentionally built spaces. You have the academic and academic, the academic acumen behind understanding and appreciate how academia looks at and, and curates these types of things what what been what's next for how we as the community can best come together as a collective and navigate the the next steps ahead if we had to put that to about a 90 second response Tony. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? and so just from my perspective i'm always thinking about like what kind of spaces do we need how can we uh, build the, the the study space and the classroom space that we need? Um, we used to uh, always have, I mean, still with the Black Comic Book Festival, make space for there to be those live workshops from artists and storytellers um, so that, you know, the littlest of kids all the way through, you know, mature um, emerging artists and writers could have opportunities to learn in masterclass form um, from folks like Jerry Craft and um, Akinze A. Brown and Tim Fielder and others. Um, but so I'm always thinking about, you know, how do we create like some of these smaller um, comic studies programs that, you know, would center our work in the huge and growing, uh, you could call it canon <laughs> of black comics. Um, because we have the canon makers, you know, like John always and other comic scholars always kind of writing the books and, and telling the stories, creating the, the periodization of our work. And, you know, so, so how do we create then the classrooms that study this material? And so those are the things that I'm thinking about um, going forward. I'm thinking about how do we create those incubator spaces um, how do we create those classrooms, those workshop opportunities, um, how, so that we can continue to exchange ideas and inspiration along those lines? And it's hard to do. I mean, ownership is a big part of that. Again, it's like, do we plug into bigger systems? Do we create grassroots systems? You know, is it about owning a, a building or is it about just, you know, like, renting or borrowing or sharing space. Like it, there are so many components, but I, I still think the project is how do we get us in a room so we can continue to inspire and groom each other for, for larger impacts. Fantastic. And we're going to you know, bring our um, time here to a, a close here. We're going to have got a trivia question out of the, out of the, audience here from Tony Cade of, of Challengers Games and Comics here in uh, Decatur, Georgia, um, talking about a little bit of the, the history of indie black comics. I know uh, that we brought up Sean Hill as a incredible illustrator on one book, but wanted to ask our panel, can anyone name the first comic title Sean Hill worked on with Robert Jeffrey II? Dang. Come with something easier to I know, me. right? Come, but, with some, but, come with something harder, I mean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. Yeah, it's not no. hard. Right, right. So I, I think it was just a, a shout out to Sean and, and Robert Jeffrey the second, uh, another amazing <laughs> uh, writer who's actually on the other side of this wall with said book 
uh, at our, our black our black book fair here <laughs> so in Atlanta. Cool. So very cool. Good, good. But I think that's a, it was just a, a fun uh, way to kind of conclude that, uh, as, as Deidre was saying, and again, in some of all of us, is that we have something here, right? We have something that is of not just high value, but I think of uh, high importance that we continue to cultivate and curate. And there's the community around it that really is a, a reflection around Black culture. And again, that same sustaining space that, you know, has taken us from where our answers has been and allowed us in an impossible way to build a future that is even our is even beyond our own comprehension. And so that's why I feel like for our spaces of black comics, it's it's a breeding ground. It's a it's a test kitchen for how our best and brightest can imagine the future of all of us being a part of it. And so that's where looking at the state of black comics and own each of you in your very impactful and important ways, you know, being stewards and vanguards of that space. You know, I just want to thank you all for coming in. Um, I'll start with Deidre to then John, Jason, and then including with Chuck. Just let us know where we can find and follow you and continue to support you in this space. Thank you all. Deidre, thank you so much for the, the opportunity just to talk and, and spread the good word. <laughs> and to say, I think the state of uh, Black indie comics is amazing. I mean, amazing. And, and ripe with opportunities. So you can find Black Comics Collective on Instagram, Facebook, our website is developing with some of these new initiatives. So you can find us um, on the socials as Black Comics Collective. Thank you. Let's see, am I next? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so a good spot to start is just johnjenningsstudio.com. It has all the links to all the things, you know? Um, yeah, I'm very, very grateful to be here. And I agree with Deidre. I was just talking to my friend Angelique Roche about like just the, the spectrum of like what's available now from like extremely indie work all the way up to the big two. It's like there's a lot of black creators. I've never seen this many, you know, working in the in, the, in various modes of the industry. So I'm very excited. And uh, yeah, oh, and uh, pre order uh, The Last Count of Monte Cristo, Afrofuturist Count of, Count of Monte Cristo book coming out April from Megascope. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, is it is it on me? <laughs> um, so I have been Jason Reeves of One Three Three Art Publishing, and uh, on social media you could find us at One Three Three Art pretty much everywhere, or at One Three Three Art Publishing, uh, pretty much anywhere. Um, what else? Oh, the hub, our website. Anything you want to know about us, you can find us there. It's brand new. We just redeveloped it, um, 133art.com. We got a link tree somewhere. You'll find it. Um, join our <laughs> newsletter. Um, we that's talk nice. about everything that's going on with us. Um, and hopefully, uh, we just finished the Kickstarter uh, for a season of all of our 2023 releases. That's about 10 books. Um, we go in monthly. Bam, bam, bam. We're trying to upgrade our whole publishing schedule. But also, hopefully, I'll have some new news in March um, about a little piece of outreach that I want to do for our, our community and our young community. So we'll see what we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm brewing something else. Um, so, yeah, that's us. Uh, yeah. Ink.com. All of my social media links are there. Um, you can access my store there. We can buy most of my books and um, keep your eyes open for a better room. Announcements and images, you know, probably this late fall, maybe winter. Thank you all so very much again, each and every one of you. Uh, just uh, an integral part to to where this this Black Future space goes. And again, just honored and appreciate you bringing this time and the conversation. And much more to come. And so with that, we'll thank you all and uh, let you have the rest of your Saturday back. But again, we appreciate you being uh, a part of Subsume and uh, and our continuation of the, the state of Black indie comics. So thank you each so very much. And we will say again that 
we just had yet another powerful panel of talent, time, and and treasure that was was given to us from some of the the best in our business of not only just black independent comics, but comics in some. So I know a lot of times that we make the we use the moniker black comics or black technology, black business. But please understand and, and let us make sure that clarification is that in some that it is something that for everyone should be looked at as a, a space of standard and of appreciation and of attention. And that is absolutely worthy of your time and support. And so with that, we're thankful for the continuation of year four of Black Futures Month here with Subsume. Again, my name is Dejan Sneed here in Atlanta, Georgia, where we're also hosting our, like, our speculative Black Book Festival here at 504 Street. Atlanta, Georgia, here at the historic Russell Innovation Center for Entrepreneurs, right here in Castleberry Hill, where just on the other side of our studio, we have a dozen or so of the most amazing Black indie comics, writers, um, artists, as well as artisans that are here showcasing the fantastic right here for you today. And so we'll continue this program onward. We're going to take a quick 30 minute break for those that are on our live stream. We appreciate you being here. Keep those open and attentive as we'll take a brief siesta to go ahead and get things updated. And then we'll come back with the second part or afternoon run of our service. And we'll go ahead. Let me bring that up here real quick before I let you go on with two to sec. And so I think schedule two and see if I can share it with us here. And there we go. Oh, the picture in picture layout. So I'm going to remove. Well, we'll put it in the back, right? So, uh, and my apologies to uh, Sarah, who's on the other end, and I am absolutely uh, wrecking that part. But to that, uh, we'll leave our schedule up. So from there, 2.30, uh, we'll have Web3 forever. And then at 3 o'clock um, until 7 o'clock, we'll have the second portion of Black Futures Month 2023. So with that, at 2.30, we'll be right back. So we'll go ahead and bring up Web3 forever. The idea of looking at blackness and its inclusion in the Web3 and metaverse spaces in the wake of a cultural shift, financial and otherwise, in that space. And how do we stay included in that narrative and in that space of entrepreneurship? So with that, thank you all so very much for being a part. Please stay tuned and stay included for more. We'll be right back.
Thank you all so very much. And we appreciate you being a part of Subsume Summit Black Futures Month 2023. And thank you again. My name is Dejan Sneed here in Atlanta, Georgia. And we at Subsume are looking to be the intersection between creativity, technology, and community, where we are looking at how we can build the Black future of tomorrow by appreciating the pioneers and creators of today who are making so many amazing spaces, stories, and legacies here in real time. And so what we want to talk about here is a space of Web3, the idea of the next iteration of IoT, the internet, and the way that we and our digital sales connect and bring in some industry experts to talk about Web3 forever. The idea is what is the new, what's the new space? What is the new place, the new landscape of Web3 with so much change and shifts going on and about in a relatively new space, but at the same time that we have some experts that have seen the rise and fall and are going to help us navigate in a great conversation together about where we go from here. So with that, I want to call to the stage uh, attorney Joe Holmes. Day, hey, Joe, hope you hear me and hope you're all as well today. I hear you well, Dead, and thank you for having me. Oh, a pleasure as always uh, to have your your presence and your brilliance be a, a part of anything that we're uh, associated with here with Subsume. And uh, I know that we have uh, young Zachary here in attendance here shortly, but I want to just give the stage to yourself so that folks can know of you and your expertise as we talk about Web3 Forever. So again, pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Dedrin. So by way of brief introduction, my name is Joanne Holmes of Holmes at Law. And my practice is focused around intellectual property and digital assets. So I help clients understand how to grow ecosystems of revenue in Web3, leveraging blockchain technology, and also how to manage the frankly pretty challenging legal and regulatory compliance landscape during that process. I work with clients from entrepreneurs and startups. I'm currently advising accelerator programs through Techstars with founders on five continents, all the way through advising enterprise level multinational companies on how to leverage NFTs, the metaverse, uh, in gaming and with DAOs. Thank you so very much. And I think we'd love to also allow you to give your alma mater a shout out there on the best coast, right? <laughs> I am a proud Stanford University <laughs> alum. Uh, we are a, a legacy family, and uh, I moved here to Atlanta to attend Emory for law school. Oh, perfect, and thank you. And, and definitely a, a point of that landscape, and again, your impact here in Atlanta has have been absolutely appreciated, and your insight as well as what we're looking at as far as the legal component of where we are in the space of Web3. So, of course, looking at seven, the past seven to eight years, of course, looking at the the contemporary adoption of blockchain technology here in the uh, in the late 2010s up to where we are now, where we've seen a a full on shift, particularly during the pandemic, where we've seen a lot of spaces for blockchain technology, the Internet of Things, of course, cryptocurrency and NFTs be what were obscure terms five years ago. Now, every infrastructure, every system and sector is taking it into place. Just off the cuff, particularly from the legal standpoint, where seen, have you seen some of the biggest uh, biggest opportunities or conversations being steered here in the past 18 months? You know, Dedrin, what's really interesting is that uh, the space in Web3 based on distributed ledger and blockchain technology is constantly evolving. And so what got a lot of attention last year was, frankly, the hype around NFTs with um, profile picture uh, digital art like the Board Ape Yacht Club or Boss Babes or World of Women. And we were seeing extraordinary floor prices for these digital assets going you know, into the tens of thousands all the way into the millions of dollars as the baseline for buying those assets. And I think that got attention. Uh, one of the, the points when that happened was when the Beeple artwork collection sold for $69 million. And there were also uh, times in the past couple of years where there was a real focus on decentralized finance or DeFi, where people were looking at opportunities to earn yield on their digital assets and cryptocurrencies. Over the longer term, I think we've moved away from some of that speculation, largely here in the United States, driven by the fact that there's a more aggressive regulatory framework. Uh, we're seeing precedent in federal courts and in the Securities and Exchange Commission and Commodity Futures Trading Commission, where there's really an emphasis on trying to get 
their arms around their regulatory authority. So we frankly need our U.S. Congress to step in and be more proactive about understanding that digital assets are the next phase of the Internet. And so just like in the late 90s and early 2000s, people were saying, oh, my goodness, only criminals are on the Internet or I would never put my banking information online because what if someone stole my credit card? You know, with every technology from fire to the internet, to now blockchain tech, there's always an opportunity for some bad actor. And there should be laws and regulations in place to protect consumers and businesses from those bad actors. But at the same time, there's extraordinary promise in this opportunity, all the way from artists who you know, previously were worried that if they put their art online, someone could right click and save it and they would never get paid for the use of that art. Blockchain technology makes it possible to have provenance and show that that art actually came from the artist who you want to support all the way through uh, loyalty programs like what we're seeing Starbucks introduce for their coffee drinkers with gamification and making it exciting for people to get online and find new ways to interact with those legacy brands to small businesses who are thinking about maybe I can set up a membership program or maybe I can offer ways in blockchain technology to reach broader audiences. So really what I'm seeing now and what I'm trying to help encourage is a very inclusive Web3 where wherever you are meeting this moment, you are educated about the opportunity, not not being deterred by the unfortunate narrative that we see in the news, but recognizing every new phase of technology creates opportunity. And those who are willing to seize this opportunity, get educated and understand what they can offer are going to have a competitive advantage. No, absolutely. And astutely said, ma'am, as always. So I appreciate that. And I want to give a point of response, but I do also want to call to the stage, uh, you know, owner of Kit Labs, uh, Zach, Zachary. Uh, Farley, hope you're doing well. I'll go ahead and uh, bring him in. Let's see. Oh, I think we're both pressing the button. My apologies. There we go. Thank you so much, Sarah and Zach. A pleasure to get you in today. Thank you and welcome to Black Future 2023, where you are absolutely an example of such. Thank you and a good day to you. Nice to meet everyone today. I hope everyone's having a fantastic Saturday. Um, in response to your um, uh, statement, is it is it should I call you Joe, Joanne? Yes, Zach, please call me Joe. Thank okay. you for <laughs> fantastic. Um in response to um in response to your statement, um it's definitely something that uh proves to actually help content creators uh monetize their artwork um within the standpoint of actually making sure that okay, someone is um uh, someone is actually making sure that okay, I'm I'm producing content, um, I'm making sure I can actually make a living. The blockchain helps with making sure that those transactions go back to those content creators and making sure that okay, their content work um, stays secure within the network as well. Uh, do you mind re-referencing? Okay, that what is the uh, the the statement, the stake um, that you're going back to again? No worries. Thank you so much, Zach. The idea of where we're seeing the largest conversations within the past 18 months in regards of for her, for Joe's space, of the uh, legal ramifications around Web3 and its mass adoption um, in most sectors. And then, of course, we'd love to talk about that as a contrast to the technological space as we, of course, want to ask your expertise in Web3 and then particularly more from the blockchain engineering standpoint as far as how we're seeing you know, it's mass adoption now have a, a culture of change in our in our greater space. The change is definitely coming, I want to say. Um, it really is up to the creators, unfortunately, uh, because whether you see your brand as being something that's monetizable or not, it's really it's really up to the market. Um, so like, for instance, the market determined that Board 8 Yacht Club, which is one of the, you know, the top top, top big NFT dogs out there, um, the market determines that, okay, this is something that's actually valuable. Um, I would say if you want to make sure that your uh, content is marketable, if you want to make sure that it's it's secure, you have to at least reach the level to the point where uh, there's actual, there's people that's craving, there's people that's going out, they're looking for it, they're wanting to make sure, okay, am I staying up to date with this content creator? Am I making sure that 
Um, I'm following each and every one of their moves, their standpoints, and that, that'll help you get to the point where, okay, that's, yeah, you, you have to make sure that your content is secure. Otherwise it won't, it, it won't do anything for you. It'll, it'll just be, uh, like you said, okay, you can right click, you can save and someone can else can repurpose it because at the end of the day, it is a, it is a JPEG file that is. Oh, absolutely. And um, Zach, I just want to go back one point of clarification for us to just learn a bit about yourself and Kit Labs and your particular yes. expertise. Yeah, definitely want to make sure we give you your proper bona fides on uh, on this call as we continue the conversation. Yes, definitely. And um, yeah, so nice to meet everyone. Uh, my name is Zach Farley, uh, co-founder of Kit Labs Co-Development Studio. Uh, me, myself, personally, I am a IoT and blockchain engineer. Uh, so I've developed smart contracts um, and I specifically focus on the internet of things space uh, so anything that you think about that's uh, wearable technology anything that's uh, monitoring our pulses sending back uh, reports making sure that we get up every five minutes and go on a walk um, i specialize in in making those two worlds intersect and meet together as well too um so yeah <laughs> nice to meet everyone on the call there i've done a, a variety of work from um, helping implement uh, various different blockchain technologies uh, smart contracts. And right now I'm just focusing on making sure that the Web3 space with our nonprofit um, Kit Labs and our meetup group, Slady ATL, we, we want to make sure that we help individuals get in the space from a technical standpoint um, and not just from a content creator standpoint as well. Thank you. And I appreciate that clarification, Zach. And, and absolutely. And I think it's an amalgam of people such as as the people here as well as our shared space here in Atlanta that I really feel will be a solution space for the future of Web3. And I think it is a sense of community, right? The idea that we have a particular set of, of skills and expertise here in Atlanta, um, that we're being intentional about making it a, a home and a sustainable space for Web3. But as we talk about the black future of, of things, the idea of how do we, as not only creators, but eight spaces of agency, look to appreciate what we have in this new landscape of web3 and so i think it was uh, something as joe cited and and, pre and precluded earlier that right now you know with all the the opportunities for regulation now is a space for new agents and new factors to come in and be those agents of change and if, if we've seen anything with web3 is in that space of decentralization that has taken all it's taken down a lot of traditional um barriers or entry whether that's financial, whether that's social or socioeconomic. And so now we want to think forward to now us as creators in this space, you know, where are we seeing some of those incongruities from, I'll say the lessons that we're learning at our expense right now in some <laughs> of these spaces um, yeah. to say, you know, what's next or what's now that we can kind of focus on. Now, Zach, you made that point of, you know, the valuation of NFTs basically being based on the market, like most things are. But yeah. in that sense, now when we look to get to a space of regulation, where do we see that Web3 can now have the most impact? Like, for example, in healthcare, the idea mm -hmm. if we're looking at a new space of regulation, but maybe a decentralization of information. Now, do we have a space that now we can find sustainable healthcare as a part of Web3? So I've got to open therein to what your thoughts are about now, where are some spaces that we can look to to navigate to and towards uh, to be a part of that. It's it's definitely something that you want to keep your eyes out for. Um, me personally, I'm specifically looking at the supply chain division. I think from the consumer goods standpoint, purchasing NFTs as a form of assets to kind of hold, make sure it gains interest to cash out. I really do think that is. Um, it's probably something not a lot of people are going to look towards. Um, since me, myself, I'm a, I'm a builder, I'm a creator. I never gravitated towards that in the first place, but for the consumers, uh, the individuals who maybe are not as knowledgeable in the space, I would say focus on seeing where, where are the builders actually going? Where's the core value of what uh, the blockchain can actually represent? Uh, the way, the way I see it having the most impact is in the supply chain sp space. The reason being for that is, is that there's various different vendors out there. Uh, there's various different, um, you know, we saw with COVID that, okay, from Africa to China, we're trying to ship goods, products, services, 
uh, from over the seas over here to America, uh, we want to make sure that those goods and services are kind of kept lock and key, whether it be food, whether it be actual physical products, and our supply chain essentially ground up to a halt due to COVID. Um, and with that, we want sometimes retailers or anyone who's trying to import goods from out, outside countries, they have to go to a different source. And consumers are very interested in where their goods are actually coming from. We know this because we have organic goods. We have uh, places where grocery stores, they source from. There has been an increase in people actually sourcing goods from local, like local grown actual agriculture. Uh, so there's definitely a, there is a, um, a stake in the game as far as understanding where the source of our goods are coming from. I want to make sure I'm supporting local black owned businesses is this coming from China or is this coming from Minnesota somewhere, you know? Uh, so that, that's where I see more of the, that's where I see more of the, uh, the value kind of going. Uh, blockchain does help with the transparency aspect. Um, there have been a couple corporations from Walmart to, um, I believe H and M Nike as well, uh, doing implementations, uh, trying to see how, okay, we add a, a blockchain node at a certain location and multiple different vendors are kind of tapping into those resources. They're trying to see, okay, what is the status update on these, uh, whether this supply chain space where it's, you know, we're importing t-shirts or, okay, you know, the, this food is coming from another location as well too. Uh, so there's definitely high interest there. And personally, I think that's where the uh, market is going to shift to as far as a, a Web3 aspects so of not not really focusing on the nfts but uh kind of moving towards the uh, supply chain where we're using the blockchain to validate where delivery of goods are and there's multiple different vendors tapping into the network to pull those um to pull where that value is coming from as well fantastic and joe love to get your perspective of of where you're seeing a new or opportunity space within web3 that's you know worthy of our attention so I think uh, I would analogize this to asking someone in 2000, what do you think people are going to use the internet for? Or asking someone in 2007, 2008, what do you think people are going to do with mobile technology or smartphones? The reality is that in every new phase of technological innovation, we're currently in a phase that is going to include blockchain technology, AI, robotics, internet of things, and they're going to interact with one another. And so what I anticipate is that this technology is going to impact every facet of business. It's going to impact education. It's going to impact uh, how we entertain ourselves, how we gather um, in physical and virtual spaces. So when I am advising my clients around designing meaningful revenue ecosystems of products and services in the Web3 space, I start out with saying, what is your current identity? What is your brand? What are the reasons why people buy your products or services? Or why does your community follow you? So you can start from an authentic space of understanding your existing customer or community and then leverage the technology with a goal of serving that customer and community. So that might look like for one organization issuing an NFT, again, as a loyalty program or as a piece of digital art. For others, that might look like launching a DAO or a decentralized autonomous organization that could be a newer version of a fan club or a focus group so that you can get feedback around what is the expectation that your community has? How do they want to engage you? And those biggest fans can have a voice and take a sense of pride in participating in supporting your brand. It might look like you developing a metaverse strategy where you may be like Nike, for example, start with your presence in uh, Nike land and Roblox, where we know that there are millions of monthly active users and then move out of that sort of web two virtual gaming world into a web three presence where those skins and emotes and weapons can be NFTs that are assets that are owned by the people who play in that game and build that digital world rather than them being assets of the corporation and held within that structure and they can't be traded on any secondary marketplace. So when I think about these opportunities and I advise my clients through developing web three strategies, again, I think it has to start with 
How do you maintain the integrity and respect for your existing set of customers and communities? How do you leverage blockchain to add more value with them? And how do you keep your ear attuned to what they would like to have you build and offer in the future so that you can iterate through this emerging technology and not do things that are gimmicky over the course of time? Perfectly and well said. Now, this is way too quick a time. Uh, it, it simply evaporated on us. Uh, but I want to take one moment, uh, particularly when we're looking at Web3 and being an integral part of business. Uh, what would be one quick nugget or ideation or just a hint uh, that you would give to a black owned business that is apprehensive about being in the component of Web3 or thinking that it's run its course and it's the next space? What's, what's a piece of advice? Obviously, legal advice here from from Joe, perhaps, uh, and then for you, Zach, maybe from a technology standpoint. What's one thing that you would tell someone whose business right now they feel isn't being impacted by Web three? And I will go with Joe first, and then Zach, and then we'll uh, close out. Sure, I would say there is opportunity to gain a competitive advantage. You don't need to immediately restructure your entire business for it to be web free focused. But if you are willing to learn how you can better serve your community using this technology, you will have that foothold ahead of your competitors. Make sure that you are doing your homework and understanding the legal and regulatory landscape, landscape excuse me, so that you don't step on those landmines inadvertently. But get off zero, move into this space and start talking to your community about how you can serve them with this tech. Fantastic response, Joe. Um, I'll give my response here now, Dedrin. So I would say definitely um, understand your business. Understand who you serve. Understand what your mission is. And kind of, like Joe said, do your research. See where the actual intersections are. If your audience is primarily uh, baby boomers, maybe it's not the best <laughs> to go into Web3. <laughs> but if your audience is primarily um, Gen Z, millennials, um, and anyone else that comes after the fact, you probably should try to see uh, what they're looking at, whether it be on TikTok, whether it be on OpenSea, uh, whether it be on Wearable, anything like that. Because the younger generation will definitely def define where their consumption areas is. And it's up to you as the business owner to see where, okay, my market seems to be shifting away from this standard form of consumption towards this new form, Web3. You know, I need to start understanding how, how do I interact with my consumer's wallets? How do I actually incentivize them to purchase my goods and services, whether it be through an NFT or through a DAO, through a rewards program or anything like that? So uh, in response to your question, uh, we need to understand our audience. We need to understand our, our own businesses. Do a, just a general mapping of, hey, who, who are the last people that have purchased my products? What are, what are their general demographics? Um, what do they look like? Are they, is it someone that actually will kind of navigate to this Web3? If it's not, then it's not. And that's totally fine. But like Joe mentioned, if you do have, if a majority of your audience is, again, millennial, Gen Z below, it's definitely worth the investment. It's worth to look at it because you are missing out on opportunity. And it may, it may seem silly to, for, you know, outside looking in like, oh, why is someone placing this much value on a, um, an image that's on the blockchain that's, again, a, a byte code? And someone's paying like two thousand plus dollars for it. There's a reason for it. The market determined it. It, it doesn't matter why. You you just need to understand what you need to do to position your business to be on the intersection point to pick them up, and then make some revenue. And that's what I'll say for that. <laughs> Keeping them on. No, absolutely no. And we can appreciate that expertise on on that. I'll I'll give my two cents, and then we'll uh, close out with the opportunity of. Of, and a continuation for sure. We, we will absolutely have this again. And I'll work backwards to say that I do honestly think that there, the culture and space of Atlanta is very unique. Obviously, your space from civil rights to being the the transactionality for for Web three and the idea of of financial transactions through blockchain. 
right? So we run the gambit here in this small intersection, right? So we go from, uh, so again, civil rights and humanity into the spaces of, of innovation into tomorrow. So two things I normally tell people when they're kind of asking about these spaces. One is that the metaverse, Web3, and all these components is simply another word for relationships. So you have to understand the relationships of your person, of your interaction between a client, also a reaction of the spaces around you. And all Web3 is doing is really making it more transparent and transactionable for you to have a relationship in the same way that you would have a relationship of good value with someone. All this is going to do is bolster that that trust and that key word of trust is is what's integral within Web3. And then the second part um, really is that, you know, it's, it is a space that requires active participation. Right. The idea is that, you know, you being in and being involved is a component of, of again, being included. I think it's a space where you'd rather be the creator than the consumer. And I think to that point, as Zach said, and I'll close it there, is that we're, Web 2 is consumption. Web 3 is collaboration. You know, our phones, our communities, our locations, all these devices are working together. They're not working against each other. They're working in, in a synchronous and synchronous space or working in sync uh, to accomplish something. You can be a part of that solution space and you can be the architect of what's to be what's to be completed. But you have to you have to be present to win. Right. So that's those are the components that I try to normally share when speaking about the metaverse and how do we now find equity in those spaces. So, uh, again, just brilliant opportunities to even just get a, a snippet of, of your time and talents here today. Um, we'll go with Joe and then Zach. Please let us know how we can follow you. Appreciate you as we continue to, to build uh, our Wakanda here in Atlanta together. Thank you, Dendron. I appreciate you asking. So again, uh, my name is Joanne Holmes and my law firm is Holmes at Law. You can find more about how I serve clients in the Web3 space at uh, Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S-A-T-L-A-W.com. And I'm very active on LinkedIn. You can find me by searching Joanne Holmes there. I'd love to connect with folks and hear what you're building. Awesome. And I just, um, I dropped my LinkedIn, the best place to connect with me will be on there. Uh, feel free to throw me a private chat DM if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, uh, you can check out our website, kitlabs.io. We have an online community on there where we have various different workshops related to uh, smart contract development and um, building and curating NFTs. So if you guys are interested in that from a not from a content creator standpoint, but if you're technical and you like the code and you understand what JavaScript and Solidity is, um, then definitely check out that website. Um, and you'll be able to uh, go into our community in Solidity ATL and see what all uh, value we have as well. Uh, so you can definitely follow me on there too. Absolutely. And thank you both so very much. And of course, you'll be able to find your contact information as well as a, a replay soon of this work here on our website at subsumestudios.com and the subsumesummit.com. We'll be obviously highlighting these great speakers here today and looking to follow the innovations that they'll be leading for tomorrow. So thank you both so very much. Thank you all for your time and attention and being a part of Black Futures 2023. I really appreciate you both. Of course. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Thank you. And with that, we're going to go right on into our, our next phase. But again, want to thank the idea of coming in together for a Metaverse and Web3 conversation of Web3 forever. Again, with attorney Joe Holmes, as well as engineer and from Kit Labs, uh, Zach Farley. And so with that, we're going to go right into the continuation of the fantastic, looking at a space of speculative fiction and horror, as well as writing and narrative uh, for the inclusion of spaces of tomorrow. I mean, it is an absolute privilege to bring our next guest here to the stage, and we will just continue the excellence with uh, a privilege to speak with uh, renowned author, creator, and um, and just amazing creative worlds. Uh, Rodney Barnes, a pleasure to speak to you, with you sir. What's happening, Dedra? How are you doing, man? Yes, sir. Good, good. You know, I, I always want to uh, imagine myself, you know, on the best coast with you, you know, dining, <laughs> uh, you know, one, uh, at your steak space. But uh, I know this this will do for a Saturday day again. A you'll, you'll make it up. You'll make it up. You'll make absolutely, it up. absolutely. So pleasure. So for those who yet to have the opportunity to uh, to maybe know your work in, in space, and I'm sure they've been impacted or seen it. Love to give you a, the stage in a moment to introduce yourself and give you the proper bona fides here. 
Uh, okay, my name is Rodney Barnes. I'm primarily known as a television writer, uh, a show writer and producer of shows like uh, My Wife and Kids, The Boondocks, Everybody Hates Chris, American Gods, Runaways, Wu Tang and American Saga, uh, currently Winning Time, Rise of the Lakers Dynasty on HBO, uh, where I act sometimes. I don't know if I call it acting. I actually apologize to every actor I'm in a scene with. Um, but I'm playing a security guard, so I, I'm, I know how to do that. I know how to be big and spooky. Um, and in the comic book graphic novel space, I, um, I've written books for Marvel, like The Falcon, and in their Star Wars space, The Mandalorian, Lando, Double or Nothing, and IG-88 from War of the Bounty Hunters. Um, and my image books, Philadelphia, Monarch, and Nita Hall's Nightmare blog. And I just started my own comic imprint where the first book that we just published a couple of weeks ago, Blackula, Return of the King from the MGM Black Exploitation yeah. Classic. Exactly. There you go. There you oh, go. Yeah. Oh, we got a stack over here. And I'm in the different okay. Brown. Okay. Oh, no, absolutely. Man. No, we, we, we got you. Absolutely. Man, yeah. my kids appreciate that. Maybe they can go to college now. Um, <laughs> now you get an appetizer with that steak when you come out. Um, but yeah, that's me in a nutshell. And, um, there you go. Oh, thank you so very much. I appreciate you and the, the privilege to bring you in. I'll make sure to, to shout out our, our segment sponsor here, Challenges, Games, and Comics in Decatur, Georgia, which is uh, our space for inclusive comics as well as a neighborhood comic book shop for gaming, entertainment, and more, ran by a fellow creative and writer, Tony Cade. So shout out to Tony and the uh, Challenges crew there. But we thank absolutely, you. there's so many things that we can speak to you on uh, in the space of expertise that you have. But I really was enthralled with the idea of Blackula and Black horror. Mm -hmm. I think the idea when we look at the narratives of those two words together, Black mm -hmm. and horror, I mean, there's a lot of other connotations we can take. But mm -hmm. particularly in the space that we're looking at it from a creative lens, where I think we are in a new renaissance of horror and it being much more appreciated as a medium of space mm -hmm. to see ourselves represented in that space in the most positive way is really what drew me into this work of Blackula, but also um, other works that you have. So I'd love to just get a perspective of you perhaps identifying, you know, what, is, what makes Black horror in this space right now? You know, for me, it means a lot of different things. And I, I think the point that you just made so eloquently about the importance of horror and African-American culture being a part of it is it can be so many different things and people have used it for so many different things. We can talk about history. We can talk about um, just a desire to connect. When you have a horrifying situation in a story, typically the ones that work, you have to develop some semblance of empathy with the person that's in the situation, which is humanizing that person. So often over the course of uh, television films, comic books, the idea of blackness has been one dimensional and almost like a caricature at times. Um, thank you, Eugene. And for me, the opportunity in my books, uh, Philadelphia and, and Blackula, I like the idea of being able to go back and deal with history along the way. And I can elevate ideas like generational trauma, um, certain political ideas and, and sociological ideas within the narrative, but not so much to the point where it's still not fun and it's still not horror. If you think about movies like Dawn of the Dead or Night of the Living Dead, George, the late great George Romero was dealing with topics of racism and dealing with capitalism and the dangers of capitalism. So I think horror is a great bridge and conduit to be able to speak about things beyond the things that go bump in the night, to be able to sneak in some things that um, are layered ideas that we don't normally get to talk about in, in Black narratives. Absolutely. And I think there's a, a space that you to likewise follow up with the idea of black narration being the fact that we are the architects of our own stories and, mm -hmm. and to that sense that we get that chance and, and that agency to tell those. Mm -hmm. How does that relate in the characters that you build in the worlds, the worlds that you build and the characters that uh, we're privileged to uh, follow along that you create? I try, again, to make them multifaceted. I try to make them have flaws that are human. I try to move the needle in the idea. Like, I grew up in a time where um, I used to love the Hammer films and the Universal Monsters, and that stuff as a kid. But I never saw us 
And maybe every once in a while we pop up and say, he went that away. Or and even in black comic books, it was like they were sort of piggybacking off the black exploitation movement, where it was sort of just like taking um these caricature like one dimensional ideas and not even the, the ones from the best ideas that came from black exploitation, just taking um, like the early Luke Cages and some of that stuff, like some of the vernacular and some of the things that you could take from it and just sort of create another form of exploitation, which I still appreciated as a kid, but knew that there was a lot more story to be told. Mm -hmm. And now when you have folks like Jordan Peele and um, the things I'm working on and other uh, Tanana Reeve do and other Black authors who deal in the horror space and deal with our culture, you're able to get the idea, a fully realized idea of what African-American culture is from a lot of different entry points. Um, Lovecraft Country and stuff like that really sort of gives us the idea of going beyond just the basic stories of the hood and gangs and, right. you know, or sometimes just history uh, and very specific history to being able to add some fantasy to it. Because I think the imagination is the place where great things spring from and being able to see ourselves in the future and being able to control the narrative along the way um, to me is a very powerful thing. And in my books and in my characters, I try to not place limitations on them. It's a very simple math. I try to find some form of a human construct relationship, uh, father, son, um, you know, family. And I try to take those ideas and turn them on their heads. Now that that idea, that relationship is placed in jeopardy by some supernatural force. And how do we find our way back together? So there's the human aspect of what that is, but then there's also the supernatural aspect, which sort of kind of makes it fun. But even if I can find layers in that, I can connect to something bigger than just the idea of that. If I'm talking about African philosophy, if I'm talking about um, specific moments in history, um, I actually learned a lot about history myself through watching movies, you know, more so than what I was learning in school. And there are things, when we look at our history being challenged right now with critical race theory and not being able to get some of the specificity and nuance of what our contribution has been to the country. I think stories that involve that, whether they come from horror or whatever genre, is a great way to be able to continue to educate along the way while still being entertaining at the same time. Oh, absolutely. And again, I think that's right on with the, the way that this medium, when we think of horror and it, like for example, Lovecraft Country, the way it educated, and I'll use those air quotes, educated the United States on the space or the idea of a sundown town. Mm -hmm. Now, I myself, as a rambling southerner from Snow Hill, North Carolina, you know, maybe not having as many gray hairs as I deserve, but I know exactly what that was. And mm -hmm. you know what side of town, what towns you can and can't go to, particularly with, you know, particular hue of skin. But mm -hmm. the idea that maybe we as a larger consciousness couldn't think that that happened in this space or the Tulsa race or the Tulsa race. From Watchmen. Project. Yeah, exactly. From Watchmen. Going yeah. Right there with it. But yeah. the idea to your point is under a horror and under the auspice of of humanity or lack thereof during a certain time period of how some people may have been seen. You know, I think we are able to educate. And that's why I'm excited to see this renaissance of horror. Mm -hmm. I think it both is fantastic, but very introspective of the humanity. Right. Because I don't think and this is just my own take of it, is that there is no horror unless there's a human element to be lost, to be challenged, right? And so the idea of blackness and horror absolutely puts us in a humanized space where a lot of times in other genres, we simply don't get that. And I agree 100%. And I think being able, I try my best to speak from a place of culture, not so much just race. Um, right. Culture is how we do things, you know, how we look at the world. And that. I think now because of social media and so many voices coming into the equation, there's no one way to um, define how we do things. You have so many groups within our group. And over the years, it's been like a monolithic idea. This is going to be black stories. Well, what does that mean? If you come from even geographically, like you just mentioned the South, that's a different experience than coming up in the North and coming up from the East and the West. It's like hip hop in a way. Like you have all these regional sounds that are different, but it's still hip hop at the heart of it. And I think it's the same way for 
us and how we tell stories in within a horror space. There's a Southern Gothic that has a different feel mm. than a Candyman that was in Chicago and Cabrini Green, the first one. And, you know, that story is going to manifest itself differently. And I think the opportunity to be able to create multifaceted ideas about our experience here also enlightens us to who we are as a group as well. And so, you know, for me and, and my company and, and the things that I'm trying to do with my books is, you know, Blackula was a title. I saw that movie when I was a little kid, when my mother took me to the movies. And it was the first time I'd been in a theater full of black people talking back to the screen. And it was an interactive experience, but we were all scared at the same thing and we were all having a great time. And as I got older, I found the um, some of the problematic aspects to even his name being Blackula, you know, it's like you're fetishizing the name. Mm. But I was able to address that. I always said as a kid, if I ever got an opportunity to rewrite this or redo this, I would extricate the parts that were problematic and then highlight the parts that I thought worked really, really well. And the late great William Marshall, who played Prince Mama Walter, AKA Blackula, I was like a Shakespearean actor. He played Othello. He was just, he had just as much gravitas to me as Bella Lugosi did playing Dracula. And I wanted the opportunity to be able to create some elegance to his story, regardless of whether it was set in Watts or wherever it was set. To me, it was just as significant as Dracula's story in Transylvania. So being able to do that, and then still, if you remember the movie at all, in the beginning, Prince Mama Waldi went to Count Dracula, who was a dignitary, he didn't know he was a vampire, to get help with the slave trade. And he was betrayed immediately and the vampire stuff jumps in. But I was always intrigued by that idea. And I try to highlight that idea in the book a lot because that idea of betrayal is the beginning of generational trauma and stays with him throughout his journey some 300 years later now popping back up in modern day. And I like the idea of being able to connect those themes uh, in my story without necessarily hitting it over the head and making it medicine, but still adding, this is the thing that haunts him beyond now he's a predatory monster and came from royalty. Now he's got this curse that's been applied to him, you know, just having to carry this information and waking up into a world and seeing the result of the thing he wasn't able to influence in the way that he wanted to, that also has an effect on him. So to me, you know, being able to use a vampire, which is an immortal. And I think the Anne Rice series on uh, AMC does a great job at this as well, of being able to use immortality in time and being able to pepper in historical aspects of World War II and civil rights movement and, you know, modern times and how they all have influenced this journey that we've been on since 1619. To me, it's not only fun, but important. And now you have so many black creatives that are in it and able to influence stories in an honest way. You're not just fetishizing the idea of blackness. You really are moving the needle in how these stories are told and what's under them. And so I think it's a really great time for storytellers. Absolutely. And to that, we'd love to kind of talk about your imprint again, where you're looking at being a intentional space for new for storytellers to define mm -hmm. their their voice and and to complement new narratives. Can you tell us about your studio and the endeavors as as you see forth from there? Yeah, um, of course, Blackula is first, and um, the next book is Florence and Normandy, uh, written with my uh, story by myself and the uh, rapper actor Exhibit. Uh, just came from a conversation we were having one day about him standing on the corner of Florence and Normandy and seeing a UFO and. Mm -hmm. It opened up a bunch of ideas. Um, I want to tell genre-laden stories, whether they're mystery, suspense, horror, those types of things. The first five or six books will be written by me with a variety of artists uh, that come in who I think their tone sets, it goes well with the story. But I want to be able to open up to creatives who don't typically get opportunities and um, to do anthologies and to be able to edit and guide some newer talent um, with whatever it is that I've learned along the way in doing this and to create a space. You know, it's like um, once the foundation is strong enough and we're a recognizable brand, um, then I can afford the opportunity to extend that out in such a way that 
hopefully will uh, highlight new creatives and also keep the books moving. Now that's great. That's great. And and I was just thinking the uh, the idea of the exhibit seeing a spaceship, uh, I guess a mm -hmm. few years ago would have had a different connotation versus us. Oh yeah, probably shooting them down now on a, on a weekly basis. And, well, and, the, you'd have thought he was crazy, you know, back right. then. But now it's like you know what? It's possible. It's, it's possible. exactly now now a whole new narrative. And, and again, um, you know, and and then follow up, of course, of uh, of of Peel's note and and the idea of like it's, yes. I think we, we look at the uh, the space of, of horror and story narrative again being very contemporary now where mm -hmm. I think before it was very historic when we think of like the universal creatures or you know I guess mm -hmm. in that traditional sense there were already these classic monsters but now uh, I see more of like the social narrative being a, a strong proponent into what we perceive as horror now yeah, you know what? Mm. yeah I, I think that um the social narrative makes it interesting, I think, when you can continue to have the the human element added to it. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, a family, whatever the situation is, I tend to steer more towards um, those types of stories, more so than just the idea of the spectacle. Because we had for a minute these period of just, um, you know, the pimp that was the zombie or the this or that. And it was sort of like the trope that went along with black exploitation, like we're going black exploitation 2.0. Mm -hmm. But again, when you see stuff like Lovecraft Country and understanding who H.B. Lovecraft was and his lack of affection for black people to one day have, I'm sure he's turned over in his grave right now. Uh, <laughs> that'd be a story in and of itself to see black people run around with his name somehow uh, attached to it. But I, again, to what you were saying, I think being able to get the social stuff connected to the human stuff is uh, huge. Perfect. So, so what is is next? Again, you gave a, a great lineage and 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 log lines of of several projects you have on. Obviously, and again, in addition to your own imprint, where for black horror would you like to see the genre, this space, go and grow into? Is there another? <sighs> larger project or endeavor that you may look at or yeah curate things from there um well also the studio beyond doing graphic novels i plan mm -hmm. to do tv shows and features as well and a couple of the books um have been option um working on an option right now for monarch my book that came out a couple of weeks ago um don't tell man you are on it you are on, on it. it man on you are Challenges on it games and comics it, folks it, 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 there you go um that book is working on an option right now, and I think that would make a really big feature. And Philadelphia has been optioned uh, for a TV show, and we're attaching folks to it now, and I'm working on a pilot. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking to be able to continue to um, gain a foothold. You know, I remember a real quick story. Uh, when I first came to Hollywood back in the late 90s, um, my story of Philadelphia I had written as a feature. And um, I took it to a producer. Well, a producer was interested in making it into a movie. And he asked me, he said, there's one thing, could you get more white people in this story? And it was set in Compton at the time. And I remember spending the whole weekend trying to figure out how I could get more white people naturally into this story. Like I, I might, as my agent was saying, you're on a two yard line. If you could just find some way to get white people in it. <laughs> and then he came back on a Monday when we were supposed to talk again. And he said, um, you know, on second thought, if Eddie Murphy couldn't make vampires work in vampire in Brooklyn, he had Wes Craven. Maybe black people and vampires just don't work. Thanks, kid. And it went away just like that. Mm. And it left this taste in my mouth of this idea. How many Dracula movies have we seen? We've seen a million of them. And good ones, bad ones, great ones, you know, everything in between. But the idea that we were limited to one story about one thing at one time, and it may not have been, I'm a fan of the movie. I'm a huge fan of uh, Eddie Murphy. And I think, you know, a lot of times when movies don't work in their first outing, it has a lot more to do with when they came out, what they were up against, what were the circumstances at the time. It's a lot more than just that. But none of that was being taken into consideration. And you fast forward to today when you see the needle being moved um, 
in the way that it has. I think the thing that keeps this thing alive is really strong stories that are crafted and just a commitment to keeping it going. You know, like even having this conversation today and being able to make sure that the movement doesn't fizzle out if everything doesn't work or if everything isn't like, you know, a, a home run. Just the idea of that rising tide lifts all boats and being able to continuously apply pressure to the machine and to show that these stories deserve to have life. These stories deserve in whatever form they come in, whether it's books, whether it's my books, whether it's anybody else's books or movies or TV shows, we we deserve to be at the table. And that only happens if people support and on one end, and it only happens on the end that I'm on if the things are well crafted and that love and that passion is in there because nobody's going to support something that feels like it's just shoddily assembled. So regardless of what it is, I think um, it deserves a look and some love. And I hope that we're in a space right now, not only where the things are being made, but our audience is committed to giving it a look and giving it a chance and supporting it when they dig it. Oh, that's was so well said. And, and again, I think you are uh, absolutely you know, in that space of being not only a partner that's rising that tide, but also an example for a lot of us creators, you know, irrespective of, you know, genre and space of being able to see someone constantly, consistently make so many amazing stories. So we want to thank you. And again, appreciate your, your contribution to really being part of the black history of the future. I know that uh, your space in Maryland had recently given you, you know, some uh, uh, some credentials and bona fides and, 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 and well deserved, of course. But we love to just kind of close by saying, how can we support you? How can we see the endeavors that you have to take forward and thrive? Well, um, thank you for all of that. And thank you, Annapolis, Maryland, for the key to the okay. city. Um, um, you can support me. You can find me at the Rodney Barnes on um, Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, and you can find my books through zombielovestudios.com, my website. Um, you can find them at Amazon. Certainly you can get Blackula there. And um, um, those are basically the main outlets. You can go to your local comic shop like you did in Atlanta. And um, shout out to Tony Cade and them again uh, for their love and support of me. But, um, yeah, comic shop, Amazon, at the Rodney Barnes, and um, zombielovestudios.com. Perfect, perfect. And we're going to um, just interrupt this uh, this conclusion by, by a cliffhanger here uh, by our friend of the show, Tim Fielder. And uh, just a note here, um, he's curious to how, uh, first off, congratulating you on your success in that new mm -hmm. uh, therein. So the idea of him having been curious of how you feel about the transmedia nature of your graphic novel process and film production process. Um, and from there, is that a model that uh, you feel others should follow? I do. I mean, I think uh, one of the reasons why I started my own imprint is because even in the comic book space, when you get an idea, if you don't have your own way of getting it out to the masses, you have to ask somebody. You have to go to somebody and pitch and put a thing together, and um, which is cool, and that's the way that it's always been done. But there were ideas that I had that I felt like I wanted to take directly to the market myself and not necessarily have to you know, mess with them at all in order to be able to get them out there. Um, and be, but that said, I also have a relationship to Hollywood because of my work in television and film. So there's sort of a bridge that's built to facilitate once I do something that I can get that thing looked at, you know, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, I said that only to say that having these imprints and doing this thing isn't easy. Um, it has there's a lot of sacrifice, a lot of time. And if you have anything else that you're doing in your life, <laughs> you got to figure out the balance of life and work. But definitely, 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 if you have the passion and you have the ideas, um, I would say it's a great, uh, great way to begin to create IP that eventually could become other forms of IP. Absolutely. Oh, and, and thank you that for Tim for that question and Rodney for that, the time and the opportunity here. So, you know, I want to just thank you again for making the time to connect with us here. Um, there we go. Straight. <laughs> Tim's note here. So, again, we, he thanks you. Uh, Blood Vein is a good uh, good name for a book. If you ever there you go. One. But there you go. <laughs> there you go. I might steal it. You better hurry up. You better hurry up. <laughs> 
All right, Rodney, I really appreciate you. Thank you so very Thank much you, for, uh, for being a Talk part of it. Absolutely. Thank you so very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, having a chance to complete a, uh, a conversation here. And there we go. He said, go for it. So I guess the race is on. And uh, yet another thank you. So, Eugene, appreciate right. you and your thank support you. here. All right. Thank you so very much. And uh, with that, you know, we want to keep the good vibes continuing. Uh, but again, we want to give thanks and appreciation to writer and producer extraordinaire Rodney Barnes and keeping the connections going as far as people who are building the black, the black creative futures of not only today, but really looking at the space of tomorrow. I think we'll go right into it with our, our next guest being able to kind of speak to the idea, not only of the future of animation and intellectual property, but I'd love to kind of show and share someone that I've looked up to as a, a fellow creative that I know that we'll have some great conversations here to come with. So to that, I'd love to call to the stage Mr. Carl Jones, uh, producer, animator, uh, gentleman of Web3 and, uh, and just all around cool kids. So Carl, pleasure to connect with you again. Oh, it's a pleasure to connect with you too. I, I, thank you for calling me a kid, man. I feel oh. young, man. Appreciate <laughs> uh, it. No, no, you're you're part of the cool kids uh, for sure, for sure. So, no, thank you so uh -huh. much for um, again being a part of our, our Black Future program. And of course, you've asked Saul, um, you know, one of your uh, you know creative alum, uh, Mr. Rodney Barnes, just just put a part of it, and then we get a chance to come in with you. So the the Boondocks connection we got here strong, but we definitely want to make sure that we uh, give you a moment to. Let everyone know who you are and all your uh, proper credentials for sure. Well, first of all, you, you can't say Rodney Barnes' name without saying legend attached to that. That is true. You, you can't that just say fair. Rodney Barnes, alum, no, that guy is a legend. Like he is one of the, one of the funniest, greatest writers I've ever met in flesh. <laughs> he's he's amazing. No, absolutely. Thank you. Now, likewise, legend. Carl Jones, please introduce yourself. Again, we'd love to um, just let people know who you are and, again, all the spaces I'm sure that you've impacted us creatively and, and in our culture. Yeah, um, well, my name is Carl Jones. Um, yeah, I've, I've been in the uh, entertainment industry for almost 18 years now. Um, you know, I cut my teeth on the boondocks, and uh, from there I, I stayed in the Adult Swim family for a little while and went on to uh, – uh, to, to produce uh, Black Dynamite, um, uh, another animated project called uh, Freak Nick the Musical, um, Laser Wolf with uh, Henry Bonsu and um, uh, The Jellies with Tyler the Creator. And then I moved over and did some stuff for Comedy Central like Legends of Chamberlain Heights and did a little bit of live action stuff as well. Um, you know, produced a sketch comedy show at Fox and um, I was a showrunner on uh, Last OG season three, and then um, more recently, uh, I had the pleasure of working with Matthew Cherry and Monica Young on um, on Young Love, which is an adaptation of the the uh, Oscar winning short film Hair Love for HBO Max. Um, yeah, and um, just you know, still making cartoons and developing stuff, and but that's my that's my. Uh, that's my spiel. Oh, and, and more than a spiel, again, a, a legacy that is continuing with, with your own imprint, March and Blueberry, uh, the studio in space, um, and would love to also kind of talk to where you now with a lot of experience, not only just in animation, but in production, and now seeing where we see so much of production now shifting, part of because of Web3, but also part just the creator economy seems to be night and day from where it was 10 years ago. So of course, I feel like you're really the resident expert that we could all talk to about how do all these ideas and all these things come together? We're looking at the idea of transmedia. And I would say maybe to start there, what does the word or the premise of transmedia mean to someone like you? Um, well, you know, I, I'm always just looking for, you know, new and innovative ways to get around um, the traditional Hollywood structure, right? Um, just because I think it's it's a not that you can't navigate the space and use the traditional Hollywood model because a lot of people are successful at it, but I do also feel like there's there's so many opportunities that exist now for content creators, um, you know, in in ways that will allow you to have a little bit more ownership and a little bit more creative freedom and creative license. Um, and to, you know, 
even profit from your creations a little more. You know what I mean? So I think, I think, um, you know, you know, I dabbled a little bit in, in the, in the web three space, um, last year, you know, just kind of stuck my toe in it. And we launched this project called bubble goose ballers. Um, and, uh, we, we, you know, we sold out 10,000 NFTs in less than an hour. And we built this really, really strong community um, using Discord and Twitter, and and this community began to build the brand for us, you know. And um, and at the time, you know, I, I didn't really understand the full capacity of how the blockchain could be used and 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 the the freedoms that come along with Web three. And and um, you know, after actually like experimenting with it, like I see that this is a fertile ground to seed ip right and to and to grow brands and then you can leverage the success that you that you build within web3 and with this community and use those metrics to help land a tv or film deal which hopefully will allow creatives to you know retain more ownership you know what i mean and more and more and more creative freedom like i said so um having that experience it kind of sent me on a little bit of a a, a, a bigger a bigger path in terms of um, you know developing a, a more a studio model that's that's designed to um, you know to build to build these brands and to explore these different verticals before even going to you know uh, television and film, so we end up um, we ended up putting a company together um, that I, I actually I can't talk a lot about it now, but um, but we have some we have some um, I can tell you this the, the, I can I can tell you that. You know the company is uh, it's a it's a, it's an integrated uh, content and collectibles company, right? And we have um, we have a bunch of really great partners um, involved, and in, and in each each one of those partners are experts in various different verticals, which will allow us to really exploit these different areas before with with all of the IP that we create, you know, before we actually go to to uh, you know to Hollywood with it. So um, Carmelo Anthony is one of one of our members, and and um, and one of our one of our investors. Um, we also have um, uh, Good Smile, which is a one of the largest uh, toy companies in the world. Um, they uh, they specialize in anime toys, but they're they're, um, they're really well known all over the world. I believe there's a Good Smile China, Good Smile Japan, and a Good Smile US. Um, and then we have Ars Nova, you know, which is a, a entertainment company that launched Black Dynamite, the movie. Um, um, Lin Manuel, you know, um, who did in the Heights and Hamilton, um, and uh, Eros Resmini, who is who was the founder of Discord and um, one of the key uh, um, uh, business um, strategy people that put artifacts together. You know what I mean? And that they just you know sold to Nike, and um, Nine and Shaw, who was who was the SVP at, at PlayStation, and you know um, Deanna Berkeley, who was the who's the founder of um, um, Alice and Olivia, the clothing line. So we, we, we brought these various different individuals together to build this 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 company out that you know that can actually you know create content and and like I said, exploit these different verticals before going to TV and film. Absolutely. Now to that, with it was such a pantheon of talent. I think as you understand and could appreciate it, it comes down to know where you find the story and how do you reach your community and i know myself from the space of like bubble goose ballers and the idea of how that nft community started plus to your very robust discord and to also give props to you for still being in the survival space of, of and thriving space more so you know with nfts building a successful community that is still going on and continue how do you see your your new your new business venture really being more agile than that traditional Hollywood model, right? So again, as you've cited, you've got a lot of that expertise in that space, but there is a, and we'll use air quotes, tried and true model that tries to build IP in this traditional sense. Where do you see the agility of the way that you're trying to build this really being an advantage for you and your team? Well, I think, I think we're using a more um, participatory, participatory approach, mm -hmm. right? where it's you know it's um the, the goal is to really is not only to just create ip but you know we're creating ip that connects the people and allows them to experience this ip in fun and innovative ways and 
in some of those ways are, um, you know, some of them, some of them are explored through like fan fiction and, 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 and even just letting the community participate in the direction of the creative, you know, in general, you know what I mean? Because I think, you know, if you, if you look at social media, for example, right, everything is becoming TikTokinized, you know what I mean? And, and, and there's a reason for that because TikTok allows people to be a part of the story. You know what I mean? There's a reason why people take selfies. If you see a, a rapper in the street, you take a selfie with them. You, know, you want to be in the picture because you want to be a part of the story versus you just taking a picture of a little Uzi Vert and posting it on your Instagram. It means more for you to be a part of the story. And I think um, TikTok gives people the tools to be a part of the story. So they can take pre-existing audio or, or animation or films and they can be extremely creative with that and create their own content with it. And you know, there's there's a lot of value in that. And you see, you know, even with Instagram, reels are a lot more popular now than than you know what I mean than just regular posts. And you see the same thing happen with Facebook. So everyone's kind of, you know, trying to you know shift their their model and 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 follow this kind of TikTokized approach. And um, I think Web three is is very similar in that way because you know when you when you do introduce this content. You know, there, there, there is, there is this. You do want to create this immersive experience, right, for for the community, and in doing so, the community becomes evangelist for you. You know, so they literally, they, they not only do they want to see it succeed, but they're doing everything in their power to be a part of its success. You know what I mean? So, um, because they benefit from it. You know, the more value that they can help build in the IP, the more they they profit from it as well. Right. So they're just so it's a, it's, a, it's a dope thing to see people who are they just have, you know, that there's some because in some cases there's just a there's just an, a, you know, affinity to the brand. Like there's just a you know, they're just very loyal to the brand and the actual creation. And some of the people actually are a part of the project because they see the long term um, value of it. Right. It's almost like like if you think about. You know some of the cartoons we grew up watching, or even Walt, Walt Disney is probably the best example. Like if somebody took like, like some original drawing that was in a original one of Walt Disney's first animated, you know, films or whatever, that would essentially be an NFT that would be worth, you know, <laughs> millions and millions of dollars, right? So, so I think I think the fact that we're we're being transparent with the community and they can see what we're creating and what the long-term goal is and the process at every step of the way because that's another big part of web3 and community building is being transparent right because because i, I we you know we feel like they don't owe us our, their trust and and you know in this space there's a lot of bad actors right in web3 and there's a lot of people there's a lot of ponzi schemes and people taking advantage of but people running with money rug pulls happening all the time so you know, it's really hard for them to trust anyone that comes in that space, especially if you're new, you know, and you're not native to the space. So I don't think they owe us that. I think we have to build that. And the only way to build that is by being as transparent as possible so they can see, you know, what is what every step that we're making, you know, how we're making them, what the what the what the goals are. And we allow them to even participate in the decisions that we make to move the company forward. Doesn't mean that every decision is going to be good that people come up with, but all of these things are taken into consideration because you know we we we're, we're we're behaving more like an organism versus an organization. The, the goal is to constantly morph and shift according to you know where the people are at the time and what people's needs are, and and thinking about the customer and 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 what they're responding to and what they're not responding to. Um, I'm going on a tangent now, <laughs> but I do because so, because there's many there's many advantages to this kind of approach and that's just a few of them because all of these things are well at least in the hollywood world all of these things equal metrics right and those metrics have value in that in that world so you know now we can come to hollywood with the, with, the, with a lot of metrics that prove you know a lot of what we need to 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 you know to show no they're very very good and i think the idea of being able to build your own narrative and I think conversations and as, as a precursor to other, comp, you know, into being able to, the words not monetize, but more galvanize, uh, you know, a particular community towards a particular set of actions or, or, 
or financial updates or, or kind of spaces from there really was the inherent value add that a lot of Web3 programs were looking to bring into the creative space, right? Yeah, of empowering communities, empowering creators in that sense. I, for one, still believe that is absolutely still the case for Web3. So to your point, a lot of bad actors and a lot of really emboldened bad actors, you know, are able to really name brand their rug pulls a lot more than probably the more typical people are able to. Now, in that sense, though, as a creator, understanding that that relationship now is even more transparent. How do you then approach the way that you create stories? Do you create stories now for your own benefit or do you create stories that would then be something that you might try to more popularize amongst your community? That to say, does that change your the way that you want to create narratives as a creator yourself? Because now you have a DAO, or you have a particular community that you're trying to activate towards a certain goal, or is it still about yourself and your own individual story? Um, well, well, the, the company that we're building is 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 more like a um, an incubator, or or you know, you can think of as more as curators. You know what I mean? So, so yes, there is a there is a I guess a lane, if you want to say, you know, that, that we're in. Um, but it's really about us supporting the, the the vision of the creatives that we work with, right? So I myself, if I create an original original piece of content, right? And um, you know, when I'm create when I'm creating something, I, I am thinking about something that that I truly want to say, something that that resonates with me, right? And and hopefully it also resonates with others. I always, but you always have to start from a pure place. Like it has to, you know, if you're inspired to do art, it's, it's personal, right? Um, now, once, once we put that art out, we put the content out, this is where I think it does become a little bit more of a, uh, you know, it's more of a, um, this is where the community, I think, has a, has a big part in, in, in the direction of the creation. At that point, you know, I, I feel like, seeing how people respond to the content right looking at looking at how because think about it this way right like there's this um i don't know if you heard of this character miku if you heard the the miku. anime anime character huh i said miku in my case yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so so miku, miku is basically like a blank slate right and 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 you know this character allows people to basically you know kind of write you know what i mean write write mm -hmm. their own um you know code so to speak and and i think there's some there's something really fascinating about that you know and i think i think i think there's opportunities to do a little both meaning you know you can you can have a very specific direction that you want to go with the creative but i do feel like you know what you're going to see a lot more of in the future is is once you give birth to this it's almost like a child like yeah you can you know you can you can steer the child where you want to go want it to go but the child is going to be is going to be the development of that child is going to largely depend on on the environment that is in as well, right? So, so I think I think it's it's really dope to get people's input, you know, about the stuff that we're creating and get their thoughts and their ideas, and you and you and you see what people are responding to in real time, right? And 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 you can make shifts and changes accordingly, you know, without necessarily compromising the integrity of what you wanted to say initially. That's the most important thing. You know, and I do, I do believe that our community, obviously, like they're 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 getting behind a project that I created for a reason, right? Not just because they like the project, but because they also believe in me and my ability to deliver deliver this project at a at a, at a high level of quality, right? So you you're not going to have majority of the time you're not going to have people that just want their ideas in it, even if they don't mm -hmm. think it's you, you know what I'm saying. Like they trust they trust me to some degree to deliver my vision. But that doesn't mean that I can't take in consideration other people's thoughts and opinions, you know. So it's 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 not really much different from a writer's room, you know, on a TV show. Like, so you come up with a with an idea, you write a pilot, and when it gets picked up to series, when it goes to series, you know, you put a writer's room together, right? And and when you when you you know the the, the writers they they take a look at the pilot, they take a look at the Bible, and they look at the whole concept in the series, and they start really fleshing this thing out and bringing outside thoughts and opinions to it. And, it, and, and, and usually it ends up taking it to a, a, a whole nother level, you know? Um, so that, that's kind of how, how I'm looking at it. And, and, you know, again, <clears throat> not all the IP that we're going to be creating out of super dope is going to come from me. You know, we're also working with, 
many different artists from all over the world that we truly respect that and some of them are like diamonds in the rough that not a whole lot of people know about or, or they, they may not have a lot of exposure but we want to try to take take you know take those artists and work with them you know um partner with them in order to really build out you know um se several ips in many different verticals and, and and you know like that kind of thing oh, great great thank you and you know having been privileged to see some of this stuff behind the scenes you know i understand and can appreciate it but i think the idea of the the word incubation uh, i think is really the model space of the future for, particularly for creatives i think the idea of looking at what has the amount right of traction and attraction you know from the group that you're looking to serve and being able to at least be empowered to then move it to the next level independently of that traditional model i think is just the way that we'll make things now, whether that'll be automated through AI, again, being able to mm -hmm. invest or track or be transparent through blockchain, uh, being able to invest through DeFi, I think all those will be components of where that goes. But again, I think it goes back to, as you say, that we will have people that we trust and appreciate that still, from a human sense, have that creative narrative to see it through. And obviously, again, you've done that time and time again, but then let's look to the shift of the traditional model of animation. Right. That does have a lot of pieces and components that we, at least in the pandemic, have seen of going to like a physical location and having to make the show with all the people in the space that now we've seen over the past two, two or three years, being able to ro work remote has brought about a surge of animation that now we see that seems to maybe curtailing. I'll let you kind of you know fill in where you feel that is. But yeah. where do you see that of all these innovations that we have? there being an impact in the traditional animation space as far as production and development? Yeah, well, I mean, the process has always been very compartmentalized, right? You know, um, you know, there's many moving pieces to an animation studio and a production. Um, so to be honest, when the pandemic hit, it, it, it didn't shake the animation world up too much because, you know, <laughs> Each one of these artists and animators would probably much rather work at home anyway, you know, mm -hmm. because I, they get tired of me like looking over their shoulder going, hey, man, that's not right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like it's so much it's so much easier to just do it from home in your own little, you know, your own little space. Right. Um, but the other thing is it allows studios and productions to connect with people all over the world. You, you know what I mean? So so I think because um, I, I produced a series um you know, through the pandemic and, and, you know, it turned out, it turned out good, you know, now you do miss that human element, you know, especially when it comes to writer's rooms, that's, that's the part where I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it is important to be in a room with physical people because we share each other's energy, right. And we feed off of each other's energy. And a lot of times if you've been going like 10 hours in a writer's room, but if the energy is high, it doesn't feel like it. You can be on a Zoom for one hour and get drained because <laughs> you know I mean? you're not able to actually like absorb another person's energy. The other thing is sometimes the communication is not always sometimes the communication is energetic. So you like to, you know, you, you got to feel where a person is coming from because like someone could pitch an idea, but the spirit behind the idea can be different from what they're actually saying. But you won't really feel it the same way as if you were in a room. So so those kind of things I think affect a production overall. But in terms of animation production, you know, I do feel like, um, you know, we, we all saw during the pandemic that, uh, I mean, actually animation, the animation business went up during right. the pandemic because so much, so many live action productions got shut down and 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 we proved that it can be done, you know, from, from wherever, you know, virtually anywhere. Um, now, my, my, my theory is that in the very near future, you know, I don't think, <laughs> I really don't think you're going to see too many employees, period. I think you're going to see people who come together to do projects. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, cause if you think about it, if, if you just, just think about where everything is at right now with like Uber and Amazon and all these service providers, right. You know, these are, these are independent contractors or even like, like, uh, what is it? Uh, task rabbit, right. It's so independent contractors, right. Who come together under, under this umbrella or whatever. And they, they, you know, I, I think I think you're going to I think you're going to see more of that in the future to the point where, you know, being an employee is going to be a thing of the past. Like each and every person would be their own. They would be you know entrepreneurs, so to speak, or they would be um, private contractors that Hollywood could hire, assemble a team of, to produce a project. And then they they go their separate ways. And you know what I'm saying? And it's a, it's a 
You know, you know, like like that's that's kind of where I see things moving. You know, mm -hmm. um, so I, I believe that the animation industry was maybe a little bit ahead of that in that, you know, it was already such a compartmentalized, you know, um, service, you know. Okay. That makes sense. And and to your point, I think that's that is going to be the future of work to a component. Right. I think the idea of what individual skills that you can bring to a group you know, for whatever that set amount of time is. And to your point, I think the the classic 30 year old, 30 year was a gold watch. You know, those days, I mean, we're already 10, 15 years away from that. But I think the idea of even to your point of being a full time employee in that space for like a long term period is going to get back to where we are now, which is that gig economy, uh, gig economy state. And again, yeah, I mean, well, if, you, if you think about it, the majority, the majority of the jobs that require. I mean, I mean, look, A.I., you know, AI is capable of doing a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of these for taking, you know, taking a lot of these, these jobs, to be honest, like any, anything that just requires memory, right. If it just requires you, you, you memorizing something or having, or, or, you know, um, you know, or you, if, especially if it's a repetitious task, you know what I'm saying? Like those, those a lot of those jobs, I think are going to be taken, taken by AI anyway. So what you'll see is a lot more people, finding very creative ways to make money, you know, utilizing the tools that we have in technology. Right. And, and, that, and as we do that, you know, I, I do feel like there's not going to be a need for you to be an employee to someone else at a certain point. You, you know what I mean? Because, you know, I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, 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 I mean, there's, there's tons of people that are, you know, that have found ways to make money just on, on their YouTube channel and their TikToks and, you know what I'm saying? Podcast and all, all these, you know, at, at one time that wasn't even you saying you wanted to be a podcaster. I mean, it would sound like the craziest thing, like just a couple of years ago. Like, what does that even mean? But there's people that are actually making real money, you know, but I, I feel like you're going to see a lot more of that as those mm -hmm. jobs start to get taken over by AI. I think you're going to see a lot more people finding like, you know, what I'm saying creative ways to make money. And, and, and it just feels like the natural progression and stuff. Right. Like, like, you know. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's a little, to have another human being, you know, belong to you or work for, you know what I mean? Like that's right. become kind of old, you know, it's kind of like, like we can work together. We bring, we both bring something to the table. We respect what each other does and brings to the table as partners and we complete a task and then we go our separate ways, you know? Absolutely. No, you're right. And, and again, I think in that sense of, you know, what you've been able to build, you know, not only with Martian Blueberry, but the, you know, other forward opportunities is really going to help in our creative space. I think you'll be a pioneer in defining what that new workspace and that new work legacy looks like. That's so another was a note um, about maybe curating the lessons as you build these things along, because that will be like a future of work. Uh, Maybe the textbook of the future of work with uh, with what you and your team may build. So, you know, kind of in close, you know, how can we keep up with you, follow and support you in this space for all that you've done, and and obviously we'll continue to do. Um, well, you can follow me um, on Instagram and Twitter at I am Carl Jones. Uh, you can follow. We have an animation studio called Martian Blueberry um, at We Are Martian B on Instagram, and um, we didn't get to talk about that much, but. Uh, and and uh yeah i mean i think um you know Su super dope is still um we're still in the process the early stages of, of of putting everything together but um that's probably the best way to find me and oh and um bubble goose xyz you know at bubble goose xyz and then uh you know if you if you if you're if you're in the web3 and nfts like you know you just google bubble goose ballers you'll see a lot of information come up and you can uh you know check out the cool stuff we're doing in that space absolutely absolutely and again your that information will be found on our website we'll definitely be shouting out and, and keeping up with the legend Carl jones and again just appreciate you and the uh the chance to connect and collaborate and uh, into the things in the future man so thank you so very much i appreciate you awesome man i appreciate you too thank you uh, well, thank you now take care peace all right peace. absolutely so again the you know do, a double dose of legends here for us in the uh creative space here with Dejan Sneed here and soon speaking with uh, the legendary creator, animator, and business person, Carl Jones, and preceded by amazing writer and producer, amazing writer and producer, Rodney Barnes. So, 
Again, we're right here at the top of the hour with four o'clock at Atlanta, coming call, calling from Subsume Studios here in Atlanta, Georgia. So Subsume being the intersection of creativity, technology, and community, where we want to be the sustainable space for the creative energy and futures that we all can be a part of. And so with that, on the other end of this, we have a, an amazing group of about 10 to 12 vendors that are here for our Speculative Black Book Fair. So if you're in the greater Atlanta area, we got two more hours of that amazing programming uh, to be here in the space and place. So with that, let's take a look at what we have up next. And so we've been kind of running in a, in a good way um, for a lot of these programs to say, you know, where are we seeing the future of animation, the future of story, the future of Web3? But at the same time, we also see that when we talk about the future, there has to be an appreciation of the present and a way that the thing that we keep coming back to, particularly here for Black Futures, is that the human element is something that cannot be outsourced. And I really feel like a lot of times for us being futurists, we always want to look ahead. And as we should, right? Because we need to know where we're going. But I think an awareness of where we are. And a lot of times that's precluded by knowing where we just came from. So the idea of Black History Month being something that we can look at in an appreciation of the civil rights, but also in spaces of creativity, of innovation, of education, of policy, being a great template for us to continue to build, but really try to also continue to build forward. And so I want to take a look and see where we are. So we'll be right back in just one moment as we continue the programming and continue to fund. And we thank you so very much for being a part of us and making sure to stay tuned and stay included for more. Thank you.
Thank you all so very much, and welcome back to Black Futures 2023. So this is Dejan Sneed again with Subsume Media here in Atlanta, Georgia, with our Subsume family of friends that is here to celebrate year four of Black Futures 2023. So of course, for Subsume, we are the intersection of creativity, technology, and community, and looking at how we can showcase the Black future of innovation and the stories of today, which will be the legacies that we all build in our shared futures of tomorrow. And so to that, I am absolutely thrilled to bring on a group of creatives, uh, actually a, a team here that's actually a lot more local than I would have thought here in the great Atlanta space. The idea of being able to see imagery and artistry captured through the lens of two talented creators. And so how can we see and learn how to build the images that'll be showcasing the black excellence of tomorrow, particularly as we look at it from the lens and perspective of our greatest asset, our children. And so I want to bring together and to the stage here, creative soul photography of Karan Hi. and Regis. How much did I get? Was the name fair? Close? You did, you did. You did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you all so very much. Uh, you know, as a, a creator, frankly, as a fan, it's a pleasure uh, to bring you both in and you know, behind you all the so art. Thank you for having and, us. Thank you all both so very much. And behind all the artistry and the magic, you know, wanted to just showcase that we have the excellence and the availability to to really showcase you know, you, what you do so well. And I don't want to over talk it. So let me please just give you all uh, the stage for a moment to give yourself and, and our audience uh, a chance to know you in the proper bona fides of your, of your legacy work. Sure. Thank you so much for having us. We are excited to be here um, to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we do and why we do what we do. Uh, so I'm, uh, as you mentioned, I'm Karin and this is Reg. <laughs> um, we are the husband and wife duo of Creative Soul Photography. Um, this is actually our 14th year uh, in business. <laughs> so it's been quite a while. Um, we are, uh, we like to say that we are more than just photographers. We try to use our platform as a way to um, really challenge the negative stereotypes of um, you know, people of color in the media, and especially when it comes to our youth, um, with in showcase a different narrative than what's currently being shown. Um, so a little bit of background about us and how we got started. We were um, like a lot of photographers in the beginning, we were shooting um, a little bit of everything, really anything people would pay us for, right? So families, weddings, babies, uh, you name it. <laughs> we probably photograph your dog if you <laughs> asked us to <laughs> back then. <laughs> and um, I was still working in corporate America at the time. And, you know, we got kind of got to the point after doing that a few years of thinking like, wow, if we're going to build our own business, why are we going to build a business that we hate, right? <laughs> like we would uh, show up to a wedding and photograph it and actually absolutely hate it, right? Like Reg is uh, pretty shy and like, <laughs> and he would be like sweating like at these weddings, right? Like <laughs> just, you know, just absolutely hated. Um, and we knew that we had a passion for photographing kids, uh, but um, we just um, didn't know that we could make a living at the time from doing that. Um, and so we really just kind of started there. We started, um, you know, really just taking our friends, kids and, you know, my old college buddies, uh, kids and doing uh, different creative concepts with them um, and decided to get into the kids fashion industry. So if you're not familiar with the kids fashion industry, that's photographing child models and actors and, um, you know, um, clothing lines kid, for kids, fashion designers, uh, things of that nature, because we thought that we could be a little bit more creative there. Um, and we got into the industry at the time, we realized number one, it, was, it wasn't very diverse. Um, and two, a lot of the kids that had natural hair, natural Afro hair, the parents would come in to get their headshots and they would have the kids' hair straightened before they came in to get their hair there. Like almost every time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so <laughs> we thought about it. And we're like, wow, we're really teaching these kids at an early age that they're not good enough, right? That their the hair is not good enough, that their look is not acceptable enough. And in order for them to, you know, kind of be in this um this community, they had to, you know, change their look in order to to get there. Um and uh, we just really decided to take it upon ourselves to do a couple of personal projects, uh, really just showcasing black kids looking fashionable uh, with their natural hair, right? <laughs> um, and really just showcasing something that was a little different than what was being shown. Um, to be honest, at the time, it was still fairly difficult. Uh, a lot of the kids' fashion magazines didn't really 
understand what we were doing. You know, um, they wanted us to use certain designers or, you know, certain things or showcase certain things. And, you know, we just felt like there was this whole other side, this whole other narrative that was being left out. Um, and so ultimately we really had to just step out on faith, step out on our own. Um, and that's exactly what we did. So we kind of stepped out on our own, moved away from that industry um, and really just started building a business from the ground up that was um, our authentic voice, something that we wanted to, you know, photograph the subjects that we wanted to photograph in the style that we wanted to photograph it. Um, and really just kind of had to step out on faith and think about and, you know, hope that people would, um, you know, uh, would enjoy it. Right. <laughs> um, so that's literally what we did. We, um, did a couple of personal shoots around 2013. Um, and, uh, one was a, um, roller skate girl shoot that we did. Uh, and it was literally, we had no team. We had nothing. It was literally just three little girls with, um, roller skates. Reg, I think you, um, spray painted the roller skates from like some, found, found some pop roller skates from old <laughs> from eBay, right? <laughs> it was like some there you old go. That is good. Skates. That's how it works. And he spray painted those. Um, and um, we literally that one shoot, um, you know, kind of transformed our business. We went, we were still fairly new on social media, and uh, we went from about 2,000 followers to about 20,000 in less than a month, right? Um, just from that one personal shoot. And so, we continued to do that a little bit more, um, and that's really how we started our signature style. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, so we were doing that for a while. A lot of our work at the time was really with groups of kids. Um, it was really just showcasing, you know, we were capturing um, our, really our childhood memories. So, you know, we did, um, you know, the roller skate girl shoot. We did a vintage uh, shoot at Spelman College oh, wow. um, up to Harlem and did a Harlem girl shoot, really just showcasing like three little girls with afros just kind of, you know, hanging out in Harlem, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we really were just, um, you know, kind of taking things back from our childhood and bringing it into our work. Um, so then around 2017 is when uh, we decided to move in studio. As artists, we get bored really easy. <laughs> you guys can probably relate to that, right? <laughs> um, and so we thought, you know, we wanted to switch up our style a little bit. We wanted to move in studio. Um, but we thought um, if we did that, we thought we were going to be really bored, right? Because when you think about studio work, you just think about just a plain backdrop and, you know, they're just standing there. <laughs> um, we just thought that we were going to be really bored. And so we said, if we're going to do studio work, we're going to kind of have to develop our own style there as well. Um, and so uh, Reg really started to, um, you know, just create different uh, wardrobe pieces. Uh, we really were just modifying existing pieces like you know, not that we were designers or anything like that, but we you were. Know how we do. Yeah, <laughs> we find make it work, work, right? We got to work with what we got. Yes, yeah, so we got to <laughs> find a way to make absolutely. one, right? And so yes. that's literally what we started to do. Um, and we started to travel all throughout the country, um, and we were going to different cities. And each time we would um, go to a different city, we would have a different theme. So parents would book sessions with, with us. Um, and we would say, all right, we're going to New York and the theme is Afrofuturism or the theme is, you know, it might be based on a color. It could be anything. Um, and we would um, style all the kids according to the, the theme. And then we would do those shoots. So we did that for about a year. Um, and after that year, a blogger had asked if she could uh, share our series. And um, she shared that series. And literally about three days later, the shoot, everything went viral. Uh, and so, um, you know, it was insane at the time. It was literally, we had CNN, uh, BBC News, uh, you know, Teen Vogue, everyone was asking to feature, you know, the series. Um, and, you know, that really gave us kind of a bigger platform to be able to share our work. Um, that's when we ended up getting the book deal from St. Martin's Press for our Glory book. Um, and so in that book, we were really able to continue the conversations around, um, you know, just our Afro art series. So the Afro art series began really as a um, showcase of the beauty and versatility of Afro hair. We wanted to just showcase all the cool things you could do with Afro hair. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we got to our glory book, um, one of the things that we were able to do was really tell the stories behind some of the kids that we were photographing, right? Like mm -hmm. we were, you know, um, you guys know there's a, a lot of negative negative stereotypes of black youth in the media and we felt like when we were meeting these kids we were seeing a different story right like we were meeting we you know in our glory book 
there's a little girl who is an eight-year-old neuroscience expert, right, who understands mm -hmm. college-level neuroscience at the age of eight. <laughs> um, and those are the stories that were not being told and not being seen in the media, right? And so I love that we were able to um, you know, give those kids a platform, a global pl platform for them to be now on the coffee tables in homes worldwide, right? Um, and for people to be able to see those stories. And so I think ultimately, you know, that's kind of at the core of what we are now trying to do. You know, we are trying to leverage our platform to, um, you know, extend it to these kids um, so that people are now understanding that, you know, there's so much variety in, um, you know, in our youth, right? And there's so many different things that they're doing. And these are, you know, some of the the cool and important things that that they're doing. Um, so that's kind of where we are. We've been, you know, like I said, at this, we've transformed and retransformed our business uh, many times. We recently just collaborated with Disney um, and we are super excited about that. We um, launched our um, Disney Princess doll line. Um, and so literally Disney came to us and said, you know, they would love to um, do a doll line based off of our photos. Mm -hmm. And so we were commissioned to take the photos um, and then they developed um, kind of a reimagining <laughs> of uh, four princesses uh, based off of our photos. And so, um, again, we're just excited to, you know, see all of the different ways that, you know, now and in the future, we can um, really just highlight our, our youth and empower them um, using our art. Hopefully that, that was good enough. To <laughs> no, that. Fantastic and, yeah. and, and well received. And, and, and Reg, if you have anything else to compliment, by all means, I want to let it keep it open. But you know, that's absolutely just brilliant. And uh, it, it comes across in not only the, the works that we obviously have seen currently, but it, mm -hmm. you know, as a fan, and again, I think as a community, we've been able to see that's absolutely a necessity for what we need. So the brilliance, I think, it comes from the need and necessity of right. us being able to see ourselves, particularly our youth, right. you know, in an optimistic and, and vibrant way. And mm -hmm. so that's where I feel like you're seeing, and well deservedly so, you know, a lot of the, the praise and support around your around your work. So thank to you. that, I don't thank you. You know, and one thing that is striking in the imagery, obviously, is the creativity. And you, mm -hmm. you spoke to a moment this a moment ago. Mm -hmm. is the imagery of black hair, right? The idea, of, and I'm thinking when you were speaking about like the Crown Act, right? right that we literally have to pass legislation yes. <laughs> to exist as it does yes. Yes. in our space. And right. we know that that's been, you know, something that just, just in our in our time of media and even prior, that is a, a space of, of opportunity to be a, as a space of, for the stage and for others. But it's so integral to our culture and our space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but when I look at the imagery that you all take, you take such fine care and 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 just uh, and imagination around that. Can you maybe elaborate a bit more in the sure. idea and of of black hair and and just how you how you approach it from sure. an artist and, and just from a you know and just from a cultural standpoint? Right, that's so important. And as you know, you know our our hair is our crown, right? right. Um, in the black community, it is front and center. You you can't uh, avoid that subject, right? right. Um, and you know, for me growing up, um, it was you know like many people, it was a struggle, right? Like we, I was my hair was relaxed at the age of six, right? So mm -hmm. I never really knew my own natural hair until I was well into my twenties, right? I had to learn how to rediscover it um, and relearn it for myself. Um, you know, hopefully the youth today, they're, um, they're starting from a better starting point than we are, <laughs> but there's still so many, we get so many uh, parents that come in that say, you know, my kid, um, you know, she doesn't understand why her hair has to be like this. Why can't her hair be like Elsa, right? Or, you know, <laughs> um, she, why can't her hair be straight and blonde? You know, she, you know, there's still so many different complexities around that. Um, and, you know, I feel like through our art, one of the ways that we're able to do that is to, um, you know, every time we do a shoot, we try to think about it in the terms of something that would be really cool for kids, right? <laughs> so it doesn't matter what we're doing, whether we're talking about hair or whether we're talking about a complex topic, you really kind of have to break it down and make it something that's, you know, kind of cool for kids and for them to feel like, you know, oh, wow, you know, how can I do this, right? Because then it opens up the conversations and then they're able to see themselves, um, you know, in this light. Um, and so really that's kind of, 
how we've started to shift those conversations. We started by really just showcasing kids looking really cool, really fashionable with natural hair. Um, and it, you know, makes them, it makes it trendy for them, right? It makes them interested and makes them want to embrace their own natural hair and curls. So um, that's really what we're trying to do. Because like your, your hair is the outlet to all, all of these other insecurities, especially with children. So right. it starts it's, there. Yeah, <laughs> so it's definitely very important to tackle that subject first. Because, you know, you can't do nothing about our skin tone. So they try to move on to the next thing, right. which is like their hair, you know, right. as far as parents go. Right. And they start to try to manipulate it. And, yeah. you know, we've all been through there, through the struggles of trying to, you know, <laughs> to it's, look a certain way. <laughs> it's real sad that it, it has to happen in your own home where you should be safe. You know what I mean? Your parents try to straighten your hair and make you fit into a... a a certain standard of beauty, you know? Right, I mean? right. So yeah, that's really what we've been trying to do. We've, uh, you know, when we started out, we were obviously, you know, photographing, you know, kids with afros and, you know, just kind of um, simple styles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I wanted to show was that, you know, there's so much beauty and versatility in afro hair. And really, I think that's the magic of it, right? Because there's so many different things that we can do with afro hair that no one else can do, right? <laughs> um, and so that's really why we try to push our art to the limits because we want people to see like, gosh, look at how many cool and amazing things we can do with Afro hair. Um, you know, I want people to really feel, and kids to really feel empowered by that, right? To feel like, wow, like my hair can do all of this, you know? <laughs> um, and so that's really, you know, the reason why we do what we do around, um, you know, natural hair. You know, it's it's just such a an integral part, likewise, as you say, is you know not only of our biology but but of our culture and our space. And right. we see, I think now like generation generationally that we're shifting into a much more of that appreciative mm -hmm. um, right. opportunity, like you say, like yes. as the challenging nor normalities or what we may consider as normalities of, of standardized beauty um, right. in the century for just kind of traditional level set. And mm -hmm. I know that works like yours are really leading it forefront. Um, right. I'm always curious to the parents or the people that come in and, and bring their children, mm -hmm. you know, as far as setting up and, and being a part of that. Yes. Um, what's well, been some of the responses and, and being able to see their, you know, their yeah. children? And, uh, and their yes. Oh, here. my gosh. <laughs> um, well, one, let me just kind of talk briefly about, you know, um, how it works, because a lot of people see our work and they automatically think, that all the kids on our page are models, right? right, right. <laughs> um, and I say, no, we're just turning them into models, right? <laughs> uh, they're a model for the day. Um, so literally most of our work is really just everyday kids, right? Parents say, I want uh, really cool photos of my kids like this. I want for them to experience this. I want for them to be empowered by this session. Um, and so they book a session with us. Um, we send out a questionnaire and we say, um, you know, if your child could have the shoot of their dreams, what would it be, right? And so literally we serve as dream makers for these kids. You know, we get lots of different things. <laughs> we get lots of different uh, requests. Uh, Reg usually starts sweating after that, right? Because he has to actually make it happen. <laughs> these are kids, man. Right? You're talking about their imagination. Not my yeah. <laughs> and he's like, I don't want to let them down, you know? <laughs> right. But yeah, so we literally serve as dream makers for them. Um, so they come in and I tell people our studio is kind of like a creative factory, right? Like, um, you, get, you know, they have the hairstyling, the makeup, they have the wardrobe. Um, and then we do the shoot and it's literally just us really creating there on set. Um, you know, my team has been uh, kind of in place for a few years now. So they kind of get our style and what we're looking for. And so literally I can say to my hairstylist, Shauna, like, hey, I need a fairy tale lion. And she knows what I'm talking about. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I usually don't dictate to them. All right. This is exactly how I want this particular hairstyle or this is how I want the makeup done or whatever, um, you know, we usually are just um, letting all of the creatives come together in our own spaces and create freely. And I think, um, you know, that's a little bit of the magic that happens on set um, because we are just really all creating based off of, you know, the feeling and the vibe that we're getting from the child. Um, and the, the kids afterwards, the, the best part for us is you know, them feeling a little bit more empowered when they walk out. You know, a lot of times they come in and they may be a little bit unsure. And, you know, to be honest, most times the parents are probably more excited uh, <laughs> about the session than the child. So the child is like, they have no idea what's about to happen. Um, and afterwards, you know, they 
are walking away feeling a bit more empowered. They're going to school and they're telling all their teachers and their friends yeah. and they're showing off the pictures, you know, and um, so it really is just an experience for them. You know, we've had um, a one parent um, told me once, she said, uh, we did a session with her boys and um, she said, you know, the boys are usually definitely a little bit difficult, more difficult to bring in because they're like, we're doing what, right? <laughs> and so she's like, you just don't understand. I literally had to drag my boys in to do this, but I knew it was going to be important and I wanted them to have this experience. And afterwards, they couldn't stop talking about it, right? And she said, you know, I feel like our black boys need and need need a time for them to um, just really be celebrated. You know, they needed this these couple of hours to celebrate themselves um, and to celebrate and you know be um, be empowered by this. And you know, she said, you know, after the session, they were already talking about when they can do it again, right? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's just you know, for us, that's the rewarding part of working with kids is that you get to see that transformation of them, and hopefully, you know, with a lot of them, um, you know, trans transform, um, you know, their way of thinking and, you know, thinking about themselves and empowering them to um, feel a little bit more self-confident. I said, that's like the one selfish thing about our job is that it's, it's just that experience. Like, I think if we couldn't get paid from this, we would still keep doing it. Right. <laughs> just because it's so rewarding for us to be able to do that. <laughs> no, that's amazing. And, and to that point is being able to change that internal narrative. Uh, right. is so It's so important. And that's where we just see again, the importance of, of this work. And so I want to speak to more of more of the contemporary thing. Of course, you mentioned the uh, the collaboration with uh, Disney between mm -hmm. Grand Soul and reimagining, I think, four of their um, four of their characters, right? right. That's something we'll have and we'll talk to some things here shortly, but mm -hmm. I'd love to give some space to talk about your newest work, which I understand is Crown. Yes. Oh my and goodness. <laughs> kind of just give a space there to kind of talk about what is Crown as a book and yes. how did it come about and, and please. Uh, sure. So we are so excited about Crown. We are, uh, gosh, it comes out. So June 13th is the date. Um, it is the actual, it's the follow up to our coffee table book, Glory. Um, and so it's been a couple of years now since Glory was out. We were super excited about that. And now um, Crowned is literally our um, fairy tales book. So, um, you know, the first chapter is actually a take on existing fairy tales, like the ones that we've known, like Cinderella Snow White. Um, but then my the most important, I think, <laughs> um, are the next two chapters, which are, um, um, our take on um, African folklore stories, um, because I felt like our kids have no idea about African folklore. Like we never read that in school, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't know about African and African American folklore. And so we got to do our take on African and African American folklore stories. And then in the third chapter, we actually got to create new fairy tales of our own. So um, it was really just us trying to figure out, all right, if we were able to create our own, what would we do? Um, and so we have you know, a princess with no hair. We have like a cowboy shoot. We have a Candyland shoot. Like, you know, it is insane. I'm so excited about this book. Um, it's a little, it's, you know, similar to our, um, the style that we did for the Glory book, um, but it is much more graphical, much more visual. We um, really, um, we integrated um, um, like uh digital art a lot more uh, with this book so that we can kind of tell the story. So it really puts you there in the scene. Um, and, you know, whereas with the um, Glory book, it was really more around the kids. These are actual stories. Um, and so we were able to get, you know, four to six pictures in um, for each story, as opposed to, you know, the one picture for each story um, in Glory. So we were just super excited mm -hmm. about being able to extend what we were already doing and, um, really just opening up to tell more stories um, and, you know, um, really just be more imaginative with this book. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're super excited. <laughs> Even for like the, uh, the current stories, like we had our own spin on all the, on those as well. Right. I said, I'm so excited to see uh, y'all reaction to those. Right. Like our, our Cinderella has a low rider bike and a Timberland boot. Okay. <laughs> that sounds awesome. So yeah, we really got to, um, you know, and I loved, um, you know, our family at St. Martin's Press, they are um, always, um, you know, really just open to whatever we want to do, right? <laughs> Which is major for um, a publisher and for an editor. Like that's rare that you get that opportunity, but um, you know, we have someone that really, you know, trusts what we do. And you know, if we say we want to put Cinderella on the lowrider bike, they're down. Right. You know, <laughs> oh, 
they never filtered, uh, they never filtered our right work. right so yeah oh, we are definitely yeah. grateful for that fantastic fantastic and again so that'll be june june um, 13th yes so we're super absolutely. excited about that and for our atlanta folks we're actually planning uh some really cool launch activities so uh definitely you know stay connected with us on social because uh we have some some exciting announcements coming out about uh, launch uh, for that book. So, fantastic, fantastic, mm -hmm. right? And so, with that, I want to just kind of take a moment to close as far as to think of your own shared futures of where you see Creative Soul and and the space and perspectives of imagery. So, what's next for you as far as the and your ideas and, and your wildest dreams that you're able to craft craft your your mm -hmm. legacies. Yeah. So like I said, I think, you know, we kind of started as photographers and we are kind of morphing this business into more of an empowerment brand for kids of color, right? For our youth. And so, you know, we're looking at how do we extend beyond the photography? I think you guys got a preview with the dolls um, and we're already thinking about what can we do? Like, so we're getting, you know, lots of people asking about action figures and they're asking about, you know, other things. Um, we've already kind of started in the past, um, you know, moving it to, um, um, uh, gosh, our um, school supplies. <laughs> um, and so we're looking at, you know, what other things can we do? We're also looking at, um, you know, TV and media, you know, what can we do there with um, extending our art? So I think there are so many different things that we want to do, what we're dreaming about. Um, you know, we're just kind of working to make all those things happen. So we're super excited to see, you know, where we go in the future. Oh, absolutely. And I know in our shared future, I'm excited for some some spaces that we'll obviously share during this and some mm -hmm. things forward. But you know, we just want to just thank you all so very much, both of oh, you. Thank and, you. <laughs> just providing such a uh, a refreshing perspective, not only in just their in, in the traditional space, but I think in the spaces where we see like a, a shared future. And so thank you both. And again, just thank last you for question. having us. Oh, the pleasure is absolutely <laughs> ours. Again, much more to come, as we know, but you yes. know, is how can those, um, how can we all follow you and continue to support you? Yes. Yeah, so feel free to follow us on social media at Creative Soul Photo um, and on our website at creativesoulphoto.com. Absolutely. And thank you so very much. And of course, all of that information as well as a, a special endeavor that we'll share during Black Futures uh, will be uh, following this up. So I want to just thank you both so very much for your time and talents. And again, uh, we have... Karen and Regis Pentecourt of Creative Soul Photography and more that is coming forward and again, helping us stay included in our shared future. So thank you all so very much. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. you so much for having us. All right. Thank y'all. And with that, again, we thank you so very much for being a continued part of our conversation and show here with Black Futures 2023 with us here at Subsume. And as a reminder, Subsume is the intersection of creativity, technology, and community, where we love to be a platform to showcase the shared futures of us all through the perspective of Afrofuturism in action. So with that, we thank you all. Stay tuned and stay included for more. And thank you all so very much for continuing to be part and the best part, actually, of Black Futures Month 2023. This is Dejan Sneed here with Subsume. And again, a pleasure to have you all with us. Subsume, of course, being the intersection of creativity, technology, and community, where we want to build a platform that shows that everyone can be included in the shared tomorrows and also be right, the, be right where they are in the spaces of their dreams. So with that, I want to get right into our next fantastic guest, uh, who we'd love to bring to the stage, uh, Ms. Jamie Broadnax, of CEO, founder of Black Girl Nerds. Hi. Hey, a pleasure, a pleasure. Thank you so very much. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Oh, great, great. No complaints. So thank you so very much. Always uh, a pleasure to connect with you. I want to just uh, get a chance, of course, with this particular panel to talk about your particular space of your particular expertise, but also something that for our creative spaces, we always need. And that's best how to communicate our narrative and our stories, you know, with larger communities and finding our and and founding what we're 
excited about to be shared with others. And so with that, I'd love for you just to, if we may, just have you introduce yourself and we'll love to kind of get right into it. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I think you're putting on a great, great series for everybody to check out. Uh, so my name is Jamie Broadnax. I'm the founder and CEO of Black Girl Nerds. Black Girl Nerds is an online digital publication and uh, blackgirlnerds.com is the site where you can see that content. Uh, but outside of that, we're also a weekly podcast and we have a YouTube channel where we have a lot of video content. We interview a lot of great content creators and people in the uh Hollywood industry, if you will. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I've been running the publication now uh, for about 11 years. So just celebrated our 11th anniversary on the first of this month. Yeah. Oh, 11 years. Congratulations, first and foremost. And, and you. You know, that, that just goes to speak to the legacy that Black Girl Nerds, not only for, you know, that space of, of geek culture, but I think in, contempor in a larger space of just shared culture, where we look to kind of find ourselves finding interest in the same spaces, but a lot of times not finding that inclusion in our voices and in the things that we bring to galvanize and bolster, you know, our larger spaces of creativity. And so yeah. you've been uh, absolutely a, a pioneer in the space, particularly in our, in our digital age of being able to find your community and find your fandoms and be able to bring them in and make them feel included. And so, and we assume, acknowledge and appreciate that that legacy. And again, you know, 11 years, congratulations. So with that, kind of just right into it, what are some of the, the things that when you look to identify for other brands and for your own brands of how best to communicate with, I don't, don't want to use the word customer, but I want to, I feel like we're all shared communities in this sense. So when you're looking at trying to bridge your story um, with another audience, what are some things that you feel are great precursors to a healthy relationship and being able to do that? Yeah, it's always funny to, you know, get these kind of questions because when I first started out with Black Girl Nerds, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and um, and to this day, there's still areas that I still am navigating through and, and challenges and opportunities that uh, I'm, I'm still tackling. But, um, I, you know, I think for me, when I first started the Twitter account specifically, I was running my Black Girl Nerds Twitter account like it was my personal account, mm -hmm. not really separating, you know, church and state. So uh, a lot of the things that I would tweet out were just like my personal opinions and uh, my interests in different fandoms. And then the live tweeting phenomenon happened. Um, and uh, once I started doing that, not really knowing it, I was slowly building a community that way. And when I would engage with people, it wouldn't be for the purposes of, okay, come to my website or listen to my podcast. I wasn't using it as a marketing gimmick. I was just organically growing a community. Keep in mind, me not realizing this at the time, but I was organically growing a communi community by just having conversations online, just talking about you know, the latest hot topics of the day and live tweeting shows, giving my hot takes. A lot of the things that people still do on Twitter, but they use their personal account. And I was using my my uh, Black Girl Nerds account, but that was what allowed the Twitter account to grow such a, a huge following over a, a relatively short period of time. Um, and then I also, and again, I didn't realize this, I was amplifying other people's voices by retweeting them and liking their tweets and that engagement that you know authentic organic engagement um allowed other people to be visible and seen with this account that had thousands of followers um and that even brought more followers because i'm sure they were like oh wow maybe she'll retweet me or something like that um so yeah that that was ultimately what helped me grow the platform was using twitter as a conduit um to to build what we have today Great. You use a, a great phrase, of course, authentic relationships, right? The idea is even though things are digital and we've been speaking about that today for some spaces of Web3, spaces of animation and other components that we seem to sometimes forget that it is a relationship, right? The idea right. of like how we connect with people, how we want people to see us and, and vice versa. So now with that, you know, you, you said that you're able to build that organically. 
do you think there's anything that was a i guess to say a template or a uh the word is not template i think is there anything that was a catalyst is probably a little better way to say that you can identify now that maybe at that time you didn't see was it the fact of hey you just made a space that was available is it because you maybe had some of your more personal you know conversations that made it feel more approachable than say a brand account which it is you know which we may look at it as now is there anything in reflection that you may think was was a part of of that rapid growth and uh and long-term success um i think it was probably many things and you kind of mentioned them there as far as like um you know having that organic growth by being authentic and having those conversations with people in my community um also fulfilling a need at the time i started black girl nerds which was in 2012 uh, there weren't a lot of blurred black nerd outlets out there. Uh, so, you know, you know, and, and the reason why I created Black Girl Nerds is because I typed in Black Girl Nerds and nothing came up. So for black women and women of color that wanted to find a space that reflected ideals, philosophies, intersections of geek culture that represented them, they would look to either the Twitter page for, you know, mm. fodder, internet fodder, or, um, or to the website for content um, to get that. So I, I think it's a combination of a lot of things of just fulfilling a need, uh, engaging with the audience. I think live tweeting TV shows played a lot into that because that's where I would spend uh, a lot of my time online and using those hashtags that would help you know, people to find Black Girl Nerds and, and find using these community hashtags to find each other. And we would engage by watching these shows. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that uh, had a great deal to do with it as well. Um, so, yeah. Great. No, I appreciate that. And a great answer. Now to that, about the idea of finding communities and, and voices, of course, you also have a, a voice, you know, in in the Hollywood space of being a, a critic in a sense of, of being able to review a lot of things that we in contemporary culture see and, and have our own opinions and things about. Now, where do you see maybe in that space where building an audience and building a voice is an advantage or an opportunity in, in larger IPs or brands, or do they even consider that as they create projects? Hmm. So how to build an audience from like reviewing Hollywood movies? Yes. Um, well, I think I think for me, you know, I've I've been a fan of of movies and TV shows for quite some time, and uh, even at the beginning of when I started the Black Girl Nerds Twitter account, like I said, I would live tweet TV shows. I'd give my hot takes on Twitter about my opinions on movies and films. Um, and even prior to creating Black Girl Nerds, I had a movie blog that I would you know, do movie reviews on. So, and I went to school for film. So I, I have a, a background in it. Um, but I I think for me is just being consistent with creating content in that space. And also I wasn't creating the content because I was trying to monetize or advertise something. It, it was just for the purposes of number one, I'm a movie geek and it was something I really knew how to do as far as writing goes. Um, because me as a writer at the time starting black girl nerds, I kind of didn't know what to write about, but I'm like, Oh, well I've always written about movies. So that sort of was like my gateway there, but yeah, being consistent with that. And then eventually by building the audience, which was through Twitter mm -hmm. um, and also through other social media you know, I don't want to give Twitter all the credit, but <laughs> through other social media networks um, and also our website as it grew and grew, uh, studios and networks uh, and publicists who basically stay on these social media networks trying to find the next thing to help build up their clients. Um, they saw that they, they, they saw and recognized and they saw this brand that spoke to a specific demographic and that was appealing. So I think that's where uh, the intersection of Hollywood started to come into the space that I created and allowed us these really great opportunities that we still have to this day, which I'm so grateful for because it it allows our publication to remain sustainable and the fact that we can report 
you know, first look reviews on big Marvel movies when they come out. We can talk to the talent that's involved in those movies. Uh, we can review books that haven't been published yet, um, review TV shows that haven't come out yet. So it's it's good to have that kind of access because that allows us to, you know, be very authentic as a uh, reputable online media publication. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, as we see a lot of creators always looking at, you know, those ways and spaces to engage. I know we, again, to your point, not to get Twitter all of the credit. <laughs> I think the idea of, you know, there's so many spaces now that we can put our voices into, that we can lend um, or find communities in. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of everything being digital right now seems to also be in contrast of our need, particularly in the pandemic when it was taken away, of being mm -hmm. able to meet in physical spaces. Is that a, a component at all in, in considering of like how do you engage or how do you build communities? Because of course we, we, we all want to have a global audience a lot of times when we think of how we want our artwork or how we want our narratives to be taken. But is there evaluation in just working in your local community or in that space to then look to build out your story or build out your audience? And I would say, I say that to say the local audience, because a lot of times we all look at the big thing for followers, but the idea of like a small communities in that micro community space, is there evaluation in, in just working with the people who can work with you? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when it comes to building your brand and building your business. If you can find people locally that can help you, um, whether you are working out of a brick and mortar location um, and you need someone there to assist you in that capacity, then that definitely has value. I, I'll be honest and transparent with you by saying I, I don't have experience with uh, local community support because I've always run Black Girl Nerds as an online entity. Mm -hmm. So um, all of our writers, our editors, our video journalists, um, people that help with our social media, everybody that's involved with uh, creating content for our company is all online based. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in that aspect, if you feel discouraged by saying, oh, wow, I can't afford to drive out to this region or go somewhere or fly out here to go to this location to build, uh, you know, whatever business it is that you want to create, you can do it online and online is free. <laughs> and and it, and I think the pandemic obviously taught us all that you can literally build a business within the confines of your own home and and it can be something that can turn into be turn out to be very successful for you. Fantastic. Yeah, and and with that, I think we really do need to understand that it is quality over quantity for a lot of these things when we talk about how we build within those spaces, again, to your point, being able to build from home and have a sustainable and thriving business um, without the traditional brick and mortar, but at the same time, finding valuation in, in the people that you can communicate with and, you know, with all these current mediums. So now thank you for that point. And that's now a great, another great example. So now we talk about the idea of black futures and the idea of like, where do we see communities being impactful and empowered into a future? Now, well, there's several different ways we could steer this conversation, but I'd love for you to give us your take as far as the future of community building, particularly for black stories or for underrepresented spaces. Or do you see any type of you know opportunities right now that maybe are being missed? Um, or is there advantages that now you see being able to take full advantage of really can continue to move the the legacy, the the legacy and model of Black girl nerds ahead to spaces where you want, would you like to see? Well, I mean, I, I think when I think of like community and 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 you know and building out of that, I think of support, and support is the key. I, I go back to sort of the controversy that's happened recently with the Oscars that's coming up and the nomination of Andrea Riseborough as Best Actress. Um, and even though a lot of people were upset that, you know, two black actresses potentially were kicked out of the, the running because of that, um, she galvanized a small grassroots community of supporters to help her garner that nomination. So if we as black folks can do that for each other, then we can be able to get ourselves into spaces that are, are challenging and difficult and that are 
gate kept by big studios in this case with the oscars that are gate kept by uh entities that are usually very difficult and challenging to get into so i think support is the number one thing i mean it's it's definitely something that is important to me um whenever people reach out to me for black girl nerds um whether they're a comic book creator whether they're an independent filmmaker um i'm always willing to hear them out and see how can we you know get you on our platform whether it's in the form of an interview or a press release story something of that capacity because at the end of the day i i definitely want to use my site as a conduit for um allowing marginalized voices to be heard and to be seen and represented uh so i feel like sometimes there's a little bit of a misnomer out there about black girl nerds that were like sort of in the Hollywood space and that we only profile, you know, celebrities and that's far from the case. So, you know, I'll just put it out there now. Like if you are independent and you are someone who doesn't have a large audience or maybe you do have like a significant audience, but you want to grow that, um, I'm always happy to help platform um, independent artists because uh, I know what it's like to be in that space. I know what it's like to struggle, <laughs> you know, as someone that um, is an independent artist um, at one point. And uh, I definitely want to pay it forward with the privilege and the access that I have um, and use my platform to do that. Uh, but yeah, the key, the key word in all of this sort of, I know I took the scenic route to your question with my answer, but Love I think that the key word is like support. We just have to support each other. Um, and even when things don't pan out the way we expect them to just like still find ways to support, um, our community. Cause we're, we're all we have. So, um, you know, together we stand divided, we fall. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think we have to look at that space of support as an actionable verb that, that has to be repeated time and time again, you know, for uh, for us to be able to see the, the true results and sustainable spaces we want to see. And so, I mean, I think that's just simply, you know, cannot be understated. That I think the idea of support and again, the support doesn't always have to be financial. I know for a lot of startups and, and spaces yeah. that absolutely is a part of that equation. But I think the idea of support of, of ideas and, and support of opportunities and frankly you know the, the support of looking at things as careers instead of you know short-term opportunities so the idea of the creators that we're supporting today we want them to be long-term and sustainable careers in whatever that endeavor it is not just a let's finish a project we want you to finish a legacy and so that's the thing where we have to look at support as that long-term investment so i think that's really the word we'd love to use with each other how can we invest in each other you know with the idea of, of pouring into people's talents and, and purpose and so that's absolutely what i think also can galvanize communities and again to your point um earlier about it really being about that authentic relationship that you can kind of form with folks so uh, again all all fantastic uh, advice so I would love to close. And, and again, this is way too short a time. We're going to have to make some more for sure. Um, but I'd love to ask, what is the what is the future of Black Girl Nerds? Where we're with, again, to your point, and we want to thank you for opening up the uh, the opportunity to collaborate, you know, with all with all Striper creators. And we do appreciate it. Um, where do you see or where would you like to be like the next step of your own creative journey in that of Black Girl Nerds? I definitely want us to be a bigger publication to where I have a full time staff right now. Um, you know, one of the things that I am most proud of within the last few years of running this is I have a team of freelancers. So I have folks that, you know, earn, uh, you know, a nice little income on the side uh, working for BGN, whether they're writing or whether they're uh, doing video content um, or social media stuff or podcasts. So that that's great. Um, however, I would love for those freelancers to turn into full-time staff. <laughs> so that that is definitely the the goal and, and the future that I want for Black Girl Nerds. Um, where it goes beyond that is will be determined by a higher power that's greater than myself. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I just leave everything all up to to God and and hopefully that, you know, uh you know, the things that I am doing as of today is getting me on the right path to where I would hope to be and maybe end up being something even bigger and better than I could have ever imagined. So. Oh, man, no, we, we appreciate that. And, you no, know, we, we pray upon that continued success for you. And likewise, 
you know, I think you are you are in your path and in your purpose. So by all means, you know, we want to be here to support and appreciate you along the way, you know, towards those goals and, and those dreams that will absolutely come true. So, you know, we want to you. thank you and appreciate that. And so long short, how can we continue to invest and support Black Girl Nerds and yourself? Oh, thank you for asking. Uh, definitely check out the website, blackgirlnerds.com. We create content on that site almost every single day. Mm -hmm. Our writers work really hard to put out good original stories, whether it's movie reviews, whether it's essays and op-eds. Uh, so please, by all means, go to the website and support that way. We do have a Patreon. I don't usually shill it out much, but if you do want to donate to our Patreon, um, you, you can certainly do that. Um, and then we have a weekly podcast. So check out our podcast. We just had a guest on, and this speaks to what I was saying earlier about supporting independent content creators, but young 14 year old boy who's done two comic books and he's running his own tech business. And what the beautiful thing about what he's doing with his comics is a portion of his sales is going to help young kids get into therapy. Um, so I just think it's a beautiful thing what he's doing. So if you want to check out our podcast, that episode is out now and we do new episodes every Monday. Um, and of course, we're on we're on all the socials. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram, <laughs> Facebook. So you can follow us there and, and support us that way. Oh, absolutely. No, we will and we shall. And thank you so very much. I appreciate you, Jamie. It's a pleasure as always. And with that, we want to give you back the rest of your day. But know that uh, you know, we do thankful. We are thankful for you and appreciate you. And we'll continue our, our collaboration forward from here. So again, thank you and have a good day. All right. Take care. Bye. Right, take care now. All right. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jamie Broadnax, so founder and CEO of Black Girl Nerds. And again, just a part of an amazing future that we all get the chance to share together in our dreams and aspirations of being a tomorrow where we can be together. That is absurd. And so with that, we will be right back in just a couple of minutes as we look to continue towards our last couple of panels. But the fun will continue into our virtual meta space here with Spatial I.O. partner with us in Subsume in Harlem Film House. So with that, we'll be right back. You stay tuned and stay included. We'll be right back in just a couple of minutes.
Thank you all so very much. We appreciate you continuing to be the best part of Subsume Summit Black Futures Month 2023. And this is Dejan Sneed here in Atlanta, Georgia, speaking with you here from our Subsume Studios here in Castleberry Hill, which is time for our keynote speaker of the afternoon. I want to go ahead and get right into it. Uh, I got a chance to really, really bring a, a special a guest in here for us today to talk about cultural jet fuel and the idea of being able to be innovative and experimental for our shared creative futures. And so with that, I would love to call to the stage, uh, Mr. Dalen A. Golf of JET. Thank you so very much. All right, I think we may have it up here in just a second. And I'll do it manually, no worries. We'll make it happen here. Uh, there Dalen, we there we go, no worries, that's fine. You know, again, that is, is just uh, a pleasure. So again, thank you so very much, Mr. Golf. It's uh, a pleasure as always to talk with you. Um, no, absolutely, man. Glad to be here. Glad I was able to to uh, join today. I'm actually up in Chocolate City in D.C. right now. Uh, I spoke on another panel live about an hour or so ago. So it was like, no, I gotta gotta check in with my people. So I'm I'm glad we're able to work this out. No, sir. Tip of the hat to you, brother. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm going to give a chance for you to uh, formally introduce yourself, uh, you know, as influencer of influencers and our cultural wingman. Kind of give a quick uh, quip after about how we met. But then for sure, want to get right into um, to your work and, uh, and the amazing things ahead. So, Mr. Golf, please introduce yourself. My name is Dalen A. Golf. I am the proud president of JET. Um, Jet Magazine, Jet Media, you know, the 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 magazine that was probably sitting on your mom and grandmother's table or at the beauty of barbershop for years. I get the uh, pleasure and the honor of helping lead this brand and bring it bring it back to uh, prominence that it was, but also do it in a way that is culturally relevant and that means something from a future forward standpoint. So I love the fact that we, as we're talking about black futures, um, you know, and Afrofuturism, being able to use our brand to kind of help, help fuel that. And I, I say that fueled by jet, pun intended, because the reality of who we are as a brand and what we were, it wasn't just a magazine. It was a platform in order to be able to fuel things. It helped fuel the civil rights movement by posting the images of the Emmett Till uh, tragedy and, you know, MLK seeing those and, you know, doing what he has done um, leading up to this point. But then also from fueling things about, um, you know, from a from a standpoint of fueling beauty with the Jet Beauty of the Week, fueling music with the Soul Brother Top 20 albums and and songs, fueling, you know, um, culture and and business and black excellence like it did all of those things in this little magazine uh that came out every single week so now as i am uh at the helm of this this iconic brand is figuring out the ways to be able to push it forward with the tools and the technology that we have at, right now oh absolute and, and to kind of speak to that this that's how we met right the idea is you know at a at a convention and I, I just i saw this strapping young brother with just it was a black it was it was the black shirt with the white was it white or black it was but it was a shirt I, like I, that black. yes yeah that, exactly. that. and i yeah. literally ran across this thing and i was just like where did you get this who how i had to have it it was uh it was great and that's a great conversation didn't find out you're you and uh and again a, a great uh opportunity to spark up uh things forward from there but I think it just simply spoke to the uh, the relevance and importance of the brand and to that point, what it meant culturally for black people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you hit on a lot of the seminal points. You know, it was our politics. It was yeah. our it was our music. It was our media. It was our conversation piece in so many ways and spaces that intersected every culture. It could be in the boardroom. It could be at a barber mm -hmm. shop, the beauty shop and everything in between. And even as a young kid you know, coming in, I remember that book. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a seminal space in black culture and, and just really an appreciative uh, opportunity to not only talk with you, but again, to talk to things for it with Jet. So with that, the idea of cultural jet fuel and the idea of how do we now take this black culture, which in that sense has not changed, where it is a precursor to so much innovation, so much that influences the world around us. 
But still, even from those traditional books in the early days of Jet, we find as a black people, we're in a lot of those same circumstances revisited. Yeah. Right. We, we you wouldn't think between here and there we'd have a black president. But then yeah. in a few months have uh, black history being erased from public schools. Right. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of that stuff has been covered and chronicled from and back by Jet before. So now how can we how what's your I guess to say what is the premise by which you love to see Jet and the and the opportunities and, and uh, resources there leveraged to help us in a contemporary way to to really continue these storytellings? Well, I think the biggest thing, and, and uh, thank you for bringing up some of those points, um, and they correlate to a lot of the things that we're trying to do and trying to make sure we can keep a certain level of control. And honestly, it breaks down to a certain level of ownership. If John H. Johnson did not own Jet as a black man, those Emmett Till photos probably would not have been posted in the magazine. Because it's not like lynchings were not going on prior to Emmett Till. It was a pretty regular thing that happened, but just being able to see that part of it is what launched the whole movement. I use the correlation all the time that Jet was to the Emmett Till story what Twitter or social media was to George Floyd. It made you have to pay attention to it. It made you have to look at it. It made you um, see these things right in their truest and rawest form. So therefore, you then are compelled to do something about it. Businesses have to do something about it. The, the America as a whole has to do something about it because you're confronted with it right smack dab in your face. And so as we look at what we want to do and how we're using and, and you know, reimagining and refreshing from a JET perspective, I always say that the name JET, John H. Johnson named it JET in 1951 because it symbolized black and speed. Now, the crazy about part about that concept is, wait a minute, 1951, he, he, he said it black and speed because the world was moving at a faster clip than he had ever seen. And it's like, in 51, though? Like, right. <laughs> can you imagine if he were alive today, how his mind would be blown about how things move and how fast it is, even down to uh, the cadence of Ebony and Jet. So we are Ebony and Jet, same company. Ebony historically was um, once a month. It had the larger format. It had more in-depth stories. It was, you know, highly polished. And like I said, once a month was the cadence. And the difference between Ebony and Jet was a lot based on the size of the magazine and the cadence because Jet came out. I mean, Ebony came out once a month, larger format. Jet came out once a week in a smaller mm. format, but it was 52 issues a year versus 12 issues a year and 52 issues a year. The amount of information that you had to fill that with is, you know, crazy in his concept and looking and it needed to be that fast. But right now, if we talk about something that's a week old, people are like, oh, man, that's old news. You talk about something that's almost a day old, you're like, hey, man, y'all ain't mm -hmm. up on it. Because the way we consume information and we get information based on technology is instantaneous. You know, when somebody passes away, as soon as they die, everybody knows, oh, this is what happened. You heard about, you heard about, mm -hmm. you heard about. Whereas historically, you had to wait to find out verification or there may be somebody that you didn't even realize passed until you saw it in a Jet magazine, like, oh, I didn't realize that particular artist or that particular actor or that particular political person died until you saw it in Jet. So understanding where we were and where we're trying to go, a lot of it is really fueled by the technology that's available today. Uh, Jet was social media before social media was ever invented. And so now as we're looking at opportunistic places and spaces to be in, it's really tapping in and using the technology that's available, but being able to correlate it from a black experience, because the thing that Jet means to black people, it's almost it's a certification. It's a verification. It is the, the blue check on Twitter or Instagram. Basically, it's the black check. You know, if you're in Jet and Jet verifies it, it is authentically black. And I think being able to pull those things out and be able to stamp them in the different places and spaces that make sense is where our opportunistic thing is. We just want to look at taking what we are, who we are, where we were or where we are from a cultural perspective and being able to project that using the technology and the opportunities today. That's well said. Thank you. And 
I think that it's still so spot on because we think of, you know, we look at other points of social media. We say black Twitter, you know, black Instagram, uh, you know, black. And, and the idea is that we always put that, you know, try to build that space within the other components. And then and I completely agree, component. you know, Can looking at the space. Own? Exactly. And that part of it, because that's the real control. You mm -hmm. hear people complain, oh, man, they're throttling my uh, followers or oh, they're using my content and so and so else is getting paid off of it. Or they're taking my dance off of TikTok and another person that doesn't look like me is is running with it and getting paid. Well, how about we look at and controlling our own and building our own in a digital space and having the verification that knows, all right, it is truly authentic and being able to, you know, from a branding position, being able to do the things that we need to do and have it owned by us. That's well, that's well said. And uh, that's something that resonates not only with this particular conversation, but with several when we think about the idea of futurism. And really the, the idea of futurism is we have to understand our presence, right? The yeah. idea is that we have to understand that without an anchor of agency of ownership, that we're only going to kick that can down the road, right? That, that future that we think that we project and want to believe and, and really can achieve of being able to have ownership of that real part of it, which is black culture is, is we have to make that tent pole now, right? And I see that again, you know, to Mr. Johnson and Jet and the legacy of that was one of those foundational states that again, we can still pull and resonate from. Yeah. But the idea is we, to your point, we have to, with that, with technology, be able to appreciate that one, understand and galvanize around it too, and as you say, look at how can we leverage this towards our own future advancement. Yeah, and support our own. I think mm -hmm. it, it's in a lot of ways. Um, there's kind of a cachet of, oh man, you know, so and so. Have you tried this and doing this part of it? And it's like, you know, I, I use the example of with Ebony and Jet. The reality of it is, is as I'm talking to people and they're like, oh, what are you doing now? Oh, I'm the president of Jet. Oh man, I remember when they go through the nostalgia part of it and then they go through, uh, well, how can I support? Can I get a subscription? Can I do this? And I'm like, no, like honestly, the supporting aspect of it is just being able to share and have and tell these stories initially. And then when we drop stuff, being able to support it at that particular time. It will never be what it was. We recognize and know that. But also, if it was what it was, it probably wouldn't be profitable because the reality of it is, is what it was was a magazine that came out every single week and you had printed issues and they were not able to make the transition to where we are right now. Most people don't buy magazines on a regular basis. And even if they do, it's not enough circulation to be able to justify charging a premium price for advertisers to be able to engage in that audience. Everything is digital. The way we get information is instantaneous and it is also from a digital form because we have this high power computer that's in our pocket that we walk around with every single day. And so understanding where we are and understanding, okay, how do we take the brand equity and the value that's built up into that and then pair it with the technology that's available right now in order to make it relevant, culturally relevant, but also make it profitable because we purchased it out of bankruptcy for a reason. It was bankrupt. So now how do you do it in a way that we can be able to monetize the brand so therefore it can be around for the future and for the next 70 years like it's been around for the previous? That makes sense. And and really is that economic reality of mm -hmm. which to your point, you know, where there is nostalgia, but then there is that business practicality of, yes. of what you say. Of, of you got to balance those what it two. Is. You know, because yeah, then you'll get nostalgic and you feel good for that 2.5 seconds and then you moved on to something else. And it's like, no, where are the places and spaces and the ways that we're able to pull that all the way through? So therefore, you're not just supporting for the sake of supporting. You're getting value out of it. We want to make sure you're getting the value and it's giving you the tools and the fuel that you need to kind of do what you need to do. But also it comes at a cost and there's a way to be able to do it to where everybody's able to win because that's the reality of who Jet is and who Jet was. It's elevating our culture as a whole. So therefore we are able to highlight the things, but also be able to create financial wealth 
to be able to sustain ourselves as a business unit for the future. Sounds right. And, and completely agree. So let's talk about that, that current, current state of jet, right? Mm -hmm. The idea of jet media. What are some of the, the, the value propositions or stakes that right now you have in place? Well, I think we're exploring a lot of things. The great mm -hmm. part about it is my my leadership is giving me the opportunity to, for one, get out here and evangelize the brand. So this is the reason why I was on the panel earlier and you and I are talking right now is I understand my role in this. And a lot of it is sparking the conversation to our audiences. So therefore, they can then go evangelize the brand as well. So we just want to create that spark that's in there that kind of pushes that forward. And then as we are doing that and we're building this community of people that tap into who we are and what we're about, then being able to take that and identify those places and spaces where we're able to show up. That could be showing up from an experiential standpoint. That could be showing up uh, doing brand partnerships with brands that align with us of saying, hey, we want to tap into this black community, but we want to do it in an authentic way. And we want to do it with a partner that screens authenticity. I tell people we're kind of the agency of record of black culture, meaning you come to us for one, we're going to make sure you do it right. And it's not, you know, pacifying or placating to a certain audience. We're going to make sure it's done right. We'll put our stamp of approval, which is our logo, our brand on it to say, all right, you're doing this with this brand by the name of Jet that has cultural credibility, probably more cultural credibility than most other entities that's involved in that. And for that, you'll get this stamp of approval and you'll get the ability to engage into an audience that knows and is coming to expect a certain credibility that you know how to engage with us. I think there are a lot of brands, and I come from the marketing and media side, there are a lot of brands that they talk the talk, especially post-George Floyd. We're going to, you know, donate. We're going to tap into black media. We're going to do this, HBCU, this, all of that. And then they start trying, and they didn't know how to do it because a lot of the people that they were doing it with in the places and spaces, they don't know how to interact with black culture. So we want to be that can do it. In the same way that if you go in a historical historical standpoint, brands like like a Cadillac. There's a reason why old black men still drive Cadillacs. Why? Because General Motors and Cadillac was like, we are advertising and talking to this particular consumer in a way that is relevant to them. They were in jet, but they wasn't just in jet and just in ebony. They also work with people like Burrell Communications, a black owned media agency to be able to say, no, you can't just take what you do over here in this, this advertisement that you put in People or USA Today. We need to tailor this to an audience that has their own culture and their way of doing stuff and a certain swag. So therefore, you know that we've done the extra work and being able to just say, no, we're not just putting a black face on this. We are tapping into those key cultural moments, those key insights and pulling those out from an expert level. And Jet kind of is that is that expert that's in it on top of it as a media company to whereas we can give you the stamp of approval, but we also can amplify it in a way that most people are going to be able to see it, especially the ones that you say you want to go after, which is a black culture standpoint. And those that do it and do it well, it allows um, it allows them to get that credibility, that transfer of trust that comes from it. No, absolutely. And and again, when you when you talk about legacy and again, uh, you alluded to it, I definitely mm -hmm. want to give a shout out here to Player Prez, best best known as uh, President Walsh at Bennett College uh, and the Bennett Bells of, ah, of HBCU. Absolutely. Yes. So and she'll also be speaking about the future HBCUs. I'm definitely make sure to make this connection here because I, I agree. I think it's an idea of that story and the storytelling that we want to see those spaces like you say, in that that verification, but I think mm -hmm. also in that valuation of of that you know concentric space of black cultures, which of yes. course our HBCUs are you know a preeminent space, and so I also can appreciate as you say like the idea of that culture being such a a valuable component because I think a lot of the mm -hmm. value proposition and why it's so interesting in collaborating with Jet is that it's a 
space that you already have the hard work done because again as you know and i think we're both from the marketing standpoint of the authenticity and the appreciation is already inherent in in the name right it's yes. the idea of now a putting that in the spaces and places that it needs to be. And yeah. so that's where we can kind of really see that being a, a unique strength, but also an opportunity because I can see that there's so many places that one that could be required and necessary from a civic and social engagement space, but also for brands, like you say, post George Floyd, or, yeah. you know, in the contemporary sense of, of where we have so many other social opportunities that black cultures being called upon as a solution space that you have to you have to your phone can't be ring, has to be ringing off the hook with opportunities in those spaces right well it's getting people to fully understand that i always say this is our unique value proposition and being able to tap into that which from a marketing perspective and a branding perspective that's the key what is unique about you how does that bring value and what's the proposition that we can be able to bring to life. If you're able to articulate those things and be able to show those things, then you're right. The opportunity is absolutely there. On the flip side, and one of the things that I've had to manage, um, and I tell my team all the time, is because there's so many opportunities that are out there, it sometimes becomes overwhelming. And I'm like, you know, we, we are not about to try to boil the ocean. I'm just trying to boil some pots. Can we get this pot on the on the stove, turn it up, and let's get it to a boil first, let that simmer, and then move on to a larger pot or another pot? Because one of the challenges we run into is because people are so excited about, and then what y'all doing? You know what you should do? You should do this. We do events. What about Jeff? What about this? What about this? And you end up not doing anything or at least not doing them well. We have to make sure we do the things that we can do and we do them well and we build it up because it will, like I said, it will not be what it was, but we want to make sure it's doing what it needs to be to be around for the future. And part of that is making sure and controlling the things we can control and doing them well, because those are the things that people remember. People don't remember you, the fact you did all these extra stuff if you did them horribly they want to know oh man i went to this particular event or i had went to this execution from a jet perspective and it was done well they did this 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 and this and it can be simple but let's make sure we make the main thing the main thing and so that's where i have you know the the privilege but also the challenge of doing that of making sure that what we do is going to be at a level that people come to expect but making sure we don't spread ourselves too thin in this particular phase. I'm leading a 70 year old startup in every sense of the word. We have the brand equity, which as you talked about and alluded to, there's value in that. You know, I've worked with many brands over the years and they would pay millions and tens of millions of dollars to have the brand equity with the audiences that we, we, we tap into. The double-edged sword of that is because we have that brand ex equity, we have to deliver every single time, even down to a shirt. If that shirt isn't the right quality, if it's feeling like, oh, man, it's cheap, how they going to just mail this in? I can't mail anything in because we have a level and a standard that we have to make sure we meet, and I'm going to make sure we meet that standard. Well said, well said. And I want to make sure to uh... – open it up. We have some some great comments have been coming in, in in regards to it, but respectful. I also want to see if I can return some of your time knowing you literally just finished a talk before. So and, <laughs> um, and, and I appreciate that. But yeah, no I have to make sure we've been talking. Oh, no, yeah. we have. And uh, no, with that. So no, we're going to give it about 10 more minutes. And again, I, I know that bed behind you got to be calling you. So it's OK. I'm, 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 we, we, I'm we, we'll we'll have more times, bro. Don't worry. We got we got time. So okay. you know, to that, I mean, I think that is really so much of, of what we want to talk about with black futures right the idea um of us imagining ourselves in the future i mean if we look back historically we always keep going back to the legacy of jet yeah. right again of of where of what it took to have a magazine at that yeah. point in time right the the idea of being able to source paper to be able to deliver and Const on a weekly and constant consistent basis Dude, right i think that a million copies a million copies every week was that right. the circulate? I cannot even imagine. And then had to do another million next week. Like, yeah, but a lot of it, and I love the fact of even we talk about the future, but 
And a lot of times people don't talk about what you have to do now in order to set yourself up for the future. We just expect it to all happen. No, we got to be able to do the work and do the baby steps and put the foundations that are there in order to be able to build on. So therefore, once we get to the future, you start to look up and be like, oh, all right, man. OK, that, that was some good work. I'm glad we did that first step that comes with it. Oh, absolutely. And and I feel like that's just something that's inherent with black culture, particularly African-American culture here in the Americas. You know, again, we can talk about the diaspora of talent, which I love and and is like my is the thing I want my legacy work to be is, is galvanizing this space. But yeah. the idea of like a jet magazine being able and like you say, and doing the work, I think is something that we understand as futurists is that we have to my premise is that we have to activate in the impossible. Right. You have to do something when it is absolutely impossible for it to be that. Right. Mm -hmm. The idea of I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to activate in, you know, in segregation, a book that's going to bring together people and is going to chronicle the civil rights that's actively and literally against the law. And we're going yeah. to talk about that every week until it's yeah. done. When when I when our leaders become martyrs and become victims of, of violence, we're going to chronicle that and continue yeah. on. And that's a, that's an impossible it's an impossible space but again to your point these are how legacies are built yes. right and so that's where we think of it as a futurism that again we have to activate in the impossible now where yes. we see so many opportunities still socially politically economically mm -hmm. particularly around black uh black culture black uh black families and black communities mm -hmm. you know we we still have to be actionable right yes. uh, i think we're in a in such a critical space with, anything else means that there is no future yeah. but again i think the the leverage to that is that we have brands and we have history and legacy that's well chronicled mm -hmm. still well valued and still within our own agency that lets us say there is a future that includes us not just includes us but is us and again i think it goes back to what you're saying earlier on agency and ownership being mm -hmm. at the heart of that whether that's ownership of our hbcus ownership yeah. of of our language and education. And so with that kind of as a close to you, where do you see the, the opportunities that you love to really pour into as far as Jet and the cultural wingman that you are, where <laughs> are some uh, just some points that you think of when you think of like what's next for Jet? Well, I think I tell my team, let's look back in order to move forward. That's one of the things that we talk about. And the way I say that is because, sure, the nostalgia parts of it is perfectly fine. But a lot of things that are happening right now have happened before. Like if you follow us on social, one of our like social media keys that I give them, I'll be like, we're not reporting on news that happens right now just for the sake of reporting. If it has something to do with us, then it does make sense for us to be able to talk about it uh, because I don't want to be, you know, no, sh no shade to, you know, TMZ or the shade room or any of those other news outlet. That's always just trying to find out what's next on that end. Great part about it is we have so much historical context. I'll give you an example. When uh, Serena Williams was playing in the U.S. Open, that's something a lot of people were talking about. Oh, man, Serena's this part of it, all this other stuff. And all we did is say, all right, they're talking about Serena right now. Serena was on the cover of Jet in 2008. Let's pull the Williams sisters. Let's talk about the fact that Jet helped fuel them and helped bring them to this particular forefront and the things that's going on now. Um, uh, I forget her name. A Bell in Brooklyn. I can't even think. Demetria, Demetria Lucas did a post the other day because Ebony had uh, Jonathan Majors on the cover and she was talking about, man, we need to celebrate these black men and these thirst trap he was on there for Valentine's Day with no shirt on. And so she called out a bunch of other publications like Essence and like GQ and some others. And we jumped in the conversation like, hey, don't forget us. We invented the thirst trap. <laughs> LL, was like, LL was like, let's think about what page 43 was. Let's think about how we used to do those things. So it brought us into the conversation. So I think being able to just remind people, you know, to call out like, no, nah, we got street cred. We have credibility so much. And we're able to pull some of those things through just to be able to um, make sure our history isn't lost in this. With 
with communities, with states and education systems real quick to try to erase black history. We're sitting on a tremendous amount of history and that history goes all the way down to your everyday person. The people that were in Gent, for the most part, besides maybe a couple celebrities on the cover or following them around, it was filled with regular people in the community. It was, okay, who got a promotion at General Motors and now they're the vice president and black. Oh man, we found out about them. Who got married? I was at the event earlier and a guy walked up and he had the magazine in his hand of him and his wife when they got married and the images were printed in jet. Page 43, the girl next door was usually a college student, most of the time at an HBCU type thing. You know, you had all of this chronicling what was going on in everyday black life because it showed and showcased the fact that we are not a monolith. We do things all across the board and we want to be able to showcase and amplify those things. So therefore, the next person or somebody else seeing it can recognize, oh, man, this person made it to jet and they are an engineer or aerospace engineer. I want to be an aerospace engineer. I like math. I like technology. It was able to show those things from our perspective and put that stamp of approval. So from a future forward standpoint, it's being able to pull those things all the way through to be able to tell those compelling stories, to be able to remind people of who we are, to be able to show them what they can do from a future forward standpoint. So that's where that big fueled by jet part of it is being able to chronicle and tell those stories, but then also create our new stories, create our places and spaces to be able to pull those things together and then be able to amplify them. No, perfect. And and just so excited for not only the, the future of JET, but I think the future of all of us being able to be fueled by JET, you know, in a space that we can now be a, a part of the stories of the future. So with that, how can we how can we follow you? How can we support JET in this current space and where can we keep up with the future endeavors? Absolutely. Two things where we are right now. Uh, follow us on Twitter at JET. Uh, follow us on Instagram is get jet mag that will change in a second. I'm working with meta to try to be able to get those are things I now have to uncover and figure out. Oh, why didn't you lock in this name beforehand? I can't worry about that. I just got to figure out what we're doing forward. So Instagram at get jet mag follow us on there. But also I want to encourage everyone to go to jetmag.com, uh, which will also take you to myjetstory.com. My Jet Story is a campaign we launch because when I would meet people, they find out what I do for a living and they would immediately give me their jet story. It can be as simple as, oh, man, I used to be at the barbershop and I used to the stack of jet magazines. Or when I would go to my grandmother's house and sit on the on the couch with the plastic covering it, she would always have a jet spread out. Or it can be when my parents got married, they were in jet or my mom was a Jet Beauty of the Week. All those things are stories that we all share in a common thread, and I want to be able to chronicle those stories. And so I uh, created a website where you can go to myjetstory.com, and you can upload your photo on the website, and it'll put you on the cover of a Jet magazine that you can be able to share out on your social media. But our goal is for people to do that and then share what Jet means to them, to be able to give us their jet story so we can be able to share that and amplify it and we do it all the time people share those stories we put them and we amplify it on our social media but it's all about being able to hear those stories from regular people that that it impacted their life and not it just coming to me and then i have to share them but having it shared from their own word words so therefore it creates this evangelistic type situation of people have this emotional connection to the brand and that's what we want to do right now i'm here as an evangel of the brand and i want to be able to activate all the people that love the brand and being able to tell those stories and be able to share those stories. So therefore everybody can be able to see them and connect in a great way. Absolutely. We'll do. And, and absolutely. We'll be sharing that information, of course, through our, our social media and of course on our space at subsumesummit.com. And again, much more to come, you know, on this conversation. So again, brother, appreciate you say travels. Uh, please, we, we need you here in these spaces. So we're going to turn over the rest of your evening, hopefully for some rest and relaxation as you, uh, you. as you uh, keep it going. But we will keep this conversation going again, ladies and gentlemen. 
uh, Dalen A. Gall of Jet. And we yes, appreciate and you. And always, man, appreciate you. If you ever need anything, give me a shout. I'm always being able to tap in. As you know, you hit me up. I'm not hard yeah. to find, uh, but I love having these type of conversations because I think it's necessary and the work that you're doing is necessary. So thank you so much for having me. It, it's a pleasure. And like I said, if never need anything, give me a shout. I will right, do, brother. Thank you so very much. Appreciate you. We'll talk soon. All right. Thank you all. all right, thank you, sir. Take care. And again, uh, it's a privilege to speak with Dalen A. Golf of JET. And so with that, we are going to continue the conversations ahead. Again, the idea of us being able to be included in our shared futures of tomorrow through the intersections of creativity, technology, and community. And so with that, we will take a short break, return some time there to Mr. Goff, and go ahead and prepare for our six o'clock conversation as a continuation of Black Futures 2023, which will look at the future of gameplay with renowned gameplay design developer and um, cultural curator, Tanya DePass. And we will be right back if you all stay in tune and stay included with us. And we appreciate you for being the best part of Black Futures 2023. This is Dejan Sneed, talk to you in a bit.
Good day, and thank you all so very much for coming back and being a part of Black Futures 2023. This is Dejah Sneed here, founder of Subsume Media here in Atlanta, Georgia. Subsume's intersection of creativity, technology, and community, where we look to be a value add to the stories of tomorrow by making sure everyone stays included today. And with that, we are coming to a final run of amazing day two here with Black Futures 2023. But we're always looking at how can we find our spaces and places that we can not only survive, but thrive creatively. And so the idea of gaming and gameplay is something that pretty much everyone has some purview within their lives. And so the idea of looking at the future of gameplay, particularly from an inclusive lens, uh, we wanted to bring in one of the uh, renowned world expert and all around cool kid to come around and talk to us about how do we find our space in the future of gameplay? With so many components of that, I'm just going to go ahead and ask you to stage uh, Miss Tanya DePas and uh, from I Need Diverse Games and so many other points of our great geek culture. And it's just going to be a privilege for us to have this as a closing component of day two for Black Futures. So with that, we'll go ahead and bring and uh, and then uh, bring Tanya to the stage. Thank you so very much. Good day. Hey. Good day. Well, hello, hello. Well. Pleasure. Oh, absolutely. And thank you so much. I um, you know, get a, a chance now to um, meander with you here uh, <laughs> in a great way about the future of gameplay. And again, thank you so very much for, for coming in and sharing some time here with us. So I'd love, of course, to uh, allow you the opportunity to introduce yourself and uh, your many accomplishments and, and points of connection so that we can learn to you know how we best can uh, continue the conversation from there. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Tanya, uh, also known everywhere online as Cypher of Tear. Uh, thank you for the intro and for inviting me to come and hang out with you. Because, hey, I get to come and talk about games with other Black folks. I'm in. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do a lot on the Internet. A lot of people know me for I Need Diverse Games, but I also do TTRPG development, creating along with an amazing cast and crew of developers um, into the motherlands, which is an Afrofuturist sci-fi RPG, which will be out knock on wood this year. As soon as we find a new uh, publisher, I do streaming, I do diversity consulting. I do a little bit of everything and I often yell on the internet. Fantastic. And, and even in, in all those points, I'm sure we're, we're not giving you enough credit and we, but we thank you for being here. So the idea and likewise uh, a chance to geek out and talk games, I'm, I'm all in as well. So, to that component, as, as you alluded, gaming means so much more than just the games that we think of and, and each individual component, right? The idea of digital games or traditional games, we think of like Monopoly or the other components. And then of course mm -hmm. we have, you know, more intricate, uh, intricate games uh, that leave, start with tabletop, such as Dungeons and Dragons, go all the way into things like Mech Warrior and just more involved at what we call advanced gameplay from there. You know where where for you had was where did this all start? Uh, I'm I'm one of those people. I'm about to tell on myself and my age. Uh, I remember the Atari 2600, Commodore. You know the the Pong. Um, you know going to arcades and lining up quarters. Those don't seem to exist anymore. Um, and also Dungeon and Dragons. You know I'm I'm slightly older than the game itself. And I, I don't know if you dealt with this, but I dealt with the satanic panic at home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've been, I've been playing games since, since Pong and that one stick with the fake wood grain was a thing. <laughs> no, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm well initiated. And likewise in that, in that cool kids age bracket where I can recall, uh, the, the absolute horror by which it was to bring a, a Dungeons and Dragons book home. Right. And, yep, uh, right. and the idea of, why that meant particularly, and to speak to my experience, but again, would be curious to yours is, you know, not finding uh, culturally a lot of folks finding uh, that same value or valuation in that space, right? So just please, yeah. thank you. Sorry. Uh, no, I'm just trying to think of how, how politely can I say this? Cause I know what my mother <laughs> used to say to me. Um, basically I was told that D and D gaming geek stuff, that's all things white folks do. It's not things quote unquote we do. Mm -hmm. So it was hard to one, just exist in that space because there were not a lot of us. There's still not a lot of us, at least that are very visible, but there's also the component of the other black folks who said that that's not a thing we do. 
And it's like, why are you trying to be white? Why are you trying to do this? So there's that both internal, that's not a thing we do, but also there's the external. When you don't see people like yourself in the space, you wonder, do you really belong there? Because there's so many people that we grew up with, and I, I still talk to, that are like, you know, I would have never thought you could even make a living playing D&D or writing for it. And so it's it's been kind of a struggle on both sides of it of now I found a lot more black people. I found a lot more people of color. Um, you know, I'm I'm very lucky to be on a D&D show that is all people of color, mostly black cast, and to find other people in that space. But it's just been, it's been wild watching things change and going from being the only black person in the room, the only woman in the room, the only queer person in the room to actually being surrounded by your people. Oh, absolutely. And I think there's a, a myriad of, of changes and, and possibilities happen to your point from when we're talking about satanic panic to mm -hmm. going to target and buying a starter D and D set. Right. Yep. And the idea is yep. like that the accessibility means that there's been so many spaces and places of inclusion that at least in some point have been addressed, whether or not they've been appropriately addressed, I'm sure as part of this conversation, but the idea of where, where it started, as we recall it to where it is now, there seems that it is, it's definitely something has happened and something is a shift. And so what's your take on the, I'll say the contemporary culture or popular culture of, of diverse gameplay, at least in the way that we intake it. It's, it's like climbing a glacier. You know how you, those, um, like when you work in an office, you always see just the tip of the iceberg on like uh, org charts and things like that, or even those, this is what you see, this is what's going on under the surface. It, I feel like gaming has got to that. Cause when I started this, it was all a happy accident. It was not on purpose. Um, and so now we are seeing people being more vocal about needing inclusion and diversity. When I do get a gig doing DEI work, people are coming to me at day one when the project is still under a code name and that's all it is. You got to sign the NDA just to talk to somebody versus some jobs where they bring me in, but it was clear they just wanted the rubber stamp of we're not racist. There was no way to fix anything. There was no way to change anything. Um, and contemporary wise, we still have ways to go because look at how people still act when there's a black protagonist. Look at the reaction um, for Spoken has gotten with the caveat of we know no black people wrote the character of Fred. But there's also the game writing issue of sometimes the game writing happens and then the game has to fit around the words or vice versa, the word, the game happens and words have to be crammed in to make it work. So without any of us knowing the back end of that and, you know, acknowledging that there were no black people in the writer's room, the game has still been panned ridiculously because we've got a black female lead. Um, I even was playing it earlier today and someone came in of all things to complain about was the graphics. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, have you not seen the graphics of this game? <laughs> of all the things you're going to complain about, but they probably were winding up to complain about the character at that point. So we're, we're, we've slowly like got out of the water and we're on the, getting to the tip of the iceberg, but we're not there yet. I think it's going to be at least another five to 10 years before we get to a, a place where we can announce a game with a black lead. We can announce something like Motherlands and not have people make assumptions about the game because uh, we dealt with so much racism and foolishness just announcing the show before we even decided to do a Kickstarter and make the game itself. Yes, I would say that's uh, I would say that's a tragedy, of course, to the idea of, of not even being able to build where we are now with all the advancement that we see in the gameplay space. Uh, just understanding that a black female protagonist, you know, be it a, a fantastic RPG player or a mermaid underwater, right, will cause civic unrest in some parts of this world. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, you know, we, obviously the gaming as as it is to me is a solution space right where we figure it out in gaming i think we see that it can translate and be comprehended in, in other components but now we'd love to kind of talk more about um i guess we'll get to the idea of since you mentioned it of motherlands rpg because i do want to cover that kind of in breadth of how that development 
how that ideation and, and kind of those components are. Do you see the opportunity in building your own types of games? Of course, we're talking about now, like for, for spoken and other things like D&D. These are properties and spaces that are already built out and exist. So the idea of gameplay and being able to design and develop obviously is a space in your expertise as well. So then knowing and, and addressing the problems that we see right now, then how did Motherlands as a as an idea come to be? So Motherlands itself uh, came about through a collaboration with Twitch. So the, the stream show happened first. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was I was pitching some things to Twitch. And of course, I pitched some d and I pitched some other stuff. And it said, well, the market's saturated with D&D. What about something else? And I tried to pitch Star Trek, but I guess there were licensing things going on. And they're like, eh, let's not touch that. Could be weird. Um, so what about telling your own story? And I was like, okay, I guess. <laughs> um, and, you know, along with B. Dave Walters, we sat down and, and came up with a few ideas, decided what would work. And then we did a like one of those calendar things of if we have to produce 12 episodes by the end of the calendar year, Oh, we need to start very soon. So we came up with our idea. Um, you know, shout out to B. Dave because he, he with his brain and and ways of looking at things helped me because I had a really weird and whack idea to start with. And you know, we we pitched the idea, which was it's a whole new world populated by people that would be related to Mansa Musa, who actually sent out a expedition that never made it to the Americas. That is a historical fact. But it's not where our story starts. That expedition wound up on this planet. And this is all like out of the box. Everyone has contributed to create the world of Utoa and the, the solar system it exists in. And, you know, we did well. Twitch liked us enough to, to fund three more seasons. But between the, the first and the second season, people were like, I would love to play this. And we're like, oh, okay. And so we decided let's make a game why not if we kickstart it and we get the money cool and if we don't well we tried and uh the kickstarter did very well to the point where i kind of freaked out because it funded in 90 minutes um and then by the time we were done we were about 720 percent over our goal mm -hmm. and um we've been working on the game it's it's almost done because as you know there's roadblocks because making your own mechanics is hard um and so we had an unfortunate issue with our publisher they did drop the ball and drop us so we are now seeking another publisher and once that's settled knock on wood the book at least the pdf can be in people's hands by the end of the year and um all the other goodies that people pledge for on the cook starter because if we'd been able to use Cortex, it probably would be done by now. But that that deal was not going to be beneficial for anybody mm. except them. So fair. No, then again, uh, you know, as a, a an appreciative backer and again, just fan fan of the premise. Absolutely excited to and see you in its time and, and and glad to see. So I do want to take one step back as we as we may. I know we're initiated in this sense of. What it, in some senses, what it takes to make a a tabletop RPG. Mm -hmm. You go over some of the roles and responsibilities that for your core team around Motherlands that that we can kind of expound upon for those in the audience that may not know. Kind of what are some roles in creating a role playing game or tabletop RPG? Oh boy! Uh, so, and keep in mind, we learned a lot of this on. At least I learned a lot of this on the fly. Sure. Um, but you need a creative director, which is me. Uh, we have a lead developer, which is which is B. Dave, and he kind of corrals developers and the writers. We have about 15 writers. Um, we had an art director, uh, Vanessa, who then went out and got artists, and she managed the whole art process, you know, got people samples, did everything else, all the hiring for that. And then um, we've got someone who's going to do layout, and we have someone who did maps. We actually found a... Uh, Aaron Radney, who does cartography, which I didn't think we were able to get a black person to do cartography because I was going to sound weird. And all the time I've been doing D&D &D and other stuff, I'd not found a person of color who did maps. Mm. So he did that. And we got a few other artists that are doing our cover. And um, 
So there's artists, there's lead artists, um, lead artist slash art director, lead developer, writer. We don't like differentiate between senior, junior, like you all are writing, just just write. Um, cartographer and then um, layout and design. Oh, great. And, and thank you for that clarification. And, and I just wanted to kind of expound on that because again, we're talking about gameplay. A lot of these same roles are the same ones that we look at in video games. So the idea of, of creative director, art director, uh, narrative writer, also being able to game mechanics and design. A lot of that's synonymous across gaming just in some. So again, where I felt like you're, the, again, the right person to talk about where when we're thinking about gameplay, whether or not it's digital or whether it's physical or something in between, that a lot of those same roles are there. But that also means those same roles may have opportunities in finding inclusive people to fill them or also be appreciative of those cultures that they may try to expound upon. Yeah, and one role that I forgot was our mechanics because once we decided not to go with Cortex, we need someone to make the game work because that's the thing, no matter whether it's a video game or tabletop or a board game, you can have the setting and you can you know lay whatever you want on top of the mechanics, but you need a way for the game to work and be fun, especially with a tabletop to not have power creep, scope creep of, Either I'm so weak early on in the beginning, anything can kill my character, to at level 20, I'm a demigod and nothing can touch me. And you basically have to, you know, bring in Superman to to have an equitable fight. So there's so many things in which it's hard to to balance all of that. And that's what a lot of people I think don't understand because you know they're used to the way way things are done and they don't think about the way things should be done or things can change hmm. that's fair and and i think that change really again kind of gets back to the crux of the opportunities that we may see in some spaces um that but again that for your team particularly with motherlands and i know of your work are champion to clarify and and uh and advance as best as, as possible so with that it always and I kind of say it just as a fan and as a person in the space, it always seems to strike me odd that you know we can imagine dragons and all these other fantastic creatures, but we cannot imagine black people in spaces of equality in fantastic spaces. Do you think that, I don't know why that is, and I really just say that to say, it seems like, again, the way that tabletop RPGs and gaming in general comes up with narratives it mm -hmm. seems that it's based off of, of course, you know, Eurocentric folklore, which a lot of times ends up being, you know, uh, some root or derivative of Arthurian, of Arthurian legend, or again, um, you know, tradition, Greek, Roman God, and um, and pantheon yeah. spaces like that, or as we may see in some movies, like a reimagined space of, let's say, like Comet, Comedic Egypt, right? That may or may not be as culturally accurate as some may protect, but again, maybe from a you know, English and you know, Oxford interpretation of what of what of what you, um, Egypt might have been seems to be what makes it the screen, what makes it the games, what makes it to popular culture. Now, with that, is there any space of of kind of consideration that you've seen again as a consultant that that at least is some point of the narrative or do you see in a majority of, of policy seems to be that more of the same is still good so in terms of like arthurian legend and things like that the problem with with that stance and not that you're taking it but the way in which g game developers excuse lack of diversity there were black people in those times you know the moors existed uh i can never it's the cloisters in new york which is a castle and museum, there's actually artwork in the story of a black knight. And I'm not remembering his name, but we existed in those times. You know, black people just didn't appear a whole cloth out of slavery, but that's how a lot of people want to treat it because they've never read a history book or we don't get that history because, well, to the victor go the spoils. And we don't learn about that because I didn't know about this night until I was in New York at the cloisters myself. Um, I think there are people working on the inside of studios to make it better. Not all studios. 
because a project that I'm hopefully going to onboard on soon, they are thinking about their protagonist and antagonist and wanting to do it right and making sure that while they, they create an antagonist that could be seen as, oh, you're just making X into a antagonist or a villain because that's super easy. They're trying to make sure that it's done with care. They're making sure that it's done well. So anyone who tries to go, but historical accuracy, they are just being lazy. I'm, I'm just going to say it. it's some it's some straight up lazy racism when you can have a Scottish accent dwarf or, I don't know, a guy who's a mutant and white hair and yellow cat eyes, but you can't imagine anybody brown. Um, and yes, I'm talking about The Witcher. I'm just, I was trying to be subtle, but why be subtle? Um, you know, we, we do hear about the brown skinned people in The Witcher universe, but not until you do some DLC. And if you don't do this DLC, you never learn about them and you, and you see them and then they're caricatures. They're not even done well. So there are some studios which are doing things well but they're few and far between and then they don't talk about it because a lot of times if they bring in a consultant early or they hire a lot of times you're in our nda you can't say anything until the game is out and sometimes you're brought in before things are even announced and it's still under a code name so you know i will i will give credit where credit is due and i know people have problems with ubisoft but all the times i've worked with them they were doing the right thing early and they're considering that uh, but when you get things like crusader kings and you know where it's still like all white people in europe we existed back then we were knights and things like that um so at that point i was just i'm just gonna call it what it is it's lazy racism if you can imagine all this other stuff but not people of color i agree i mean i think that's just really to the crux of, of what it is it, mm -hmm. it's just it's it is that so um, the idea of being able to build more spaces that are spaces of inclusion. And again, I want to make sure, of course, as we speak about Black Futures Month and Black and inclusion in this space, you know, the narrative is not just of color, right? We, we want it to be of, uh, you know, of, of self-determination, you know, and all the other myriads of spaces, whether that's neurodiversity, uh, whether in queer positivity, as well as accessibility and use of, uh, of tools and materials that for game interactivity. So we'll make sure we clarify that as component because mm -hmm. all of those encompass yeah, black yeah. and should be appreciated, you know, for what they are. Um, yeah. But at that same time, you know, so how do we start building on that, you know, building that, building that table and not the table just of inclusion, but of equitable space where our stories seem to, I don't seem to, our stories are inherently valued by, uh, by the gaming community in some um so in terms of equity it's getting people to the table and not just saying here's some wood go build your own because you know and i know that when you build your own table everybody that didn't want you to have a seat at the big table it's already there and overcrowded they also want to take a spot at the new table that you're building so the the long short of it is, is money because uh i don't know if you've ever been um the game developer conference gdc it's like the thing to go to no matter your level in the industry and it costs two grand just to get a badge for the week not many people got two grand before you've booked a flight hotel anything like that to go to gdc um and a lot of times studios won't send you if you're not speaking so if depending on the money you're making you may not be able to afford it even though you're in the industry and a lot of times programs that are supposed to help people are a one-time only deal. Like they'll help you get to GDC once, or they'll help you get to like Indicate once, or they'll do a code camp. The equity needs to be, we've built a table, we've annexed the table that exists, we've given you a spot, and we're going to help you. And we're not just going to go, here's our diversity hire, good luck, because so many people wind up being the only person of color in the studio. They wind up being the only out queer person, the only femme person, the only trans person open, I shouldn't say openly, but visibly disabled. And then they become the, you know, other duties as a sign becomes, they're now the in-house diversity person when it's not what they signed up for. 
So it's supporting people. It's helping them, you know, in, increase their skills, improve their skills, become seniors, become leads. Um, or if somebody says, I'm going to make my own studio, basically helping them with the funding, helping them with, with it so they succeed. Because too many times we hear, go build your own, go do your own thing. But then we do, as I'm sure you know, then it's not like that. What? Why are you discriminating? Where, where are the white people? And it's like, y'all got every studio under the sun. Let me have this small thing. And support each other. And, and this is going to probably get me in trouble with some people, depending on who's watching. Um, we need to stop the crab in a barrel mentality. Because too many people act as if, let's say you're out here, you're doing awesome things. You're on the come up. You're, you're doing this event. And if I'm sitting over here being a hater, what does that do for anyone but make me bitter and doesn't help uplift what you're doing? Because your success and other black people's success does not take away from what you're doing. And I'm saying you, not you personally, for anyone who's watching. Um, we need to get rid of the hater crab and barrel mentality that I've seen with so many other black creators. And that's, you know, not like everybody's doing it, but I've seen it enough to know it's there. So uplifting each other, you know, finding ways if somebody is on Twitter going, hey, I, I really want to make a game. I don't even know where to start answering that person out mentorship but the long and the short of it's money and resources that's going to help people the most agreed and 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 to that uh there's just some in some agree there's a economic component that just can't be overstated right that mm -hmm. when when you're asking somebody to make something literally out of nothing right and then to your point even if you get to that point and somehow will it, and that was something we spoke with Mr. Goff about the idea of you're making, making the impossible possible. And then it's, well, we didn't think you were going to do that. So now let us come in and change, rearrange or commodify what you just did. And, and really eventually exclude you out of your own space that, that again, you have to kind of carve by hand. And so that's again, not to say that that's the, the way of corporate spaces. And again, because gaming in its core, and I don't want to get too far off of it, is supposed to be a space of inclusion, right? The idea of you sitting at a tabletop with friends and escaping the problems of the real world and rolling a D20, right? The idea is like, this is our break from all the other components of this. Or you and I picking up two controllers or logging in, you know, into a server and playing a game with two avatars. That's supposed to erase all of these things, at least in the short term. But we have seen now, of course, the advent of gaming and gaming from those old hobby, those old hobby store days to again, where we can get these games at Target or go on a Kickstarter and raise millions of dollars. Now we found a lot of those same corporate, those corporate opportunities to say it nicely, creeping into the fandoms and spaces that were supposed to be safe spaces from it. Yeah. And you know, the hard part is, and since you brought up Kickstarter, what I've realized and what I've seen is that people have gone from treating Kickstarter as a way of, I've got this dope idea, this is my way to try to fund it, to treating it like a pre-order store. And that's not how it works because sometimes you try to fund something and it just doesn't work out or things take longer, especially with the, you know, with the pandemic happening, shipping issues. And people really act like they're supposed to get two-day Amazon shipping when they do a Kickstarter or support one. Yep. Uh, I do think that narrative is there and and having been on and consulted with and, and done several Kickstarters, I can, I can simply testify that that is much of the space now. And again, I think just like we talk about with gaming, I think there was a space of, of, uh, of innocence with, with his first component that again, it was, Hey, I'm this person. I don't have the money for this, or we don't have the money for this, but wouldn't it be cool if, and I think there was an appreciation of the artistry it takes to make a game. Right. So I think that's also something that we will, we can talk to it in a moment is that it takes, it does take talent. This isn't just something that can be done, can be willed into it, whether that's the art on the box, whether it's the game, the design of the game, what in this mechanics makes this different or more unique than the other. And really, how does this play either as an individual or as a friend? That's long-term sustainable spaces. But 
I think now, and part of that has been that we've seen larger studios move into those crowdfunding spaces because mm -hmm. it is instant access to them that, you know, I can make this game in six weeks, but to your point, um, it becomes more of a pre-order because there is no, there's no story outside of we have a product and we'd love to get it to you. Now, mind you, I still throw my dollars at those two, but there's only a finite amount of resources that then if there's an independent studio, truly independent, that's relying on my time, my attention and my money to get that first idea off the ground. As you say, like, you know, they're trying to build their table, then it's easy to get overshadowed. And so I think that's mm -hmm. also a component that, I and mean, again, we can talk, this is the next step of where do we best find inclusive games? Where do we find spaces and, and, and not to use the word safe space, but I'm going to say it, safe spaces for us to build, appreciate and connect with each other. Do those exist in enough quantity and quality that we can name them or we can find a way to continue to support them? I think the spaces are there, but they're getting harder to find. And this is where, you know, I, I have a little bit of a moment about Twitter because I wouldn't be sitting here now if it were not for the community that was on Twitter at the time. I need diverse games be, became a hashtag that went viral and people saw it. You know, the power of Twitter at that point was still mostly for the good. But today, if you want to try to use Twitter, your tweets are probably being suppressed if you're not playing, paying for Twitter blue, if you don't already have a check mark. And then if you do have a check mark because you were already paying for Twitter blue for those things, people may look at you funny because you got a check mark you basically paid for. Um, and the spaces are there and it's knowing where to look, but it's also, you know, and me, this is me being a pessimist, remembering that not all folk are kin folk and remembering that go into this with high hopes, but not surprised if you, if you're disappointed. And that may sound a little bitter and, and downy, but every time it, it's kind of like a without fail, every time that you, Think you this is it. I found like the golden apple of, of my people and games. There's always that one person that messes it up for everybody. Uh, but I would say, you know, try as it sounds, Google. There's you know, there's what you're doing, there's I need diverse games, there's black girl gamers, there's um NNE Saga, which is over in the UK, there's um POC in, in tech looking for black people in games or black game devs. And there's actually like a black game devs group in the IGDA, which is the international game developer association where you are collaborating with people that are in the industry, hoping to get in the industry. And if you're a student, there's a student rate you can join before you officially got a job in the industry. Um, so looking up the special interest groups and in IGDA, you know, following people on Twitter that are talking about this, do an advanced search. Granted, for as long as Twitter works, who knows how long, um, we're still secure enough to use. But Googling just groups or DEI groups, DEI groups in your country, because, you know, we're we're both in the U.S., there's a lot of people doing work globally about DEI. And those conversations are going to look far different in a place like the U.K. or Japan or Costa Rica, or somewhere that is not the U.S., and I, th I think we also need to remember that DEI is not just race. It's about accessibility. It's about disability, um, LGBT issues, and remembering that, again, if you know of a resource, go share it, because that's the, that's the hardest part, is that a lot of us don't share resources, and, you know, if you know somebody who's doing something dope, go share it. Or if you just found, like, I found this cool list of black game devs, let me go share it. It's it's those kinds of things. I, I think they exist, but I am of, this is going to sound terrible, but I'm of the mind that no space is 100% safe. Whether that's because somebody finds it and infiltrates it, or you have that one hater that you have to root out. <laughs> um, but we should be able to have spaces like I've got spaces that are just other black people. And I'm no shame in saying that because at some days after you've been online enough, you need to just be with your people. Absolutely. And I don't think in saying your people in that sense, and, and we see it across most cultures, across most, you know, gamuts and stripes of life. 
that there is an, an appreciation and a, uh, a disarming that can happen, you know, among among like, you know, like minded, you know, like like culture or like experienced folks. So I think that is absolutely a, a necessary space to renew your energy to take on the rest of these spaces. And I think if anything, the, the connected way that we in contemporary ways live, right, we all live online. You know, we have an online life, we have a in real world life, but the idea is that we have so many more avenues and access to us that again, we wear down so much easier than I think we used to. I mean, I can of course think to begin those good old fashioned tabletop days of it was just mm -hmm. pencil and paper and friends. But now yeah. my idea of gaming things is logging onto a server and spending all evening and afternoon, you know, trying to play a game and trying to also, you know, dodge bullets and dodge the N word at the same time. Right. <laughs> And yep, so yep. that's that's the part of that experience when we're talking about like the future of gameplay that has to now be attributed to it. Because now, like you say, we have a global perspective of DEI, particularly in gaming, because gamings now launch and appreciate a global audience. And so, again, you know, kind of outside of and in con in complement, but also in contrast to just having it being a, a racial component. I think it's a component where everyone's trying to bring all these communities together to experience their product, their, their experience, their game. And so in that, in bringing all these people together, we're bringing all of the social components of that. And because we see that most of the popular games, if we think you know, digitally like a Fortnite or tabletop like Dungeons and Dragons, their appeal is that we want to appeal to everyone. So when you pull to everyone, you know, I think it is even more imperative, as you say, to bring in those experts to make sure that you're at least doing the due diligence up mm -hmm. front, not as a after effect or a compliment or a, a, a CYA for another faux pas issue that, that may come up. Yeah. And that, and that's the hard part because, you know, in a realistic world, you're not going to make everybody happy. There's going to be something you do and it could be even, you know, this is, is not a happy memory, but, and it's also why I got out of reviewing games and doing journalism. But when I talked about arms, that fighting game, that was the early games for the switch. And I talked about that, you know, like how the one Brown character, her hair was a weapon instead of her arms, like everybody else. Some of the worst criticism I got was from other black people. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things of, I don't know. And I feel like I'm being such a downer, but I'm also like a realist in that sense of so these are the things I've dealt with. I feel like we just need to, I'm trying to find the right way to say this. I feel like we need to uplift each other, but also, um, understand that just because you're doing a thing and I'm doing a thing doesn't mean we have to do that thing together or if we can do that thing together. We have to make sure that everybody's having equity and having a good time with it, if that makes sense. I'm, uh, I'm not wording well. I know what I'm trying to say. I don't think I'm just getting there. No, I, I get it. I think there's a I think there's a space of accountability in between, um, you know, bringing things together. If if, mm -hmm. if if anything, it is my mind is it's help, but at the very least, do no harm, right? If if we yeah. don't complete or complement together, then that doesn't give us you know, and, and armistice or, or worse, you know, to see each other's success, um, you know, go, you know, go the natural progression as it should. So I, that's what I take it as, is the idea is, again, just because we're, we are people doesn't mean we can all, we all are singular on one thing, right? We also want to respect the individuality and tastes and, and compliments of that. But the idea is to your point, though, if we do, and we all do come together, that we do need to make it a space at, le at the very least, making it sustainable. And again, to your point of being able to make sure that there's an equitable stake that people, they do the work and and are actually, you know, in that space as a career, I think also, you know, has to be taken in consideration. Because as you say, there's not enough of us in this space. We all acknowledge that. So what would, what kids, the biggest opportunities is building more of us versus saying that they're the Highlander principle, there can only be one, right? We can only have one of us there and that person now has the onus to fix everything or nothing at the same time. 
Yeah, and it sucks being the only one, the Highlander, the, yeah. the rare one of us that is in a space. Um, but to be more positive, though, there are so many people doing great work in the space. Mm. Um, in video games, like, you know, everything you're doing, everything Black Girl Gamers is doing, um, and it, and it, NNE Saga, I'm never sure how to say it exactly, but there are UK organizations. So if you're in the UK, there's, there's a group there. Um, and... Black Girl Gamers is the founders in the UK, but she does have a very large American and outside the UK component. Um, again, the Black Game Dev SIG for IGDA. So if you're in the International Game Developer Association, you should definitely uh, join the Black Special Interest Group. And then they have a gathering every year at GDC. Um, but also, as low as I am to say it, Twitter is sometimes your best bet to find folks. So also just don't be afraid to say hello and make real connections. I mean, that's how we got connected. We just started chatting online. Um, Cause that is, everyone talks about networking. I think actually making a real connection with somebody is going to get you a lot farther and it actually works because that's stronger. And just, I've networked my way to talking to you. Like, mm. okay, cool. Now what? Mm. Do true, do true. And I want to uh, thinking back, uh, I want to give a shout out to Africa Comicade as as well as uh xbox africa with a couple of spaces that likewise are you know on the continent doing uh fine things not only just in traditional video games but also in, in the tabletop spaces as well and as mm -hmm. you say i think it is that we just as as fans and as creators we just have to do the due diligence of, of looking for those for those people and those projects and opportunities that we want to see and support so mm -hmm. i think that's a, a great call out there for sure now um, I want to open this up here in our, our last 10 minutes or so. Of course, that you know, if you have a comment or question, by all means, feel free to drop it in the chat. But I think, in that good sense, that talking about the future of gameplay means that there are, op, you know, there are games in the present, whether tabletop or what have you, that we get a chance to enjoy. So I'd love to know, like, what are you playing now, right? You know, the idea that you have a great access and purview, and again, sometimes you know, well ahead of all the rest of us in, in these spaces. Um, you know, what are what are you see. what are you vibing with right now? Uh, video game wise, uh, Baldur's Gate three, it's early, it's early access. Um, because I'm a big, you know, it's tied to D and D I'm a big D and D fan, but the latest patch gave us so much extra content. I'm having a blast kind of running through it. Um, Forspoken, um, you know, with the disclosure that I do know some of the people who worked on it, I'm finding it interesting because of all the complaints I've heard about it, about how Frey cusses too much. But yet we have games where the white bro cusses way more than she does. And I would think if I wound up in a strange world after people tried to burn down my house, I'd be cussing a lot too. So, um, you know, obviously there's D and D rivals of water deep show that I'm on. We're in our final and 15th season. Mm. And, uh, I want to get back into, uh, I want to do some other things. I want to do some dragon age. RPG and Vampire the Masquerade RPG. Um, and I'm pretty excited for um, Wild Hearts because I got a chance to play that a little bit before release. It officially came out yesterday. And it's like, for me, it makes it makes me happy because it's a, a to me, a simplified version of, of Monster Hunter. And uh, my character looks super dope. So I got to have like good looking hair, brown skin, and you know, hair that doesn't look like steel wool. So I loved it. Mm. That's awesome. And, and isn't that like the, that's what this should be, right? The guy of, of a game where you can see yourself and, and be mm -hmm. appreciative, whether or not in the fantastic sense or in, in the traditional sense, that. Again, you know, you just all shoes all the things that we think of of gaming gameplay, which is mm -hmm. that interaction, which is that appreciation and honestly relaxation. Like everything doesn't have to be, um, you know, in that space where we're here to rally some type of political or social context to it. Most times, I think for most of us, we just want to enjoy a game that is not so blindingly or is so blindingly devoid of any type of consideration for us that it distracts from it being a great game, right? And yeah. I think that I think if that's really what the crux of this is in the future of gameplay is not that you have to cater to me, you just don't blatantly disrespect me in the idea of like where 
where the design, the development, the implementation, the marketing, and I'm hitting the table, uh, and all these other spaces that this had to go to, and all the people that saw this, and nobody said anything. I think that's when it yeah. kind of gets to that point that, because as we said earlier, and as you allowed, and, you, and as you um, educated us, it takes so many people to make a game to get it to a market in a space that we as a consumer can enjoy it. So that means that all these people saw this and they still shipped it out and said, that's, this is okay. So I think that's the part where we're trying to say, you know, out of this for the future of gameplay, and I want to make sure to open it back up to you and our guests, um, that we absolutely do um, make a space that, you know, that consideration of the future of a gameplay is a consideration of players of all striping and all types, you know, when, when the initial design document is created. Um, yeah. Let me see. I mean, and, and that's the hard part because a lot of times, you know, that is a complaint we've all had mm -hmm. of how did it go from this to release and that you realize that if there's no people of color, no black folks in the room, there's no one that's going to pick up on it. Or if you're that one black person in the room, do you speak up and risk maybe your job? You don't know. You never know how someone's going to react because I'm sure we've all gotten the, why are you so angry? Why are you so upset? And it's like, I'm not upset. I'm just trying to help you not look foolish. Mm. Um, and I, I did see our one question on the screen. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know what to tell you because me knowing a couple of writers does not mean I know anybody at Nintendo. Uh, I, I have zero context for that. And honestly, I don't know that I would want to see a Nintendo Switch port because the the requirements for it on pc i think would destroy a switch mm. honestly because i've got a pretty beefy machine and my machine gets really warm playing it i don't think it's a game that can port to switch easily the steam deck probably because mm. it's the steam deck and i'm playing it on pc but i think it would melt a switch as it is currently Oh, and we just want to continue to give a shout thank you so much for the, the answer there tanya you want to give a shout out to one of our our VIPs, uh, President Walsh over at Bennett College and um, and one of our historic HBCUs in Greensboro, North Carolina, and a, a lady of, of many talents and tastes. So obviously, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out together, Prez, I'm sure. So I look forward to it. And I thought the same thing about the Steam Deck, you know, to your point, you know, if that couldn't take it or could, I still have to go pick mine up. Um, I've had it on, on back order for a while, though. I think you can get them now. But um, yeah. Yeah, the idea is, um, you know, that that's good to know. Um, but I think that's also a component of, you know, where we're in a space where a, a Steam Deck can exist alongside of a Switch. You know, that again, kind of speaks back and kind of to bring us all home that, you know, we're looking at gameplay in every moment and aspect of it, right? The idea where we, our phones, and and again, we're seeing the gamification of healthcare and all these other spaces that we're taking game principles now and trying mm -hmm. to bleed and implement that in other spaces. And so that's why I felt like having this conversation was so important on a lot of levels. But the idea of, of the way that we see games as a solution space seems that we still haven't added the equation in a lot of times of culture until it's too late. And so with that, you know, in your space of expertise, where do you see the future of gameplay in a, in a very large and broad sense or in some uh, particular space as far as we all need diverse games, right? We all need gameplay to also see us as diverse. Mm -hmm. So where does that synergy happen? Where we're looking at it from the black future perspective of, of where we can see gameplay really include us in our, an authentic space. Um, what I'm hoping is the future is that more of us are not just in the room because a lot of studios are actually inclusive and diverse in their staffing, but they're not at the sea level. They're not at the people who are making those final decisions. We don't see a lot of black or people of color creative directors. We don't see a lot of women in charge of studios. We don't see, let alone black women who are in charge of anything, um, unless they did it themselves. So I, I think the future has to be not just us present, but us at the decision-making level and at a point where we can bring people up as well. Because you know if I can form a studio and bring people along, I'm going to have a better chance to bring other people into the fold and get them making their own games, making their own studios. than if I've got to go to 
a studio as an employee. So it's not just getting us in the door, but keeping us there, um, and helping people, you know, improve their skills, things like that, having mentorship, but seeing more of us on stage at E3, seeing more of us giving talks at E3 and not just about diversity because we can talk about it. It's our lived experience, but I want to talk, I want to chop it at you about design, about, you know, mechanics and have us on stage at GDC talking about these things and not just how much it sucks to be brown in this space. Not to say we don't need the conversation, but you and I know, and some people watching, I'm sure know that that's the only time that we get tapped by these bigger events to talk and to give our perspective. It's come tell us once more about your pain versus the cool things you're doing. That's true. That's true. And, um, and again, excellent points, you know, from, from player press. Thank you so very much. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's just pretty much in sum that the appreciation and authenticity of our expertise, not only in the game place component, but I think as, as you say, like in the, the relationship of not of games, as well as the culture that around gameplay has to be a, a 365 involvement. Right. It can't be a, a special, you know, special opportunity into your point where uh, we we see it as such. Right. Or feel it as such or really the recompense of, of whatever your actions are, you know, come to that same conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think that that we have obviously the talent in the space. But and and just again, you said it so well, my, my part to that is just more of us here and more of us staying here in a professional space, I think is, is really that crux that we can work towards. And that's why it's just, it was just mission critical for us to bring you in here on Black Futures and really to talk about, you know, this purview that really just connects all of us, the idea of games, right? The idea is that that is, I'm, for me, and again, I'll, I'll close my ramble, is that I just see gameplay just an integral part of the way that the world will, will interpret the world and the world interprets us. Uh, particularly, I mean, our young people are there, but I think, you know, we've always done this uh, just oh, as yeah. humans, right? You know, it's, you know, it's sticks and rocks. You know, we, we can be as, um, as basic as we want to in that sense of, you know, how do we entertain? We got to think the human, as a human nature, that gameplay and gamification is a component. And if we don't find a way that we as, as black people are included in those equations and points, I think that becomes problematic. Um, not only just from the, the fun things that we're talking about, video games, but then we're talking about things like machine learning that learn off games, right? Learn from gameplay and mm -hmm. same game mechanics. So then that's where now, and this is where I see it, that we just have to be in the space. But all that to say, yeah. you know, seeing you in this space has always been an inspiration. So I just want to say that to you, you know, here and now that we want to give you your flowers because I know that you do the work Thank and you've you. done it in a, a constant and consistent and professional basis. And I try. Just, no, you do well, you do more than well. So no, we appreciate you for that. But I think that's just kind of our, our space when we look at the black future of gameplay, that the idea is that we're still in the game, right? And that we had the chance to you know, be of the rules of our own. And so that's why I just feel empowered and just appreciative. And so I'm sure for our community as soon, we just say thank you, you know, and appreciate oh, you being you. here. So. We're kind of closing some to say, how can we find you? How can we support you and and, and find the things to come? Um, so, like I said, every, all of my um, all of my socials are Cipher of Tears, C Y P H E R O F T Y R. Um, that's where you can find me on Twitch, Twitter, and um, if you like D and D, I'm on Rivals Waterdeep, which is twitch.tv slash Rivals Waterdeep. We're finishing up our fifteenth and final season, and we're uh, going on five years of this show we did um fund our last season through crowdfunding because well watsy said no more money for you so if you've got a twitch sub or just want to throw us some funds to make this last season more epic uh you can find us on uh twitch.tv rivals Waterdeep or twitter.com rivals water deep because of did not fit and yeah and then i've got a patreon i've got coffee i've got twitch and I do way too much. So if you find me online, say hi, say you read this talk, and I'm glad for everybody who was hanging out. Thank you so much. And and just want to give a shout out to our, our, our mutual uh, friend that does too much, uh, the lovely and talented Tanya Woods. 
Yes. Uh, Real Bills, likewise, you know, who is an integral part not only of this show, but just a good human being all in some. So in, in that, we just want to say thank you to her as well. And again, just we appreciate you so very much. And I'm sure, you know, we'll have some time in our share future to connect again. Well, thank you. And thanks for inviting me. I hope everybody has had a great day of programming. And uh, thanks to everybody in the chat who's been engaged and, and player press for asking questions. Oh, yeah. Player Prez is, is an awesome folks. Is, appreciate you. Thanks so much, Tanya. So, again, no y'all, uh, Tanya, the past of I Need Diverse Games, of so many of the spaces and components of the game world and, and game development spaces that we get a chance to enjoy, sharing her vision of the future of gameplay. And so with that, we're going to set and, oh, yes, uh, let me just say, yes, Tanya Woods is, is 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 a goddess, absolutely. So we want to again give flowers um, to um, to Madam Woods for sure. And so with that, I just want to just kind of conclude and and take a moment of uh, introspect of you know what we've had here, and let's see. Uh, I just want to make sure we have everything up and set because you know we're concluding year, day two here of the stream, but I want to make sure that we also uh, want to share and just kind of take a moment to uh, bring and see if I can bring it to our stage, see if um, we may bring in our next part of our event. Because even though the live stream is going to stop um, here in just a little bit, I want to make sure that we include you all in an amazing new component in space that we have here. Uh, let us see. I'm going to bring it to the back and see if I can, can bring us in on this space. Um, it is spatial.io, and let me see if I can do it from my space here. Dot, dot, dot. It is not letting me, so I am going to, uh, we'll leave it back in the back end, <laughs> but in the idea of uh, we have a space with spatial.io, uh, we have a new metaverse space that we've just trans um, transformed into a new Wakanda space. You will be able to come and chat with a couple of hundred of us online in the space and place of uh, of our future vision um i gotta click present and then share tab there we go let me see if i can uh deal with that oh i'll bother with that in a minute i'll leave it as a a drive in and for sure uh, we'll make those connections here so let's see here i'll kind of talk through it so the idea is if you go to spatial.io well, we have a great relationship there that we're forming the metaverse of inclusion um, with Harlem Film House, where most of the times and with Black Futures Month, we do want to look at the technological opportunities in front of us. And so what we'll do here is we have a complimentary space where either through your mobile phone or to the traditional PC, you can come in and vibe with about a couple of hundred of us as we'll look at art, media and mediums and just be able to enjoy each other. Again, trying to create inclusive spaces, of course, as we've done here with our Black Book Fair here in Atlanta, Georgia today, but also wants to find spaces in the metaverse that we can imbibe and appreciate Black culture, Black experiences, and build our legacies together. So we want to make sure that you go to spatial.io. That's in the bottom right corner of the screen. We'll leave this up and running here for about another 10 to 15 minutes as we go ahead and conclude the panel and this service. But from there, I'm just getting started. So also the um space for day three is going to be filled with uh, likewise a lot of fantastic guests so player prez has been a, a fantastic guest here again is president walsh and who is the president of bennett college will be our high noon guest uh to speak about the future of hbcu so we'll kind of get a great conversation to start off the day with a lot of the other um earlier components of this show being about creativity, technology, and community that we'll bring into that noon conversation and can't wait to speak with her yet again. And then from there, we're going to have office hours. So from one to three, we're going to bring in three special panelists. Um, we're going to bring in uh, Joe Illich, who is of Milestone, DC, Heavy Metal, and several uh, publishing spaces. To come in where you can just for an hour bring in your questions uh, about how your particular and personal project can um, can be basically can learn from his time and talents and so just come in with your questions you'll joe and i'll be here you'll be able to ask him about his career 
about your own personal creative spaces that you want to see and how can he help you um, advance your career in the uh, digital and public media spaces. Then from there, we have uh, LaShawn LaDawn Jones, who is an intellectual property lawyer. And so if you have questions about copyright, um, IP, or again, just legal spaces about your own creative work, um, we're going to have a pro bono hour for that. And then we'll conclude with Tonya Ransom of Blacklight Podcast. So for a lot of places and places, podcasting is a way to get your brand and your space exposed and, and be able to reach your audiences. And so we'll have a one hour session about starting your podcast in the most contemporary way um, with an award winning podcaster and fellow creative again, Tonya Ransom. So we'll have that information up here shortly or where you can follow and find those points. And then we will conclude um, a space and place of what is the future of Subsume, right? So the idea is that we think, just like the sign behind me says, the future is here. Uh, we think that we can be a solution space for creative, technical, and creative, technical, creative, and community opportunities, uh, particularly in the Black diaspora of talent and be able to find a space and place that we all can be created. So we want to build the infrastructure, the conversation and the expertise to be a space that everybody can find a positive and inclusive way to be a part of tomorrow. Uh, we honestly believe that tomorrow belongs to everybody. And so we want everybody to be a part and feel that authentically they can be themselves. And so we need your help. We need you to be the best version of yourself so that together we can all accomplish our dreams. And so with that, we're right after the seven o'clock hour. And so we're going to go ahead and get ready to conclude this component of Black Future 2023. This has been an amazing run. I'm thankful for everybody that showed up not only here on our live streams on, on Twitch and on YouTube and across our other channels, but also all of y'all that came down here to Atlanta. And we've had a boisterous run on the other side of this wall with about 13 to 15 of our vendors. I uh, want to give them shout outs such as Milton Davis with MB Media, Robert Jeffrey II, James Mason. Um, and I'm going to, and we'll post all of those uh, images and faces from all of the folks that came in. We also got a, a fantastic sponsorship from T Mobile. So T Mobile came through um, and was able to uh, gift us and a lot of our attendees with some dope swag as we work with them on a future 5G project that will be announced uh, soon. Um, I'd love to just continue a space and place where we can have conversations like this, not only on Black Futures Month, but all the time. And so we really want to find a space that together, again, we can uh, support, share, and appreciate each other. So I think with that, um, we're going to conclude that component and go ahead and say, we'll tip of the hat to this one. We'll leave up the information here for... You can meet us in the metaverse at spatial.io. It's running right now. So I'd love for you to give us a like and share on our social channel and then come join us in the metaverse where uh, CR Capers and, well, Shy Boogie and several of our folks there with the Harlem Film House are already waiting. We're showing movies, we're enjoying music and just vibing, having a good time. So from the safety and, and security of your own home, Get comfortable and come meet us in the metaverse for the rest of the evening. Thank you so very much. I appreciate each and every one of you. And thank you for being the best part of Subsume. Thank you and talk to you soon.
Thank <laughs> you.